Volume One, Chapter One of Gwen Wynne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Gwen Wynne, A Romance of the Why, by Maine Reed. Chapter One The Heroine. A tourist descending the Wye by boat from the town of Hereford to the ruined abbey of Tintern may observe on its banks a small pagoda-like structure, its roof with a portion of the supporting columns, or topping a spray of evergreens. It is simply a summer-house, of the kiosk or pavilion pattern, standing in the ornamental grounds of a gentleman's residence. Though placed conspicuously on an elevated point, the boat-traveller obtains view of it only from a reach of the river above. When opposite he loses sight of it, a spinney of tall poplars drawing curtain-like between him and the higher bank. These stand on an oblong island, which extends several hundred yards down the stream, formed by an old channel, now forsaken. With all its wanderings the Wye is not suddenly capricious. Still, in the lapse of long ages, it has here and there changed its course, forming eights, or eots, of which this is one. The tourist will not likely take the abandoned channel. He is bound and booked for Tintern, possibly Chepstow, and will not be delayed by lesser lions. Besides, his hired boatmen would not deviate from their terms of charter, without adding an extra to their fare. Were he free, and disposed for exploration, entering this unused waterway, he would find it tortuous, with scarce any current save in times of flood. On one side of the yacht, a low marshy flat, thickly overgrown with trees. On the other, a continuous cliff, rising forty feet sheer, its façade grim and grey, with flakes of reddish hue, where the frost has detached pieces from the rock, the old red sandstone of Herefordshire. Near its entrance he would catch a glimpse of the kiosk on its crest, and, proceeding onward, would observe the tops of laurels and other exotic evergreens, mingling their glabrous foliage with that of the indigenous holly, ivy, and ferns, these last trailing over the cliff's brow, and wreathing it with fillets of verdure, as if to conceal its frowning corrugations. About midway down the old river's bed he will arrive opposite a little embayment in the high bank, partly natural, but in part quarried out of the cliff as evinced by a flight of steps, leading up at back, chiseled out of the rock in situ. The cove thus contrived is just large enough to give room to a rowboat, and, if not out upon the river, one will be in it, riding upon its painter, this attached to a ring in the red sandstone. It is a light two-oared affair, a pleasure-boat, ornamentally painted, with cushioned thwarts and tiller-ropes of coloured cord athwart its stern which the tourist will have turned towards him, in gold lettering, the Gwendoline. Charmed by this idyllic picture, he may forsake his own craft and ascend to the top of the stair. If so, he will have before his eyes a lawn of park-like expanse, mottled with clumps of coppice here, and there a grand old tree, oak, elm, or chestnut, standing solitary. At the upper end a shrubbery of glistening evergreens, with graveled walks, fronting a handsome house, or, in the parlance of the estate agent, a noble mansion. That is Langoran Court, and there dwells the owner of the pleasure-boat, as also prospective owner of the house, with some two thousand acres of land lying adjacent. The boat bears her baptismal name, the surname being Wynne, while people, in a familiar way, speak of her as Gwen Wynne this on account of her being a lady of proclivities and habits that make her somewhat a celebrity in the neighbourhood. She not only goes boating, but hunts, drives a pair of spirited horses, presides over the church choir, plays its organ, looks after the poor of the parish, nearly all of it her own, or soon to be, and has a bright smile, with a pleasant word, for everybody. If she be outside, upon the lawn, the tourist, supposing him a gentleman, will withdraw, for across the grounds of Langoran Court there is no right-of-way, and the presence of a stranger upon them would be deemed an intrusion. 
Nevertheless, he would go back down the boat stair reluctantly, and with a sigh of regret, that good manners do not permit his making the acquaintance of Gwen Wynne without further loss of time, or any ceremony of introduction. But my readers are not thus debarred, and to them I introduce her, as she saunters over this same lawn, on a lovely April morn. She is not alone, another lady, by name Eleanor Lees, being with her. They are nearly of the same age, both turned twenty, but in all other respects unlike, even to contrast, though there is kinship between them. Gwendoline Wynne is tall of form, fully developed, face of radiant brightness, with blue-gray eyes, and hair of that chrome yellow almost peculiar to the Simri, said to have made such havoc with the hearts of the Roman soldiers, causing these to deplore the day when recalled home to protect their seven-hilled city from the Goths and Visigoths. In personal appearance, Eleanor Lees is the reverse of all of this. Being of dark complexion, brown-haired, black-eyed, with a figure slender and petite. Withal she is pretty, but it is only prettiness, a word inapplicable to her kinswoman, who is pronouncedly beautiful. Equally unlike are they in mental characteristics, the first named being free of speech, courageous, just a trifle fast, and possibly a little imperious, the other of a reserved, timid disposition, and habitually subdued mien, as befits her station for in this there is also disparity between them, again a contrast. Both are orphans, but it is an orphanage under widely different circumstances and conditions. The one heiress to an estate worth some ten thousand pounds per annum, the other inheriting naught save an old family name, indeed, left without other means of livelihood than what she may derive from a superior education she has received. Notwithstanding their inequality of fortune, and the very distant relationship, for they are not even near as cousins, the rich girl behaves toward the poor one as though they were sisters. No one, seeing them stroll arm in arm through the shrubbery, and hearing them hold converse in familiar, affectionate tones, would suspect the dark little damsel to be the paid companion of the lady by her side. Yet in such capacity is she residing at Langoran Court. It is just after the hour of breakfast, and they have come forth in morning robes of light muslin, dresses suitable to the day and the season. Two handsome ponies are upon the lawn, its herbage dividing their attention with the horns of a pet stag, which now and then threaten to assail them. All three, soon as perceiving the ladies, trot towards them, the ponies stretching out their necks to be patted, the cloven-hoofed creature equally courting caresses. They look especially to Miss Wynne, who is more their mistress. On this particular morning she does not seem in humour for dallying with them, nor has she brought out their usual allowance of lump sugar, but, after a touch with her delicate fingers, and a kindly exclamation, passes on, leaving them behind, to all appearance disappointed. "'Where are you going, Gwen?' asks the companion, seeing her step out straight, and apparently with thoughts preoccupied. Their arms are now disunited, the little incident with the animals having separated them." "'To the summer-house,' is the response. "'I wish to have a look at the river. "'It should show fine this bright morning.' "'And so it does, as both perceive after entering the pavilion, "'which commands a view of the valley, "'with a reach of the river above, "'the latter, under the sun, glistening like freshly polished silver. "'Gwen views it through a glass, "'a binocular she has brought out with her, "'this of itself proclaiming some purpose aforethought, "'but not confided to the companion.' It is only after she has been long holding it steadily to her eye that the latter fancies there must be some object within its field of view more interesting than the wise water, or the greenery on its banks. "'What is it?' she naively asks. "'You see something?' "'Only a boat,' answers Gwen, bringing down the glass with a guilty look, as if conscious of being caught. "'Some tourist, I suppose, making down to Tintern Abbey, like as not a London cockney.' The young lady is telling a white lie. She knows the occupant of the boat is nothing of the kind. From London he may be, she cannot tell, but certainly no sprig of cockneydom, unlike it as Hyperion to the satyr, at least so she thinks. But she does not give her thought to the companion. Instead, concealing it, she adds, 
How fond these town people are of touring it upon our why. Can you wonder at that? asks Ellen. Its scenery is so grand. I should say, incomparable. Nothing equal to it in England. I don't wonder, said Miss Wynne, replying to the question. I'm only a little bit vexed seeing them there. It's like the desecration of some sacred stream, leaving scraps of newspapers in which they wrap their sandwiches, with other picnicking debris on its banks, to say naught of one's having to encounter the rude fellows that these degenerate days go a-rowing, shop-boys from the town, farm-laborers, colliers, haulers, all sorts. I've half a mind to set fire to the Gwendoline, burn her up, and never again lay hand on an oar. Ellen Lees laughs incredulously as she makes rejoinder. It would be a pity, she says, in serial comic tone. Besides, the poor people are entitled to a little recreation. They don't have too much of it. Ah, uh, true, rejoins Gwen, who, despite her grandeeism, is neither Tory nor aristocrat. Well, I've not yet decided on that little bit of incendiarism, and shan't burn the Gwendoline, at all events not until we've had another row out of her. Not for a hundred pounds would she set fire to that boat and never in her life was she less thinking of such a thing. For just then she has other views regarding the pretty pleasure craft, and intends taking seat on its thwarts within less than twenty minutes' time. By the way, she says, as if the thought had suddenly occurred to her, we may as well have that row now, whether it's to be the last or not. Cunning creature! She has had it in her mind all the morning, first from her bedchamber window, then from that of the breakfast-room, looking upon the river's reach, with a binocular at her eye, too, to note if a certain boat, with a salmon-rod bending over it, passes down, for one of its occupants is an angler. The day is superb, she goes on, sun's not too hot, gentle breeze, just the weather for a row, and the river looks so inviting, seems calling us to come. What do you say, Nell? I have no objections. Let us in, then, and make ready. Be quick about it. Remember, it's April, and there may be showers. We mustn't miss a moment of that sweet sunshine. At this the two forsake the summer-house, and, lightly recrossing the lawn, disappear within the dwelling. While the angler's boat is still opposite the grounds, going on, eyes are observing it from an upper window of the house, again those of Miss Wynne herself, inside her dressing-room, getting ready for the river. She had only short glimpses of it, over the tops of the trees on the eot, and now and then through breaks in their thinner spray. Enough, however, to assure her that it contains two men, neither of them cockneys. One at the oars she takes to be a professional waterman, but he, seated in the stern, is altogether unknown to her, save by sight, that obtained when twice meeting him out on the river. She knows not whence he comes, or where he is residing but supposes him a stranger to the neighborhood, stopping at some hotel. If at the house of any of the neighboring gentry, she certainly would have heard of it. She is not even acquainted with his name, though longing to learn it. But she is shy to inquire, lest that might betray her interest in him. For such she feels, has felt, ever since setting her eyes on his strangely handsome face. As the boat again disappears behind the thick foliage, she sets, in haste, to effect the proposed change of dress, saying, in soliloquy, for she is now alone, I wonder who and what he can be. A gentleman, of course. But, then, there are gentlemen, and gentlemen, single ones, and... She has the word married on her tongue, but refrains speaking it. Instead she gives utterance to a sigh, followed by the reflection, Ah, me, that would be a pity. A dis again she checks herself, the thought being enough unpleasant without the words. Standing before the mirror, and sticking long pins into her hair, to keep its rebellious plates in their place, she continues, soliloquizing, If one only had a word with that young waterman who rose him, and were it not that my own boatman is such a chatterer, I would put him up to getting that word. But no, it would never do. He'd tell aunt about it and then Madame Le Chatelaine would be talking all sorts of serious things to me, the which I mightn't relish. Well, in six months more the old lady's trusteeship of this young lady is to terminate, at least legally. 
Then I'll be my own mistress, and then twill be time enough to consider whether I ought to have a master. <laughs> so laughing, as she surveys her superb figure in a cheval glass, she completes the adjustment of her dress by setting a hat upon her head and tightening the elastic to secure it against its being blown off while in the boat. In fine, with a parting glance at the mirror, which shows a satisfied expression upon her features, she trips lightly out of the room, and on down the stairway. End of chapter 1 Volume 1, Chapter 2 of Gwen Wynne This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Gwen Wynne, A Romance of the Why, by Maine Reed. Chapter 2. The Hero. Then Vivian Rycroft, a handsomer man, never carried a sling jacket over his shoulder, or saber tasha on his hip, for he is in the Hussars, a captain. He is not on duty now, nor anywhere near the scene of it. His regiment is at Aldershot, himself resuscitating in Herefordshire, whither he has come to spend a few weeks' leave of absence. Nor is he, at the time of our meeting him, in the saddle, which he sits so gracefully, but in a row-boat on the River Wye, the same just sighted by Gwen Wynne through the double lens of her lorgnette. Nor is he wearing the braided uniform and busby, but instead attired in a suit of light chevots, piscator cut, with a helmet-shaped cap of quilted cotton on his head, its rounded rim of spotless white in striking, but becoming, contrast with his bronzed complexion and dark military moustache. For Captain Rycroft is no mere strapling nor beardless youth, but a man turned thirty, browned by exposure to Indian suns, experienced in Indian campaigns, from those of the Sindh and the Punjab to that most memorable of all, the mutiny. Still, he is personally as attractive as he ever was, to women, possibly more, among these causing a flutter, with reproachment towards him almost instinctive, when and wherever they may meet him. In the present many a bright English lady sighs for him, as in the past many a dark damsel of Hindostan, and without his heaving sigh, or even giving them a thought in return. Not that he is of cold nature, or in any sense austere, instead warm-hearted, of cheerful disposition, and rather partial to female society. But he is not, and never has been, either man-flirt or frivolous trifler. Else he would not be fly-fishing on the Y, for that is what he is doing there, instead of in London, taking part in the festivities of the season, by day dawdling in Rotten Row, by night exhibiting himself in an opera-box or ballroom. In short, Vivian Rycroft is one of those rare individuals, to a high degree endowed, physically as mentally, without being aware of it, or appearing so, while to all others it is very perceptible. He has been about a fortnight in the neighborhood, stopping at the chief hotel of a riverine town much affected by fly-fishermen and tourists. Still, he has made no acquaintance with the resident gentry. He might, if wishing it, which he does not, his purpose upon the why not being to seek society, but salmon, or rather the sport of taking it, an ardent discipline of the ancient Isaac, he cares for naught else, at least, in the district where he is for the present sojourning. Such is his mental condition, up to a certain morning, when a change comes over it, sudden as the spring of a salmon at the gaudiest or most tempting of his flies, this brought about by a face of which he has caught sight by merest accident, while following his favourite occupation. Thus it has chanced. Below the town where he is staying, some four or five miles by the course of the stream, he has discovered one of those places called catches, where the king of river fish delights to leap at flies, whether natural or artificial, a sport it has oft reason to rue. Several times so, at the end of Captain Rycroft's line and rod, he having there twice hooked a twenty-pounder, and once a still larger specimen, which turned the scale at thirty. In consequence that portion of the stream has become his choicest angling ground, and at least three days in the week he repairs to it. 
The row is not much going down, but a good deal returning, five miles upstream, most of its strong adverse current. That, however, is less his affair than his oarsman's. A young waterman by the name of Wingate, whose boat and services the Hussar officer has chartered by the week, indeed, engage them for so long as he may remain upon the Wye. On the morning in question, dropping down the river to his accustomed whipping-place, but at a somewhat later hour than usual, he meets another boat coming up, the pleasure-craft, as shown by its style of outside ornament and inside furniture. Of neither does the salmon fisher take much note, his eyes all occupied with those upon the thwarts. There are three of them, two being ladies seated in the stern sheets, the third an oarsman on a thwart well forward to make better balance. And to the latter the hussar officer gives but a glance, just to observe that he is a serving man, wearing some of its insignia in the shape of a cockaded hat and striped stable waistcoat, and not much more than a glance at one of the former, but a gaze, concentrated and long as good manners will permit, at the other, who is steering, when she passes beyond sight, her face remaining in his memory, vivid as if still before his eyes. All this, at a first encounter, repeated in a second, which occurs on the day succeeding, under similar circumstances, and almost in the self-same spot, then the face, if possible, seeming fairer, and the impression made by it upon Vivian Rycroft's mind sinking deeper, indeed, promising to be permanent. It is a radiant face, set in a luxuriance of bright amber hair, for it is that of Gwendoline Wynne. On the second occasion he has a better view of her, the boats passing nearer to one another, still, not so near as he could wish, good manners again interfering. For all, he feels well satisfied, especially with the thought that his own gaze earnestly given, though under such restraint, has been with earnestness returned. Would that his secret admiration of its owner were in like manner reciprocated. Such is his reflective wish as the boats widen the distance between them, one laboring slowly up, the other gliding swiftly down. His boatmen cannot tell who the lady is, nor where she lives. On the second day he is not asked, the question having been put to him on the preceding. All the added knowledge now obtained is the name of the craft that carries her, which, after passing, the waterman, with face turned toward its stern, makes out to be the Gwendoline, just as on his own boat, the Mary, though not in such grand golden letters. It may assist Captain Rycroft in his inquiries, already contemplated, and he makes a note of it. Another night passes. Another sun shines over the Y and again he drops downstream to his usual place of sport, this day only to draw blank, neither catching salmon nor seeing hair of amber hue, his reflecting on which is, perchance, a cause of the fish not taking to his flies, cast carelessly. He is not discouraged, but goes again on the day succeeding, that same day when his boat is viewed through the binocular. He has already formed a half-suspicion that the home of the interesting water-nymph is not far from that pagoda-like structure he has frequently noticed on the right bank of the river, for just below the outlying ayat is where he has met the pleasure-boat, and the old oarsman looked anything but equal to a long pull upstream. Still, between that and the town are several other gentlemen's residences on the riverside, with some standing inland. It may be any of them. But it is not— as Captain Rycroft now feels sure, at sight of some floating drapery in the pavilion, with two female heads showing over its baluster rail, one of them with tresses glistening in the sunlight, bright as sunbeams themselves. He views it through a telescope, for he, too, has come out provided for distant observation, this confirming his conjectures just the way he would wish. Now there will be no difficulty in learning who the lady is, for of one only does he care to make inquiry. He would order Wingate to hold way, but does not relish the idea of letting the waterman into his secret, and so, remaining silent, he is soon carried beyond the sight of the summer-house, and along the outer edge of the islet, with his curtain of tall trees coming invidiously between. Continuing on to his angling-ground, he gives way to reflections, at first of a pleasant nature, satisfactory to think that she, the subject of them, at least lives in a handsome house for a glimpse got of its upper story tells it to be this, that she is in social rank a lady, he has hitherto had no doubt, 
the pretty pleasure craft and its appendages with the venerable domestic acting as oarsman are all proofs of something more than mere respectability rather evidences of style marring these agreeable considerations is the thought he may not to-day meet the pleasure boat it is the hour that from past experience he might expect it to be out for he has so timed his own piscatorial excursion but seeing the ladies in the summer-house he doubts getting nearer sight of them at least for another twenty-four hours in all likelihood they have been already on the river and returned home again why did he not start earlier while thus fretting himself he catches sight of another boat of a sort very different from the gwendoline a heavy barge-like affair with four men in it hulking fellows to whom rowing is evidently a new experience notwithstanding this they do not seem at all frightened at finding themselves upon the water instead they are behaving in a way that shows them either very courageous or very regardless of a danger which possibly they are not aware of at short intervals one or the other is seen starting to his feet and rushing fore or aft as if on an empty coal wagon instead of in a boat and in such a fashion that were the craft at all crank it would certainly be upset on drawing nearer them captain ryecroft and his oarsmen get the explanation of their seemingly eccentric behaviour its cause made clear by a black bottle which one of them is holding in his hand each of the others brandishing tumbler or teacup they are drinking and that they have been so occupied for some time is evident by their loud shouts and grotesque gesturing they look an ugly lot observes the young waterman viewing them from over his shoulder for seated at the oars his back is towards them coal fellows from the forest of dean i take it ryecroft with a cigar between his teeth dreamily thinking of a boat with people in it so dissimilar simply signifies assent with a nod but soon he is roused from his reverie at hearing an exclamation louder than common followed by words whose import concerns himself and his companion these are dang it lads lees go in for a bit o lark yonner be boat comin down wi two chaps in it some of them spick span city gents suppose we gi em a capsize lees do it lees dunk em shouted the others assentingly he with the bottle dropping it into the boat's bottom and laying hold of an oar instead all act likewise for it is a four-oared craft that carries them and in a few seconds time they are rowing straight for that of the anglers with astonishment and fast gathering indignation the hussar officer sees the heavy barge coming bow on for his light fishing skiff and is thoroughly sensible of the danger the waterman becoming aware of it at the same instant of time they mean mischief mutters wingate what do we best do captain if you like i can keep clear and shoot the merry past him easy enough do so returns the salmon fisher with the cigar still between his teeth but he now held bitterly tight almost to biting off the stump you can keep on he adds speaking calmly and with an effort to keep down his temper that will be the best way as things stand now they look like they'd come up from below and if they show any ill manners at meeting we can call them to account on return don't concern yourself about your course i'll see to the steering there hard on the starboard oar this last as the two boats have arrived within less than three lengths of one another at the same time ryecroft drawing tight on the port tiller cord changes course suddenly leaving just sufficient seaway for his oarsmen to shave past and avoid the threatened collision which is done the instant after to the discomfiture of the would-be capsizers as the skiff glides lightly beyond their reach dancing over the river's swell as if in triumph and to mock them they drop their oars and send after it a chorus of yells mingled with blasphemous imprecations in a lull between the hussar officer at length takes the cigar from his lips and calls back to them you ruffians you shall rue it shout on till your horse there's a reckoning for you perhaps sooner than you expect yes ye damned scoundrels adds the young waterman himself so enraged as almost to foam at the mouth you'll have to pay dear for sich a dastardly attempt to waylay jack wingate's boat that will ye bah jeeringly retorts one of the roughs to blazes with ye and your boat ay to the blazes with ye echoes the other drunken chorus and while their voices are still reverberating along the adjacent cliffs the fishing skiff darts round a bend of the river 
bearing its owner and his fare out of their sight, as beyond earshot of their profane speech. End of chapter 2 Volume 1, Chapter 3 of Gwen Wynn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Gwen Wynn, A Romance of the Why, by Maine Reed. Chapter 3 A Charon Corrupted. The lawn of Langoran Court, for a time abandoned to the dumb quadrupeds that have returned to their tranquil pasturing, is again enlivened by the presence of the two young ladies, but so transformed that they are scarce recognizable as the same late seen upon it. Of course, it is their dresses that have caused the change, Miss Wynne now wearing a pea-jacket of navy blue, with anchor buttons, and a straw hat set coquettishly on her head, its ribbons of azure hue trailing over, and prettily contrasting with the plaits of her chrome-yellow hair, gathered in a great coil behind. But for the flowing skirt below, she might be mistaken for a young mid, whose cheeks as yet show only the down, one who would find sweethearts in every port. Miss Lees is less nautically attired, having but slipped over her morning dress a paletot of the ordinary kind, and on her head a plumed hat of the Neapolitan pattern. For all, a costume becoming, especially the brigand-like headgear, which sets off her finely chiselled features, and skin dark as any daughter of the South. They are about to start towards the boat-dock, when a difficulty presents itself, not to Gwen, but to the companion. "'We have forgotten Joseph!' she exclaims. Joseph is the ancient retainer of the Wynne family, who, in its domestic affairs, plays parts of many kinds, among them the metier of boatmen. It is his duty to look after the Gwendoline, see that she is snug in her dock, with oars and steering apparatus in order, go out with her when his young mistress takes a row on the river, or ferry any one of the family who has occasion to cross it, the last a need by no means rare, since for miles above and below there is nothing in the shape of a bridge. "'No, we haven't,' rejoins Joseph's mistress, answering the exclamation of the companion. "'I remembered him well enough, too well.' "'Why too well?' asked the other, looking a little puzzled. "'Because we don't want him. "'But surely, Gwen, you wouldn't think of our going alone?' "'Surely I would, and do. Why not?' "'We have never done so before. "'Is that any reason why we shouldn't now? "'But Miss Linton will be displeased, if not very angry. "'Besides, as you know, there may be danger on the river.' "'For a short while Gwen is silent, "'as if pondering on what the other has said, "'not on the suggested danger.' She is far from being daunted by that. But Miss Linton is her aunt, as already hinted, her legal guardian till of age, head of the house, and still holding authority, though exercising it in the mildest manner. And just on this account it would not be right to outrage it, nor is Miss Wynne the one to do so. Instead, she prefers a little subterfuge, which is in her mind as she makes rejoinder. I suppose we must take him along, though it's very vexatious— and for various reasons. What are they? May I know them? You're welcome. For one, I can pull a boat just as well as he, if not better. And for another, we can't have a word of conversation without his hearing it, which isn't at all nice, besides being inconvenient. As I've reason to know, the old curmudgeon is an incorrigible gossip, and tattles all over the parish. I only wish we'd someone else." What a pity I haven't a brother to go with us, but not to-day. The reserving clause, despite its earnestness, is not spoken aloud. In the aquatic excursion intended, she wants no companion of the male kind, above all, no brother. Nor will she take Joseph, though she signifies her consent to it, by desiring the companion to summon him. As the latter starts off for the stable-yard, where the ferryman is usually to be found, Gwen says in soliloquy, "'I'll take old Joe as far as the boat stairs, but not a yard beyond. I know what will stay him there, steady as a pointer with a partridge six feet from its nose. By the way, have I got my purse with me?' She plunges her hand into one of her pea-jacket pockets, and there, feeling the thing sought for, 
is satisfied. By this Miss Lees has got back, bringing with her the versatile Joseph, a tough old servitor of the respectable family type, who has seen some sixty summers, more or less. After a short colloquy, with some questions as to the condition of the pleasure-boat, its oars and steering-gear, the three proceed in the direction of the dock. Arrived at the bottom of the boat-stairs, Joseph's mistress, turning to him, says, "'Joe, old boy, Miss Lees and I are going for a row, but, as the day's fine, and the water smooth as glass, there's no need for our having you along with us, so you can stay here till we return.' The venerable retainer is taken aback by the proposal. He has never listened to the like before, for never before has the pleasure-boat gone to the river without his being aboard. True, it is no business of his. Still, as an ancient upholder of the family, with its honor and safety, he cannot assent to this strange innovation without entering protest. He does so, asking, But, Miss Gwynn, what will your aunt say to it? She mayn't like you young ladies to go rowing by yourselves. Besides, miss, ye know there be some not very nice people as moit ye meet on the river. Deed some be the roughest and worst of blackguards. Nonsense, Joseph. The why isn't the Niger, where we might expect the fate of poor Mungo Park. Why, man, we'll be as safe on it as upon our own carriage drive, or the little fish pond. As for aunt, she won't say anything, because she won't know. Shan't, can't, unless you peach on us. The which, my amiable Joseph, you'll not do. I'm sure you will not. How am I to help it, Miss Gwyn? When you've goed off, some of the house servants will see me here, and how's ever I keep my tongue in cheek. Check it now, abruptly breaks in the heiress, and stop palavering, Joe. The house servants won't see you, not one of them. When we're off on the river, you'll be lying at anchor in those laurel bushes above, and to keep you to your anchorage, here's some shining metal. Saying which, she slips several shillings into his hand, adding, as she notes the effect, Do you think it's sufficiently heavy? If not, but never mind now. In our absence you can amuse yourself weighing and counting the coins. I fancy they'll do. She is sure of it, knowing the man's weakness to be money as it now proves. Her argument is too powerful for his resistance, and he does not resist. Despite his solicitude for the welfare of the Wynn family, with his habitual regard of duty, the ancient servitor, refraining from further protest, proceeds to undo the knot of the Gwendolen's painter. Stepping into the boat, the other Gwendolen takes the oars, Miss Lees sitting herself to steer. All right. Now, Joe, give us a push off. Joseph, having let loose, does as directed, which sends the light craft clear out of its dock. Then, standing on the bottom step, with the adroit twirl of the thumb, he spreads the silver pieces over his palm, so that he might see how many, and, after counting and contemplating with pleased expression, slips them into his pocket, muttering to himself, Miss Gwen's an owner to take care of herself, and the old lady needn't to know a thin about it. To make his last words good, he mounts briskly back up the boat-stairs, and ensconces himself in the heart of a thick-leaved Laurestinus, to the great discomfort of a pair of missile thrushes, which have there made a nest and commenced incubation. End of chapter 3「ポッドキャストスタンド FM」「ゴエン・ウィン」「アロマンス・オブ・ザ・ワイ」「バイ・マイン・リード」「ヴァイ・ウォー」「ヴァイ・ウォー」「ヴァイ・ウォー」「ヴァイ・ウォー」「ヴァイ・ウォー」「ヴァイ・ウォー」「ヴァイ・ウォー」「ヴァイ・ウォー」「ヴァイ・ウォー」「ヴァイ・ウォー」「ヴァイ・ウォー」「ヴァイ・ウォー」which, for a mile before Lingoran, flows gently through meadow-land, but a few feet above its own level, and flush with it in times of flood. On this particular day there is none such, no rain having fallen for a week, and the wise water is pure and clear, smooth, too, as the surface of a mirror, only where, now and then, 
A light zephyr, playing upon it, stirs up the tiniest of ripples. A swallow dips its scimitar wings, or a salmon in bolder dash causes a pearl, with circling eddies, whose wavelets extend wider and wider as they subside. So, with the trace of their boat's keel, the furrow made by it instantly closing up, and the current resuming its tranquillity, while their reflected forms, too bright to be spoken of as shadows, now fall on one side, now on the other, as the capricious curving of the river makes necessary a change of course. Never went boat down the Y carrying freight more fair. Both girls are beautiful, though of opposite types, and a different degree. While the one, Gwendolyn Wynne, no water nymph or naiad could compare, her warm beauty in its real embodiment far excelling any conception of fancy or flight of the most romantic imagination. She is not thinking of herself now, nor, indeed, does she much at any time, least of all in this wise. She is anything but vain. Instead, like Vivian Rycroft, rather underrates herself, and possibly more than ever this morning, for it is with him her thoughts are occupied, surmising whether his may be with her, but not in the most sanguine hope. Such a man must have looked upon many a form fair as hers, one smiles of many a woman beautiful as she. How can she expect him to have resisted, or that his heart is still whole? While thus conjecturing, she sits half-turned on the thwart, with oars out of the water, her eyes directed down the river, as though in search of something there, and they are, that something a white helmet hat. She sees it not, and as the last thought has caused her some pain, she lets down the oars with a plunge, and recommences pulling. Now, and as in spite, at each dip the blades breaking her own bright image. During all this while Ellen Lees is otherwise occupied, her attention partly taken up with the steering but as much given to the shores on each side, to the green pasture-land, of which, at intervals, she has a view, with the white-faced Herefords straying over it, or standing grouped in the shade of some spreading trees, forming pastoral pictures worthy of the pencil of a moorland or cup. In clumps, or apart, tower up old poplars, through whose leaves, yet but half unfolded, can be seen the rounded burrs of the mistletoe, looking like nests of rooks. Here and there, one overhangs the river's bank, shadowing still deep pools, where the ravenous pike lies in ambush for salmon pink and such small fry, while on a bare branch above may be observed another of their persecutors, the kingfisher, its brilliant azure plumage in strong contrast with everything on the earth around, and like a little bit of sky fallen from above. At intervals it is seen darting from side to side, or in longer flight, following the bend of the stream, and causing scamper among the minnows, itself startled and scared by the intrusion of the boat upon its normally peaceful domain. Miss Lees, who is somewhat of a naturalist, and has been out with the district field club on more than one ladies' day, makes note of all these things. As the Gwendolyn glides on, she observes beds of the water ranunculus, whose snow-white corollas, bending to the current, are oft rudely dragged beneath, while on the banks above their cousins of golden sheen, mingling with petals of yellow and purple loose strife, for both grow here, with anemones and pale lemon-colored daffodils, are but kissed and gently fanned by the balmy breath of spring. Easily guiding the craft down the slow-flowing stream, she has a fine opportunity of observing nature in its unrestrained action, and takes advantage of it. She looks with delighted eye at the freshly opened flowers, and listens with charmed ear to the warbling of the birds, a chorus on the Y, sweet and varied as anywhere on earth. From many a deep-lying dell in the adjacent hills she can hear the song of the thrush, as if endeavoring to outdo, and cause one to forget, the matchless strain of its nocturnal rival, the nightingale, or making music for its own mate, now on the nest, and occupied with the cares of incubation. She hears, too, the bold whistling carol of the blackbird, the trill of the lark soaring aloft, the soft sonorous note of the cuckoo, blending with the harsh scream of the jay, and the laughing cackle of the green woodpecker, 
the last loud beyond all proportion to the size of the bird, and bearing close resemblance to the cry of an eagle. Strange coincidence, besides, in the woodpecker being commonly called Ecole, a name on the Y, pronounced with striking similarity to that of the royal bird. Pondering upon this very theme, Ellen has taken no note of how her companion is employing herself, nor is Miss Wynne thinking of either flowers or birds, only when a large one of the latter, a kite, shooting out from the summit of a wooded hill, strays a while soaring overhead, does she give thought to what so interests the other. "'A pretty sight,' observes Ellen, as they sit looking up at the sharp, slender wings and long, bifurcated tail, cut clear as a cameo against the cloudless sky. "'Isn't it a beautiful creature?' "'Beautiful, but bad,' rejoins Gwen, like many other animated things. "'Too like, and too many of them. "'I suppose it's on the lookout for some innocent victim, "'and will soon be swooping down at it. "'Ah, me! It's a wicked world now, with all its sweetness. "'One creature preying upon another, "'the strong seeking to devour the weak, "'these ever needing protection. "'Is it any wonder we poor women, weakest of all, "'should wish to—' She stays her interrogatory, and sits in silence, abstractedly toying with the handles of the oars, which she is balancing above water. A wish to do what? asked the other. Get married, answers the heiress of Longoran, elevating her arms and letting the blades fall with a plash, as if to drown a speech so bold. Withal, watching its effect upon her companion, as she repeats the question in a changed form. Is it strange, Ellen? "'I suppose not,' Ellen timidly replies, blushingly, too, for she knows how nearly the subject concerns herself, and half believes the interrogatory aimed at her. "'Not at all strange,' she adds more affirmatively. "'Indeed, very natural, I should say, that is, for women who are poor and weak, to really need a protector. But you, Gwen, who are neither one nor the other, but instead rich and strong, have no such need.' I'm not so sure of that, with all my riches and strength, for I am a strong creature, as you see, can row this boat almost as ably as a man. She gives a vigorous pull or two, as proof, then continuing. Yes, and I think I've got great courage, too. Yet, would you believe it, Nelly? Notwithstanding all, sometimes I have a strange fear upon me. Fear of what? I can't tell. That's the strangest part of it, for I know of no actual danger. Some sort of vague apprehension that now and then oppresses me, lies on my heart, making it heavy as lead, sad and dark as the shadow of that wicked bird upon the water. Ugh! she exclaims, taking her eyes off it, as if the sight, suggestive of evil, had brought on one of the fear spells she is speaking of. If it were a magpie, observes Ellen laughingly, you might view it with suspicion. Most people do, even some who deny being superstitious. But a kite! I never heard of that being ominous of evil. No more its shadow, which, as you see it there, is but a small speck compared to the wide, bright surface around. If your future sorrow be only in like proportion to your joys, they won't signify much. See, both the bird and its shadow are passing away, as will your troubles, if you ever have any. Passing, perhaps, soon to return. Ha! Look there, as I've said. This, as the kite swoops down upon a wood quest, and strikes at it with outstretched talons, missing it, nevertheless. For the strong-winged pigeon, forewarned by the other's shadow, has made a quick double in its flight, and so shunned the deadly clutch. Still, it is not yet safe. Its tree covert is far off on the wooded slope, and the tyrant continues the chase. But the hawk has its enemy, too, in the gamekeeper with his gun. Suddenly it is seen to suspend the stroke of its wings, and go whirling downward, while a shot rings out on the air, and the cushat, unharmed, flies on for the hill. Good! exclaims Gwen, resting the oars across her knees, and clapping her hands in an ecstasy of delight. The innocent has escaped! "'And for that you ought to be assured, as well as gratified,' puts in the companion, 
taking it as a symbol of yourself, and those imaginary dangers you've been dreaming about. True, assents Miss Wynne, musingly, but, as you see, the bird found a protector, just by chance, and in the nick of time. So will you, without any chance, and at such time as may please you. Oh, exclaimed Gwen, as if endowed with fresh courage, I don't want one, not I. I'm strong to stand alone. Another tug at the oars to show it. No, she continues, speaking between the plunges, I want no protector, at least not yet, nor for a long while. But there's one wants you, says the companion, accompanying her words with an interrogative glance, as soon, soon as he can have you. Indeed, I suppose you mean Master George Shenstone. Have I hit the nail upon the head? You have? Well, what of him? Only that everybody observes his attentions to you. Everybody is a very busy body. Being so observant, I wonder if this everybody has also observed how I receive them. Indeed, yes. How, then? With favor. Tis said you think highly of him. And so I do. There are worse men in the world than George Shenstone, possibly few better, and many a good woman would, and might, be glad to become his wife. For all, I know one of a very indifferent sort who wouldn't. That's Gwen Wynne. But he's very good-looking, Ellen urges. The handsomest gentleman in the neighborhood. Everybody says so. There your everybody would be wrong again, if they thought as they say. But they don't. I know one who thinks somebody else much handsomer than he. Who? asked Miss Lees, looking puzzled, for she had never heard of Gwendolen having a preference, save that spoken of. The Reverend William Musgrave, replies Gwen, in turn bending inquisitive eyes on her companion, to whose cheeks the answer has brought a flush of color, with a spasm of pain at the heart. Is it possible her rich relative, the heiress of Langorn Court, can have set her eyes upon the poor curate of Langorn Church, where her own thoughts have been secretly straying? With an effort to conceal them now, as the pain caused her, she rejoins interrogatively, but in faltering tone, "'You think Mr. Musgrave handsomer than Mr. Shenstone?' "'Indeed I don't. Who says I do?' "'Oh, I thought,' stammers out the other, relieved, too pleased just then to stand up for the superiority of the curate's personal appearance, "'I thought you meant it that way. But I didn't. All I said was that somebody thinks so.' And that isn't I. Shall I tell you who it is? Ellen's heart is quiet again. She does not need to be told, already divining who it is, herself. You may as well let me, pursues Gwen, in a bantering way. Do you suppose, Miss Lees, I haven't penetrated your secret long ago? Why, I knew it last Christmas, when you were assisting his demure reverence to decorate the church. Who could fail to observe that pretty hand-play? when you two were twining the ivy round the altar-rail, and the holly, you were both so careless in handling, I wonder it didn't prick your fingers to the bone. Why, Nell, t'was as plain to me as if I'd been at it myself. Besides, I'd seen the same thing scores of times. So has everybody in the parish. Ha! You see, I'm not the only one with whose name this everybody has been busy, the difference being that about me they've been mistaken— while concerning yourself, they haven't. Instead, speaking pretty near the truth. Come now, confess. Am I not right? Don't have any fear. You can trust me. She does confess, though not in words. Her silence is equally eloquent, drooping eyelids and blushing cheeks, making that eloquence emphatic. She loves Mr. Musgrave. Enough, says Gwendolen, taking it in this sense. And since you've been candid with me— I'll repay you in the same coin, but mind you, it mustn't go further. Oh, certainly not, assents the other, and in her restored confidence about the curate, willing to promise anything in the world. As I've said, proceeds Miss Wynne, there are worse men in the world than George Shenstone, and but few better, certainly none behind hounds, and I'm told he's the crack shot of the county, and the best billiard player of his club. All accomplishments that have weight with us women— some of us. More still, he's deemed good-looking, and is, as you say, known to be of good family and fortune. 
for all, he lacks one thing that's wanted by. She stays her speech till dipping the oars, their splash simultaneous with, and half drowning, the words, Gwen Wynne. What is it? asked Ellen, referring to the deficiency thus hinted at. On my word, I can't tell. For the life of me I cannot. It's something undefinable, which one feels without seeing or being able to explain, just as ether, or electricity. Possibly it is the last. At all events, it's the thing that makes us women fall in love, as no doubt you found when your fingers were, were, well, so nearly being pricked by that holly. <laughs> With a merry peal she once more sets to rowing, and for a time no speech passes between them the only sounds heard being the songs of the birds, in sweet symphony with the rush of the water along the boat's sides, and the rumbling of the oars in their rowlocks. But for a brief interval there is silence between them, Miss Wynne again breaking it by a startled exclamation. See! Where? Where? Up yonder! We have been talking of kites and magpies. Behold, two birds of worse augury than either! They are passing the mouth of a little influent stream, up which at some distance are seen two men, one of them seated in a small boat, the other standing on the bank, talking down to him. He in the boat is a stout, thick-set fellow, in velveteens and coarse fur cap, the one above a spare, thin man, habited in a suit of black, of clerical, or rather sacerdotal, cut. Though both are partially screened by the foliage, the little stream running between wooded banks, Miss Wynne has recognized them. So, too, does the companion, who rejoins, as if speaking to herself. One's the French priest, who has a chapel of the river, on the opposite side. The other's that fellow who said to be such an incorrigible poacher. Priest and poacher it is, an oddly assorted pair, though in a sense not so ill-matched, either. I wonder what they're about up there, with their heads so close together. They appeared as if not wishing we should see them. Didn't strike you so, Nelly? The men are now out of sight, the boat having passed the rivulet's mouth. Indeed, yes, answered Miss Lees. The priest, at all events, he drew back among the bushes on seeing us. I'm sure his reverence is welcome. I've no desire to set eyes on him, quite the contrary. I often meet him on the roads. I, too, and off them. He seems to be about everywhere, skulking and prying into people's affairs. I noticed him, the last day of our hunting, among the rabble, on foot, of course. He was close to my horse, and kept watching me out of his owlish eyes, all the time. So impertinently I could have laid the whip on his shoulders. There's something repulsive about the man. I can't bear the sight of him. He's said to be a great friend, and very intimate associate of your worthy cousin, Mr. Don't name him, Nell. I'd rather not think, much less talk of him. Almost the last words my father ever spoke, never let Lewin Murdoch cross the threshold of Angoran. No doubt he had his reasons. My word, this day with all its sunny brightness seems to abound in dark omens. Birds of prey, priests, and poachers. It's enough to bring on one of my fear fits. I now rather regret leaving Joseph behind. Well, we must make haste and get home again. Shall I turn the boat back? asked the steerer. No, not just yet. I don't wish to repass those two uncanny creatures. Better leave them for a while, so that on returning we mayn't see them, to disturb the priest's equanimity, more like his conscience. The reason is not exactly as assigned, but Miss Lees, accepting it without suspicion, holds the tiller cords so as to keep the course on downstream. End of chapter 4 Volume One, Chapter Five of Gwen Wynne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Gwen Wynne, A Romance of the Why, by Maine Reed. Chapter Five, Dangers Ahead. For another half mile or so, the Gwendolen is propelled onward, though not running trimly the fault being in her at the oars. With thoughts still preoccupied, she now and then forgets her stroke, or gives it unequally, so that the boat zigzags from side to side, and, 
but for a more careful hand of the tiller, would bring up against the bank. Observing her abstraction, as also her frequent turning to look down the river, but without suspicion of what is causing it, Miss Lees at length inquires, "'What's the matter with you, Gwen?' "'Oh, nothing,' she evasively answers, bringing back her eyes to the boat, and once more giving attention to the oars. "'But why are you looking so often below? I've noticed you do so at least a score of times.' If the questioner could but divine the thoughts at that moment in the other's mind, she would have no need thus to interrogate, but would know that below there is another boat with a man in it who possesses that unseen something, like ether or electricity, and to catch sight of whom Miss Wynne has been so oft straining her eyes. She has not given all her confidence to the companion. Not receiving immediate answer, Ellen again asks, "'Is there any danger you fear?' None that I know of, at least, for a long way down. Then there are some rough places. But you are pulling so unsteadily. It takes all my strength to keep in the middle of the river. Then you pull, and let me do the steering, returns Miss Wynne, pretending to be in a pout, as she speaks, starting up from the thwart, and leaving the oars in their thole-pins. Of course, the other does not object, and soon they have changed places. But Gwen in the stern behaves no better than when seated amidships. The boat still keeps going astray, the fault now in the steerer. Soon something more than a crooked course calls the attention of both, for time engrossing it. They have rounded an abrupt bend, and got into a reach where the river runs with troubled surface and great velocity. So swift there is no need to use the oars downstream, while upward twill take stronger arms than theirs. Caught in its current, and rapidly, yet smoothly, borne on, for a while they do not think of this. Only a short while. Then the thought comes to them in the shape of a dilemma, Miss Lee's being the first to perceive it. "'Gracious goodness!' she exclaims. "'What are we to do? We can never row back up this rough water. It runs so strong here.' "'It's true,' says Gwen, preserving her composure. "'I don't think we could. "'But what's to be the upshot?' Joseph will be waiting for us, and Auntie's sure to know all, if we shouldn't get back in time. That's true also, again observes Miss Wynne, assentingly, and with an admirable sang-fraud, which causes surprise to the companion. Then succeeds a short interval of silence, broken by an exclamatory phrase of three short words, from the lips of Miss Wynne. They are, I have it. What have you? joyfully asks Ellen. The way back without much trouble, and without disturbing the arrangements we've made with old Joe, the least bit. Explain yourself. We'll keep on down the river to the rock weir. There we can leave the boat and walk across the neck to Langoran. It isn't over a mile, though it's five times that by the course of the stream. At the weir we can engage some water folk to take back the Gwendolen to her moorings. Meanwhile, we'll make all haste, slip into the grounds unobserved, get to the boat-dock in good time, and give Joseph the cue to hold his tongue about what's happened. Another half-crown will tie it firm and fast, I know. "'I suppose there's no help for it,' says the companion, assenting. "'And we must do as you say.' "'Of course we must. As you see, without thinking of it, we've drifted into a very cascade and are now a long way down it. Only a regular waterman could pull up again. Ah, twould take the toughest of them, I should say. So— Lowlands Volens will have to go on to Rock Weir, which can't be more than a mile now. You may feather your oars and float a bit, but, by the way, I must look more carefully to the steering. Now that I remember, there are some awkward bars and eddies about here, and we can't be far from them. I think they're just below the next bend. So saying, she sets herself square in the stern sheets and closes her fingers firmly upon the tiller cords. They glide on, but now in silence the little flurry, with the prospect of peril ahead, making speech inopportune. Soon they are round the bend spoken of, discovering to their view a fresh reach of the river. When again the steer becomes neglectful of her duty, the expression upon her features, late a little troubled, suddenly changing to cheerfulness, almost joy. Nor is it that the dangerous places have been passed. They are still ahead, and at some distance below." but there is something else ahead to account for the quick transformation. A rowboat drawn up by the river's edge, 
with men upon the bank beside. Over Gwen Wynne's countenance comes another change, as sudden as before, and as before, its expression reversed. She has mistaken the boat. It is not that of the handsome fisherman. Instead, a four-oared craft, manned by four men, for there is this number on the bank. The angler's skiff had in it only two, himself and his oarsmen. But she has no need to count heads, nor scrutinize faces. Those now before her eyes are all strange, and far from well favored. Not any of them in the least like the one who has so prepossessed her. And while making this observation, another is forced upon her, that their natural plainness is not improved by what they have been doing, and are still drinking. Just as the young ladies make this observation, the four men, hearing oars, face towards them. For a moment there is silence, while they, in the Gwendolen, are being scanned by the quartet on the shore. Through maudlin eyes, possibly, the fellows mistake them for ordinary country lasses, with whom they may take liberties. Whether or not, one cries out, "'Petticoats! By gee! Ingo!' "'Aye!' exclaims another. "'A pair of them!' and sweet wenches they be, too. Look at she with the goldy hair, bright as the sun itself. Lord, meets! If we had she down in the pit, that head of her and gives much light as a dozen baby lamps. Ain't she a beauty? I'm bound to have a smack for on them red lips of hers. No, protests the first speaker. She be mine, first spoke, soon as served. That's forced law. Never mind, Rob, rejoins the other, surrendering his claim. She may be the grandest to look at, but not the goodiest to go. All lay odds the black and beats her kissin. Let's get grup em and see. Come on, meets. Down go the drinking vessels, all four making for their boat, into which they scramble, each laying hold of an oar. Up to this time the ladies have not felt actual alarm. The strange men being evidently intoxicated, they might expect, were, indeed, half prepared for, coarse speech perhaps indelicate, but nothing beyond. Within a mile of their own home, and still within the boundary of the Langoran land, how could they think of danger such as is threatening? For that there is danger they are now sensible, becoming convinced of it, as they draw near to the four fellows and get a better view of them. Impossible to mistake the men, roughs from the forest of Dean, or some other mining district, but their half-washed faces showing it, characters not very gentle at any time, but very rude, even dangerous, when drunk. This known, from many a tale told, many a petty and quarter-sessions report read in the county newspapers, but it is visible in their countenances, too intelligible in their speech, part of which the ladies have overheard, as in the action they are taking. They in the pleasure-boat no longer fear, or think, of bars and eddies below. No whirlpool, not Maelstrom itself could fright them as those four men, for it is fear of a something more to be dreaded than drowning. Withal, Gwendolyn Wynne is not so much dismayed as to lose presence of mind, nor is she at all excited, but cool as when caught in the rapid current. Her feats in the hunting field, and dashing drives down the steep pitches of the Herefordshire roads, have given her strength of nerve to face any danger, and— as her timid companion trembles with affright, muttering her fears, she but says, "'Keep quiet now. Don't let them see you're scared. It's not the way to treat such as they, and it will only encourage them to come at us.' This counsel, before the men have moved, fails in effect, for as they are seen rushing down the bank and into their boat, Ellen Lees utters a terrified shriek, scarcely leaving her breath to add the words, "'Dear Gwen, what shall we do?' "'Change places,' is the reply, calmly but hurriedly made. Give me the oars, quick. While speaking, she has started up from the stern and is making for midships. The other, comprehending, has risen at the same instant, leaving the oars to trail. By this the roughs have shoved off from the bank, and are making for midstream, their purpose evident, to intercept the Gwendolen. But the other Gwendolen has now got settled to the oars, and pulling with all her might has still a chance to shoot past them. In a few seconds the boats are but a couple of lengths apart, the heavy craft coming bow on for the lighter, while the faces of those in her, slewed over their shoulders, show terribly forbidding. A glance tells Gwen Wynne t'would be idle making appeal to them, nor does she. Still, she is not silent. 
Unable to restrain her indignation, she calls out, "'Keep back, fellows. If you run against us, twill go ill for you. Don't suppose you'll escape punishment.' "'Bah!' responds one. "'We ain't affrighted at your threats, not we. That ain't the way with us forest chaps. Besides, we don't mean you any much harm. Only give us a kiss all round, and then, maybe, we'll let you go.' "'Yes, kisses all round,' cries another. "'That's the toll you got to pay at our pike, and a bit of squeeze by the way aboot. The coarse jest elicits a peal of laughter from the other three, fortunately for those who are its butt, since it takes the attention of the rowers from their oars, and before they can recover a stroke or two lost, the pleasure-boat glides past them and goes dancing on, as did the fishing-skiff. With a yell of disappointment they bring their boat's head round and row after, now straining at their oars with all their strength. Luckily, they lack skill, which, fortunately for herself, the rower of the pleasure-boat possesses. It stands her instead now, and, for a time, the Gwendolen leads without losing ground. But the struggle is unequal, four to one, strong men against a weak woman. Verily is she called on to make good her words, when saying she could row almost as ably as a man. And so she does, for a time. Withal it may not avail her. The task is too much for her woman's strength, fast becoming exhausted. While her strokes grow feebler, those of her pursuers seem to get stronger. For they are in earnest now, and despite the bad management of their boat, it is rapidly gaining on the other. "'Pull, meats!' cries one, the roughest of the gang, and apparently the ringleader. "'Pull like—' "'Hick! Hick!' His drunken tongue refuses the blasphemous word. "'If you lay me alongside that girl with the goe—' Goldy hair, I'll stand some stiff at the kite's nest when we get home. All right, Bob, is the rejoinder. We'll do that. Ne'er a fear. The prospect of some eat stiff at the forest hostelry inspires them to increase their exertion, and their speed proportionately augmented no longer leaves in doubt of their being able to come up with the pursued boat. Confident of it, they commence jeering the ladies, wenches, they call them, in speech profane as repulsive. For these, things look black. They are but a couple of boat-lengths ahead, and near below is a sharp turn in the river's channel, rounding which they will lose ground, and can scarcely fail to be overtaken. What then? As Gwen Wynne asks herself the question, the angler late flashing in her eye gives place to a look of keen anxiety. Her glances are sent to right, to left, and again over her shoulder, as they have been all day doing, but now with a very different design. Then she was searching for a man, with no further thought than to feast her eyes on him, but now she is looking for the same, in hopes he may save her from insult, it may be worse. There is no man in sight, no human being on either side of the river, on the right a grim cliff rising sheer, with some goats clinging to its ledges, on the left a grassy slope with browsing sheep, their lambs a stretch at their feet but no shepherd, no one to whom she can call help. Distractedly she continues to tug at the oars, despairingly as the boats draw near the bend. Before rounding it she will be in the hands of these horrid men, embraced by their brawny bear-like arms. The thought restrengthens her own, giving them the energy of desperation. So inspired, she makes a final effort to elude the ruffian pursuers, and succeeds in turning the point. Soon as rounds it, her face brightens up. Joy dances in her eyes, as with panting breath she exclaims, "'We're saved, Nellie! We're saved! Thank heaven for it!' Nellie does thank heaven, rejoiced to hear that they are saved, but without the least comprehending how. End of chapter 5 Volume 1, Chapter 6 of Gwen Wynne This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Stevens. Gwen Wynne, A Romance of the Why, by Main Reed. Volume 1, Chapter 6, A Ducking Deserved. Captain Rycroft has been but a few minutes at his favourite fishing place, just long enough to see his tackle in working condition and cast his line across the water. As he does the last, saying... I shouldn't wonder, Wingate, if we don't see a salmon today. I fear that sky's too bright for his dainty kingship to mistake feathers for flies. 
Ne'er a doubt the fish'll be a bit shy, returns the boatman, but, he adds, assigning their shyness to a different cause, tain't so much the colour of the sky, more like it's that lot of foresters as frightened them, with their hulk o' a boat, making as much noise as a Bristol steamer. Wonder what brings such rubbish on the river, anyhow. They ain't no business on't, and in my opinion there ought to be a law against it, same's for trespassing after game. That would be rather hard lines, Jack. These mining gentry need outdoor recreation as much as any other sort of people. Rather more, I should say, considering that they're compelled to pass the greater part of their time underground. When they emerge from the bowels of the earth to disport themselves on its surface, it's but natural they should like a little aquatics, which you, by choice an amphibious creature, cannot consistently blame them for. Those we've just met are doubtless out for a holiday, which accounts for their having taken too much drink, in some sense an excuse for their conduct. I don't think it at all strange seeing them on the water. Their faces and seed much o' it anyhow, observes the waterman, seeming little satisfied with the captain's reasoning. And as for their being out on holiday, if I ain't mistook, it be holiday as lasts all year round. Two o' em may be miners, them has got the grimiest faces. As for t'other two, I don't think either ever touched pick or shovel in their lives. I've seed both hanging about Lidbrook, which be a query place. Besides, one I'd seen long with a man whose company is enough to give a saint a bad character. That's Coracle Dick. Take my word for it, Captain, there ain't an honest miner among that lot, either in the way of iron or coal. If there were, I'd be the last man to go again them having their holiday, excepting I don't think they ought to take it on the river. Ye see what comes of sich as they, umbugging about in a boat? At the last clause of this speech, its conservatism due to a certain professional jealousy, the Hussar officer cannot resist smiling. He had half forgiven the rudeness of the revellers, attributing it to intoxication, and more than half repented of his threat to bring them to a reckoning, which might not be called for, but might, and in all likelihood, would be inconvenient. Now, reflecting on Wingate's words, the frown which had passed from off his face again returns to it. He says nothing, however, but sits, rod in hand, less thinking of the salmon than how he can chastise the damn scoundrels as his companion has pronounced them, should he, as he anticipates, again come in collision with them. Listen, exclaims the waterman, that's them shouting, coming this way, I take it. What shall we do to them, Captain? The salmon fisher is half determined to reel in his line, lay aside the rod, and take out a revolving pistol he chances to have in his pocket, not with any intention to fire it at the fellows, but only frighten them. Yes, goes on Wingate. They'd be dropping down again, sure. I dare say they found the tide a bit too strong from up above. And I don't wonder, such louty chaps as they, thinking they could guide a boat about the way, just like mountain hogs a horseback. At this fresh sally of professional spleen, the soldier again smiles, but says nothing, uncertain what action he should take, or how soon he may be called on to commence it. Almost instantly after, he is called on to take action though not against the four riotous foresters, but a silly salmon, which has conceived a fancy for his fly. A pearl on the water, with a pluck quick succeeding, tells of one on the hook, while the whiz of the wheel and rapid rolling out of catgut proclaims it a fine one. For some minutes neither he nor his oarsman has eye or ear for aught save securing the fish, and both bend all their energies to fighting it. The line runs out, to be spun up and run off again, his river majesty, maddened at feeling himself so oddly and painfully restrained in his desperate efforts to escape, now rushing in one direction, now another, all the while the angler skilfully playing him, the equally skilled oarsman keeping the boat in concerted accordance. Absorbed by their distinct lines of endeavour, they do not hear high words mingled with exclamations coming from above or hearing, do not heed, supposing them to proceed from the four men they had met, in all likelihood, now more inebriated than ever. Not till they have well nigh finished their fight, and the salmon, all but subdued, is being drawn towards the boat, Wingate, gaff in hand, bending over, ready to strike it. Not till then do they note other sounds, which even at that critical moment make them careless about the fish in its last feeble throes when its capture is good as sure, causing Rycroft to stop winding his wheel and stand listening. Only for an instant, 
again the voices of men, but also now heard the cry of a woman, as if she sending it forth were in danger or distress. They have no need for conjecture, nor are they long left to it. Almost simultaneously they see a boat sweeping round the bend, with another close in its wake, evidently in chase, as told by the attitudes and gestures of those occupying both. In the one pursued, two young ladies, in that pursuing, four rough men readily recognisable. At a glance the Hussar officer takes in the situation, the waterman as well. The sight saves a salmon's life, and possibly two innocent women from outrage. Down goes Rycroft's rod, the boatman simultaneously dropping his gaff. As he does so, hearing thundered in his ears, To your oars, Jack! Make straight for them! Row with all your might! Jack Wingate needs neither command to act, nor word to stimulate him. As a man he remembers the late indignity to himself. As a gallant fellow he now sees others submitted to the like. No matter about their being ladies, enough that they are women suffering insult, and more than enough at seeing who are the insulters. In ten seconds' time he is on his thwart, oars in hand, the officer at the tiller, and in five more the Mary, brought stem up stream, is surging against the current, going swiftly as if with it. She is set for the big boat pursuing, not now to shun a collision, but seek it. As yet some two hundred yards are between the chased craft and that hastening to its rescue. Rycroft, measuring the distance with his eyes, is in thought tracing out a course of action. His first instinct was to draw a pistol and stop the pursuit with a shot. But no, it would not be English, nor does he need to resort to such deadly weapon. True, there will be four against two, but what of it? I think we can manage them, Jack, he mutters through his teeth. I'm good for two of them, the biggest and best. And I t'other two, sich clumsy chaps as them. You can trust me taking care of them, Captain. I know it. Keep to your oars till I give the word to drop them. They don't peer to a sight at us yet, too drunk, I take it. Like as not, when they can see what's coming, they'll sheer off. They shan't have the chance. I intend steering bow dead on to them. Don't fear the result. If the Mary gets damaged, I'll stand the expense of repairs. Never mind about that, Captain. I'd gee the price of a new boat to see the lot chastised, especially that big black fellow that did most of the talking. You shall see it, and soon. He lets go the ropes, to disembarrass himself of his angling accoutrements which he hurriedly does, flinging them at his feet. When he again takes hold of the steering tackle, the Mary is within six lengths of the advancing boats, both now nearly together, the bow of the pursuer overlapping the stern of the pursued. Only two of the men are at the oars, two standing up, one amidships, the other at the head. Both are endeavouring to lay hold of the pleasure boat and bring it alongside. So occupied they see not the fishing skiff while the two rowing, with backs turned, are equally unconscious of its approach. They only wonder at the wenches, as they continue to call them, taking it so coolly, for these do not seem so much frightened as before. "'Come, sweet lass,' cries he in the bow, the black fellow it is, addressing Miss Wynne, "'tain't no use you trying to get away. I must have my kiss, so drop your oars and get to me.' "'Insolent fellow!' she exclaims her eyes ablaze with anger. Keep your hands off my boat. I command you. But I ain't to be commanded, you minx. Not till I've had a smack of them lips, and by gad I shall have it. Saying which, he reaches out to the full stretch of his long ape-like arms, and with one hand succeeds in grasping the boat's gunwale, while with the other he gets hold of the lady's dress and commences dragging her towards him. Gwen Wynne neither screams nor calls help. She knows it is near. "'Hands off!' cries a voice in a volume of thunder, simultaneous with a dull thud against the side of the larger boat, followed by a continued crashing as her gunwale goes in. The roughs, facing round, for the first time see the fishing skiff, and know why it is there. But they are too far gone in drink to heed or submit, at least their leader seems determined to resist. Turning savagely on Rycroft, he stammers out, "'Who the blazes be you, Mr. Whitecap?' And what do you want with me? You'll see. At the words, he bounds from his own boat into the other, and, before the fellow can raise an arm, those of Rycroft are around him in tight hug. 
In another minute the hulking scoundrel is hoisted from his feet, as though but a feather's weight, and flung overboard. Wingate has meanwhile also boarded, grappled on to the other on foot, and is threatening to serve him the same. A plunge, with a wild cry, the man going down like a stone, another as he comes up among his own bubbles, and a third yet wilder as he feels himself sinking for the second time. The two at the oars, scared into a sort of sobriety, one of them cries out, "'Lord a mercy, Rob will be drownded! He can't swim a stroke!' "'He's a drowning now!' adds the other. It is true, for Rob has again come to the surface, and shouts with feebler voice, while his arms, tossed frantically about, tell of his being in the last throes of suffocation. Rycroft looks regretful, rather alarmed. In chastising the fellow he has gone too far. He must save him. Quick as the thought, off goes his coat, with his boots kicked into the bottom of the boat, then himself over its side. A splendid swimmer, with a few bold sweeps he is by the side of the drowning man. Not a moment too soon, just as the latter is going down for the third, likely the last time. With the hand of the officer grasping his collar, he is kept above water, but not yet saved. Both are now imperiled, the rescuer and he he would rescue. For, far from the boats, they have drifted into a dangerous eddy, and are being whirled rapidly round. A cry from Gwen Wynn, a cry of real alarm now, the first she has uttered. But before she can repeat it, her fears are allayed, set to rest again, at sight of still another rescuer. The young waterman has leaped back to his own boat, and is pulling straight for the strugglers. A few strokes, and he is beside them. Then, dropping his oars, he soon has both safe in the skiff. The half-drowned but wholly frightened Bob is carried back to his comrade's boat, and dumped in among them, Wingate handling him as though he were but a wet coal-sack or piece of old tarpaulin. Then, giving the forest chaps a bit of his mind, he bids them, Be off! And off they go, without saying word. As they drop downstream, their downcast looks showing them subdued, if not quite sobered, and rather feeling grateful than aggrieved. The other two boats soon proceed upward, the pleasure craft leading, but not now rowed by its owner, for Captain Rycroft has hold of the oars. In the haste, or the pleasurable moments succeeding, he has forgotten all about the salmon left struggling on his line, or caring not to return for it, most likely will lose rod, line, and all. What matter? If he has lost a fine fish, he may have won the finest woman on the Y. And she has lost nothing, risks nothing now, not even the chiding of her aunt. For now the pleasure boat will be back in its dock in time to keep undisturbed the understanding with Joseph. End of Volume 1, Chapter 6《ボリューム1》、Chapter 7 of《Gwen Wen》。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chieko.《Gwen Wen》、A Romance of the Y by Maine Reed. Chapter 7. An Inveterate Novel Reader. While these exciting incidents are passing upon the river, Langorn Court is wrapped in that stately repose becoming an aristocratic residence, especially where an elderly spinster is head of the house, and there are no noisy children to go romping about. It is thus with Langorn, whose ostensible mistress is Miss Linton, the aunt and legal guardian already alluded to. But though presiding over the establishment, it is rather in the way of ornamental figurehead, since she takes little to do with its domestic affairs leaving them to a skilled housekeeper who carries the keys. Kitchen matters are not much to Miss Linton's taste, being a dame of the antique brocaded type, with pleasant memories of the past that go back to Bath and Cheltenham, where in their days of glory as hers of youth, she was a belle and did her share of dancing with a due proportion of flirting at the Regency balls. No longer able to indulge in such delightful recreations, the memory of them has yet charms for her, and she keeps it alive and warm by daily perusal of the morning post with a fuller hebdomadal feast from the court journal and other distributors of fashionable intelligence. 
in addition she reads no end of novels her favourites being those which tell of cupid in his most romantic escapades and experiences though not always the chastest of the prurient trash there is a plenteous supply furnished by scribblers of both sexes who ought to know better and doubtless do but knowing also how difficult it is to make their lucubrations interesting within the legitimate lines of literary art and how easy out of them thus transgress the moralities miss linton need have no fear that the impure stream will cease to flow any more than the limpid waters of the wye nor has she but reads on devouring volume after volume in triunes as they issue from the press and are sent her from the circulating library at nearly all hours of the day and some of the night does she so occupy herself even on this same bright april morn when all nature rejoices and every living thing seems to delight in being out of doors when the flowers expand their petals to catch the kisses of the warm spring sun dorothea linton is seated in a shady corner of the drawing-room up to her ears in a three-volume novel still odorous of printer's ink and binder's paste absorbed in a love dialogue between a certain lord lutestring and a rustic damsel daughter of one of his tenant farmers whose life he is doing his best to blight and with much likelihood of succeeding if he fail it will not be for want of will on his part nor desire of the author to save the imperiled one he will make the tempted iniquitous as the tempter should this seem to add interest to the tale or promote the sale of the book just as his lordship has gained a point and the girl is about to give way miss linton herself receives a shock caused by a rat-tat at the drawing-room door light such as well-trained servants are accustomed to give before entering a room occupied by master or mistress to her command come in a footman presents himself silver waiter in hand on which is a card she is more than annoyed almost angry as taking the card she reads rev william musgrave only to think of being thus interrupted on the eve of such an interesting climax which seemed about to seal the fate of the farmer's daughter it is fortunate for his reverence that before entering within the room another visitor is announced and ushered in along with him indeed the second caller is shown in first for although george shenstone rung the front door-bell after mr musgrave had stepped inside the hall there is no domestic of Langorn but knows the difference between a rich baronet's son and a poor parish curate as which should have precedence to this nice if not very delicate appreciation the rev william is now indebted more than he is aware it has saved him from an outburst of miss linton's rather tart temper which under the circumstances otherwise he would have caught for it so chances that the son of sir george shenstone is a great favourite with the old lady of Langorn, welcome at all times even amid the romantic gallantries of lord lutestring not that the young country gentleman has anything in common with the titled lothario who is habitually a dweller in cities instead the former is a frank manly fellow devoted to field sports and rural pastimes a little brusque in manner but for all well-bred and what is even better well-behaved there is nothing odd in his calling at that early hour sir george is an old friend of the wynne family was an intimate associate of gwen's deceased father and both he and his son have been accustomed to look in at Langorn court sans ceremony no more is mr musgrave's matutinal visit out of order though but the curate he is in full charge of parish duties the rector being not only aged but an absentee so long away from the neighbourhood as to have become almost a myth to it for this reason his vicarial representative can plead scores of excuses for presenting himself at the court there is the school the church choir and clothing club to say naught of neighbouring news which on most mornings make him a welcome visitor to miss linton and no doubt would on this but for the glamour thrown around her by the fascinations of the dear delightful lute-string it even takes all her partiality for mr shenstone to remove its spell and get him vouchsafed friendly reception miss linton he says speaking first i've just dropped in to ask if the young ladies would go for a ride the day's so fine i thought they might like to ah indeed returns the spinster holding out her fingers to be touched but under the plea of being a little invalided excusing herself from rising yes no doubt they would like it very much mr shenstone is satisfied with the reply but less the curate who neither rides nor has a horse and less shenstone himself indeed both as the lady proceeds they have been listening with ears all alert for the sound of soft footsteps and rustling dresses 
instead they hear words not only disappointing but perplexing nay i am sure continues miss linton with provoking coolness they would have been glad to go riding with you delighted but why can't they asked shenstone impatiently interrupting because the thing's impossible they've already gone rowing indeed cried both gentlemen in a breath seeming alike vexed by the intelligence shenstone mechanically interrogating on the river certainly answers the lady looking surprised why george where else could they go rowing you don't suppose they've brought the boat up to the fish-pond oh no he stammers out i beg pardon how very stupid of me to ask such a question i was only wondering why miss gwen that is i am a little astonished but perhaps you'll think it impertinent of me to ask another question why should i what is it only whether whether she miss gwen i mean said anything about writing to-day not a word at least not to me how long since they went off may i know miss linton oh hours ago very early indeed just after taking breakfast i wasn't down myself as i've told you not feeling very well this morning but gwen's maid informs me they left the house then and i presume they went direct to the river do you think they'll be out long earnestly interrogates shenstone i should hope not returns the ancient toast of cheltenham with aggravating indifference for lute-string is not quite out of her thoughts there's no knowing however miss wynne is accustomed to come and go without much consulting me this with some acerbity possibly from the thought that the days of her legal guardianship are drawing to a close which will make her a less important personage at Langorn. surely they won't be out all day timidly suggests the curate to which she makes no rejoinder till mr shenstone puts it in the shape of an inquiry is it likely they will miss linton i should say not more like they'll be hungry and that will bring them home what's the hour now i've been reading a very interesting book and quite forgot myself is it possible she exclaims looking at the ormolu dial on the mantel-shelf ten minutes to one how time does fly to be sure i couldn't have believed it near so late almost luncheon time of course you'll stay gentlemen as for the girls if they're not back in time they'll have to go without punctuality is the rule of this house always will be with me i shan't wait one minute for them but miss linton they may have returned from the river and are now somewhere about the grounds shall i run down to the boat dock and see it is mr shenstone who thus interrogates if you like by all means i shall be too thankful shame of gwen to give us so much trouble she knows our luncheon hour and should have been back by this thanks much mr shenstone as he is bounding off she calls after don't you be saying too else you shan't have a pit mr musgrave and i won't wait for any of you shall we mr musgrave shenstone has not tarried to hear either question or answer a luncheon for apicius were at that moment nothing to him and little more to the curate who though staying would gladly go along not from any rivalry with or jealousy of the baronet's son they revolve in different orbits with no danger of collision simply that he dislikes leaving miss linton alone indeed dare not she may be expecting the usual budget of neighbourhood intelligence he daily brings her he is mistaken on this particular day it is not desired out of courtesy to mr shenstone rather than herself she had laid aside the novel and it now requires all she can command to keep her eyes off it she is burning to know what befell the farmer's daughter End of chapter 7volume one chapter eight of gwen wynn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by paul stevens gwen wynn a romance of the why by main reed volume one chapter eight a suspicious stranger while mr musgrave is boring the elderly spinster about new scarlet cloaks for the girls of the church choir and other parish matters george shenstone is standing on the topmost step of the boat stair in a mood of mind even less enviable than hers for he has looked down into the dock and there sees no gwendolen neither boat nor lady 
nor is there sign of either upon the water, far as he can command a view of it. No sounds, such as he would wish, and might expect to hear, no dipping of oars, nor, what would be still more agreeable to his ear, the soft voices of women. Instead, only the note of a cuckoo, in monotonous repetition, the bird balancing itself on a branch near by, and, farther off, the hickle laughing as if in mockery, and at him, mocking his impatience, ay, something more, almost his misery. That it is so, his soliloquy tells. Odd, her being out on the river. She promised me to go riding to-day. Very odd indeed. Gwen isn't the same she was, acting strange altogether for the last three or four days. Wonder what it means. By Jove, I can't comprehend it. His non-comprehension does not hinder a dark shadow from stealing over his brow, and there staying. It is not unobserved. Through the leaves of the evergreen, Joseph notes the pained expression, and interprets it in his own shrewd way, not far from the right one. The old servant, soliloquising in less conjectural strain, says, or rather thinks, "'Master George be mad sweet on Miss Gwen. The country folk are all talking on it, thinking she's same on him, as if they knew anything about it. I knows better. And he ain't no ways confident, else there wouldn't be that query look on's face.' It's the token of jealousy, for sure. I don't believe he have suspicion of any rival particular. Ah, it don't need that we sitch a grand beauty as she be. He as lover might be jealous of the sun kissing her cheeks or the wind tossing her hair. Joseph is a Welshman of bardic ancestry, and thinks poetry. He continues, I know what's took her on the river if he don't. Yes, yes, my young lady. Ye you thought yourself wonderful clever, leaving old Joe behind, telling him to hide hisself and bribing him to stay hid. And d'ye suppose I don't observe them glasses exchanged twixt you and the salmon fisher, sly but for all that hot as streaks of fire? And d'ye think I didn't see Mister Whitecap going down afore ye thought of a row yourself? Oh no, I noticed nothing of all that, not I. Warn't meant for me, not for Joe. Ha <laughs> ha with a suppressed giggle at the popular catch coming in so apropos, he once more fixes his eyes on the face of the impatient watcher, proceeding with his soliloquy, though in changed strain. Poor young gentleman! I do pity ye to be sure. Ye're a good sort, and everybody likes him. So do she, but not the way ye want her to. Well, things of that kind allus do go contrary-wise. Never seem to run smooth-like. I'd help him myself if twere in my power, but it ain't. In such cases help can only come from the place where they say matches be made. That's heaven. Ah, he's looking a bit brighter. What's cheering him? A boat coming back? I can't see it from here, nor I don't hear any rattle of oars. The change he notes in George Shenstone's manner is not caused by the returning pleasure craft, simply a reflection which crossing his mind for the moment tranquillizes him. What a stupid I am, he mutters self accusingly. Now I remember there was nothing said about the hour we were to go riding, and I suppose she understood in the afternoon. It was so the last time we went out together. By Jove! Yes, it's all right, I take it. She'll be back in good time yet. Thus reassured, he remains listening, still more satisfied when a dull thumping sound in regular repetition tells him of oars working in their rollocks. Were he learned in boating tactics, he would know there are two pairs of them, and think this strange, too, since the Gwendoline carries only one. But he is not so skilled, instead rather averse to aquatics, his chosen home the hunting field, his favourite seat in a saddle, not on a boat's thwart. It is only when the plashing of the oars in the tranquil water of the byway is borne clear along the cliff that he perceives there are two pairs at work, while at the same time he observes two boats approaching the little dock, where but one belongs. Alone at that leading boat does he look, with eyes in which, as he continues to gaze, surprise becomes wonderment, dashed with something like displeasure. The boat he has recognised at the first glance, the Gwendolen, as also the two ladies in the stern. But there is also a man on the mid-thwart plying the oars. Who the deuce is he? Thus to himself George Shenstone puts it. Not old Joe, not the least like him. Nor is it the family Charon who sits solitary on the thwarts of that following. 
Instead, Joseph is now by Mr. Shenstone's side, passing him in haste, making to go down the boat stairs. "'What's the meaning of all this, Joe?' asked the young man, in stark astonishment. "'Meaning of what, sir?' returns the old boatman, with an air of assumed innocence. "'Be there anything amiss?' "'Oh, no nothing,' stammers Shenstone. "'Only I supposed you were out with the young ladies. How is it you haven't gone?' "'Well, sir, Miss Gwen didn't wish it. The day being fine and nothing of flood in the river, she said she'd do the rowing herself. She hasn't been doing it for all that,' mutters Shenstone to himself, as Joseph glides past and on down the stair, then repeating, "'Who the deuce is he?' the interrogation as before, referring to him who rows the pleasure-boat. By this it has been brought bow in to the dock, its stern touching the bottom of the stair. And as the ladies step out of it, George Shenstone overhears a dialogue, which, instead of quieting his perturbed spirit, but excites him still more, almost to madness. It is Miss Wynne who has commenced it, saying, "'You'll come up to the house and let me introduce you to my aunt.' This to the gentleman who has been pulling her boat, and has just abandoned the oars, soon as seeing its painter in the hands of the servant." "'Oh, thank you,' he returns. "'I would, with pleasure. But, as you see, I am not quite presentable just now. Anything but fit for a drawing-room. So I beg your excuse me to-day.' His saturated shirt-front, with other garments dripping, tells why the apology, but does not explain either that or aught else to him on the top of the stair, who, hearkening further, hears other speeches which, while perplexing him, do naught to allay the wild tempest now surging through his soul. Unseen himself, for he has stepped behind the tree lately screening Joseph, he sees Gwen Wynne hold out her hand to be pressed in parting salute, hears her address the stranger in words of gratitude, warm as though she were under some great obligation to him. Then the latter leaps out of the pleasure-boat into the other brought alongside, and is rowed away by his waterman, while the ladies ascend the stair. Gwen, lingeringly, at almost every step, turning her face towards the fishing-skiff, till this, pulled around the upper end of the eyot, can no longer be seen. All this George Shenstone observes, drawing deductions which send the blood in chill creep through his veins. Though still puzzled by the wet garments, the presence of the gentleman wearing them seems to solve that other enigma, unexplained as painful the strangeness he has of late observed in the ways of Miss Wynne. Nor is he far out in his fancy, bitter though it may be. Not until the two ladies have reached the stairhead do they become aware of his being there, and not then till Gwen has made some observations to the companion, which, as those addressed to the stranger, unfortunately for himself, George Shenstone overhears. "'We'll be in time for luncheon yet,' and aunt needn't know anything of what's delayed us, at least not just now. True, if the like had happened to herself, say some thirty or forty years ago, she'd want all the world to hear of it, particularly that portion of the world eclept Cheltenham. The dear old lady! Ha, ha! After a laugh, continuing, but, speaking seriously, Nell, I don't wish any one to be the wiser about our bit of an escapade, least of all a certain young gentleman whose Christian name begins with a G, and surname with an S. "'Those initials answer for mine,' says George Shenstone, coming forward and confronting her. "'If your observation was meant for me, Miss Wynne, I can only express regret for my bad luck in being within earshot of it.' At his appearance, so unexpected and abrupt, Gwen Wynne had given a start, feeling guilty and looking it. Soon, however, reflecting whence he has come, and hearing what's said, she feels less self-condemned than indignant, as evinced by her rejoinder. "'Ah! You've been overhearing us, Mr. Shenstone. Bad luck, you call it. Bad or good, I don't think you are justified in attributing it to chance. When a gentleman deliberately stations himself behind a shady bush, like that Laurestinus, for instance, and there stands listening, intentionally—' Suddenly she interrupts herself, and stands silent, too. This, on observing the effect of her words, and that they have struck terribly home. With bowed head, the baronet's son is stooping towards her, the cloud on his brow telling of sadness, not anger. Seeing it, the old tenderness returns to her, with its familiarity, and she exclaims, "'Come, George, there must be no quarrel between you and me. What you've just seen and heard will be all explained by something you have yet to hear. 
Miss Lees and I have had a little bit of an adventure, and if you'll promise it shan't go further, we'll make you acquainted with it. Addressed in this style, he readily gives the promise, gladly, too. The confidence so offered seems favourable to himself, but, looking for explanation on the instant, he is disappointed. Asking for it, it is denied him, with reason assigned thus. You forget we've been full four hours on the river, and are as hungry as a pair of kingfishers, hawks, I suppose you'd say, being a game preserver. Never mind about the simile. Let us in to luncheon, if not too late. She steps hurriedly off towards the house, the companion following, Shenstone behind both. However hungry they, never man went to a meal with less appetite than he. All Gwen's cajoling has not tranquillised his spirit, nor driven out of his thoughts that man with the bronzed complexion, dark moustache, and white helmet hat. End of Volume 1, Chapter 8「Volume One, Chapter Nine of Gwen Wynne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Stevens. Gwen Wynne, A Romance of the Why by Maine Reed. Volume One, Chapter Nine. Jealous Already. Captain Rycroft has lost more than Rodden Line. His heart is as good as gone too given to Gwendolyn Wynne. He now knows the name of the yellow-haired Naiad, for this, with other particulars, she imparted to him on return upstream. Neither has her confidence thus extended, nor the conversation leading to it, belied the favourable impression made upon him by her appearance. Instead, so strengthened it, that for the first time in his life he contemplates becoming a Benedict. He feels that his fate is sealed, or no longer in his hands, but hers. As Wingate pulls him on homeward, he draws out his cigar-case, sets fire to a fresh weed, and, while the blue smoke wreathes up round the rim of his topi, reflects on the incidents of the day, reviewing them in the order of their occurrence. Circumstances apparently accidental have been strangely in his favour, helped as by heaven's own hand, working with the rudest instruments. Through the veriest scum of humanity, he has made acquaintance with one of its fairest forms. More than mere acquaintance, he hopes, for surely those warm words and glances far from cold could not be the sole offspring of gratitude. If so, a little service on the why goes a long way. Thus reflects he, in modest appreciation of himself, deeming that he has done but little, how different the value put upon it by Gwen Wynne. Still he knows not this, or at least cannot be sure of it. If he were, his thoughts would be all rose-coloured, which they are not. Some are dark as the shadows of the April showers now and then drifting across the sun's disk. One that has just settled on his brow is no reflection from the firmament above, no vague imagining, but a thing of shape and form, the form of a man, seen at the top of the boat-stair, as the ladies were ascending, and not so far off as to have hindered him from observing the man's face, and noting that he was young and rather handsome. Already the eyes of love have caught the keenness of jealousy. A gentleman evidently on terms of intimacy with Miss Wynne. Strange, though, that the look with which he regarded her on saluting seemed to speak of something amiss. What could it mean? Captain Rycroft has asked this question, as his boat was rounding the end of the Iot, with another in the self-same formulary of interrogation, of which but the moment before he was himself the subject. Who the deuce can he be? Out upon the river, and drawing hard at his regalia, he goes on. Wonderfully familiar, the fellow seemed. Can't be a brother? I understood her to say she had none. Does he live at Langoran? No. She said there was no one there in the shape of masculine relative, only an old aunt and that little dark damsel, who is cousin or something of the kind. But who the deuce is the gentleman? Might he be a cousin? So propounding questions without being able to answer them, he at length addresses himself to the waterman, saying, Jack, did you observe a gentleman at the head of the stair? Only the head and shoulders are one, Captain. Head and shoulders, that's enough. 
Do you chance to know him? I ain't thorough sure, but I think he be a Mr. Shenstone. Who is Mr. Shenstone? The son of Sir George. Sir George? What do you know of him? Not much to speak of, only that he be a big gentleman, whose land lies along the river, two or three miles below. The information is but slight, and slighter the gratification it gives. Captain Rycroft has heard of the rich baronet whose estate adjoins that of Langoran, and whose title, with the property attached, will descend to an only son. It is the torso of this son he has seen above the red sandstone rock, in truth a formidable rival. So he reflects, smoking away like mad. After a time he again observes. You've said you don't know the ladies we've helped out of their little trouble? Personally I don't, Captain. But now as I see where they live I know who they be. I've heard talk about the biggest of them a good deal. The biggest of them, as if she were a salmon. In the boatman's eyes bulk is evidently her chief recommendation. Rycroft smiles, further interrogating. What have you heard of her? That she be a tidy young lady, wonderful fond of field sports such as hunting in that lake. For all, I may say that up to this day I never set eyes on her afore. The Hussar officer has been long enough in Herefordshire to have learnt the local signification of tidy, synonymous with well-behaved. That Miss Wynne is fond of field sports, flood pastimes included, he has gathered from herself while rowing her up the river. One thing strikes him as strange that the waterman should not be acquainted with every one dwelling on the river's bank, at least for a dozen miles up and down. He seeks an explanation. How is it, Jack, that you, living but a short league above, don't know all about these people? He is unaware that Wingate, though born on the wise banks, as he has told him, is comparatively a stranger to its middle waters, his birthplace being far up in the shire of Brecon. Still, that is not the solution of the enigma, which the young waterman gives in his own way. "'Lord love ye, sir! That shows how little you understand this river. Why, Captain, it crooks and crooks and goes wobbling about in such a way that folks as lives less than a mile apart knows no more o' one the other than if they were ten. It comes of the bridges being so few and far between. There's the ferry-boats, true, but people don't take to em more'n they can help, especially women, seeing there be some danger at all times, and a good deal to it when the river's a flood. That's frequent, summer as well as winter." The explanation is reasonable, and, satisfied with it, Rycroft remains for a time wrapped in a dreamy reverie, from which he is aroused as his eyes rest upon a house, a quaint, antiquated structure, half timber, half stone, standing not on the river's edge, but at some distance from it up a dingle. The sight is not new to him. He has before noticed the house, struck with its appearance so different from the ordinary dwellings. "'Whose is that, Jack?' he asks. "'Belongs to a man named Murdoch. Odd-looking domicile. Taint a bit more of that way than he be, if half what they say about him is true. Ah, Mr. Murdoch's a character, then. I an a query one. In what respect? What way? More than one. A goodish many. Specify, Jack?' Well, for one thing, he ain't sober to say half his time. Addicted to dipsomania. Addicted to getting dead drunk. I've seen him so scores occasions. That's not wise of Mr. Murdoch. No, Captain, tain't neither wise nor well. All the worse, considering the place where mostly he go to do his drinking. Where may that be? The Welsh Harp, up at Rogue's Ferry. Rogue's Ferry. Strange appellation. What sort of place is it? Not very nice, I should say, if the name be at all appropriate. It's perfectly appropriate, though I believe it want that way bestowed. It got so called after a man the name of Rugg, who once keep the Welsh harp and the ferry too. It's about two mile above, a little ways back. Besides the tavern there be a cluster of houses, a bit scattered about, we a chapel and a grocery shop, one as deals trackways, and ain't particular as to what they take in change, stolen goods welcome as any. Aye, welcomer, if they be a worth. They got plenty on, too. The place be a regular nest of poachers, and worse than that, a good many as have served their spell in the penitentiary. Why, Wingate, you astonish me. I was under the impression your wise side was a sort of Arcadia, when one only met with innocence and primitive simplicity. You won't meet much of either at Rogue's Ferry. If there be an uninnocent set on earth, it's they as live there. Them forest chaps we come across ain't no ways their match in wickedness. Just possible drink made them behave as they did, some of them. 
but drink or no drink, it'd be all the same with the ferry people, maybe worse when they're sober. Anyways, they're a rough lot. With a place of worship in their midst, that ought to do something towards refining them. Ought, and would, I dare say, if twere the right sort, which it ain't. Instead, oh, a kind as only the more corrupts them, being Roman. Oh, a Roman Catholic chapel. But how does it corrupt them? By making them believe they can get clear to their sins, howsoever black they be. Men as think that way ain't likely to stick at any sort of crime, specialty if it brings them the money to buy what they calls absolution. Well, Jack, it's very evident you're no friend or follower of the Pope. Neither a Pope nor priest. Ah, Captain, if you'd seen him at the Rogue's Ferry Chapel, you wouldn't wonder at my having a dislike for the whole kit of them. What is there specially repulsive about him? Don't know as there be anything very special in particular. Them priests all look about the same, such as them as I've ever set eyes on. And that's like stoats and weasels shooting out of one hole into another. As for him we're speaking about, he's here, there, and everywhere, sneaking along the roads and paths, hiding behind bushes like a cat after birds, and popping out when nobody expects him. If ever there were a spy meaner than another, it's the priest of Rogue's Ferry. No, he adds, correcting himself, there be one other in these parts worse than he, if that's possible, a different sort of man, true, and yet they be a good deal together. Who is this other? Dick Dempsey, better known by the name of Coracle Dick. Ah, Coracle Dick, he appears to occupy a conspicuous place in your thoughts, Jack, and rather a low one in your estimation. Why, may I ask, what sort of fellow is he? The biggest blackguard as lives on the way, from where it springs out of Plinlimon to its emptying into the Bristol Channel. Talk of poachers and night-netters, he goes out by night to catch something besides salmon. Taint all fish as comes into his net, I know. The young waterman speaks in such hostile tone, both about priest and poacher, that Rycroft suspects a motive beyond the ordinary prejudice against men who wear the sacerdotal garb or go trespassing after game. Not caring to inquire into it now, he returns to the original topic, saying, We've strayed from our subject, Jack, which was the hard-drinking owner of yonder house. Not so far, Captain, seeing as he be the most intimate friend the priest have in these parts, though if what's said be true, not nigh so much as his missus. Murdoch is married, then? I won't say that, leastwise I shouldn't like to swear it. All I know is a woman lives with him, supposed to be his wife. Odd thing, she. Why odd? Cause she be ain't like any other a woman kind bout here. Explain yourself, Jack. In what does Mrs. Murdoch differ from the rest of your Herefordshire fare? One way, Captain, in her not being fair at all. Stead she be dark-complected, most as much of one of them women I've seen about Cheltenham, nursing the children of old officers as brought em from India. Ayers, they call em. She ain't one of them, but French, I've heard say, which in part, I suppose, explains the thickness between her and the priest, he being the same. Oh, his reverence is a Frenchman, is he? All of that, Captain. If he were English, he wouldn't, couldn't, be the contemptible sneaking hound he is. As for Mrs. Murdoch, I can't say I've seen her more than twice in my life. She keeps close to the house, goes nowhere, and it said nobody visits her nor him, leastwise none of the old gentry, for all Mr. Murdoch belongs to the best of them. He's a gentleman, is he? Ought to be if he took after his father. Why so? Because he were a squire, regular of the old sort. He's not been so long dead. I can remember him myself, though I hadn't been here such a many years. The old lady, too, this Murdoch's mother. Ah, now I think on it, she were the other squire's sister father to the tallest of them two young ladies, the one with the reddish hair. What? Miss Wynne? Yes, Captain. Er they calls Gwen. Rycroft questions no farther. He has learnt enough to give him food for reflection, not only during the rest of that day, but for a week, a month, it may be throughout the remainder of his life. End of Volume 1, Chapter 9《Volume One, Chapter Ten of Gwen Wynne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chieko. Gwen Wynne, A Romance of the Y by Maine Reed. Chapter Ten: The Cuckoo's Glen. About a mile above Langorn Court, but on the opposite side of the Y, stands the house which had attracted the attention of Captain Wycroft. 
known to the neighbourhood as glengog simric synonym for cuckoo's glen not immediately on the water's edge but several hundred yards back near the head of a lateral ravine which debouches on the valley of the river to the latter contributing a rivulet glengog house is one of those habitations common in the county of hereford as other western shires puzzling the stranger to tell whether they be gentlemen's residence or but the dwelling of a farmer this from an array of walls enclosing yard garden even the orchard a plentitude due to the red sandstone being near and easily shaped for building purposes about glengog house however there is something besides the circumvallation to give it an air of grandeur beyond that of the ordinary farm homestead certain touches of architectural style which speak of the elizabethan period in short that termed tudor for its own walls are not altogether stone instead a framework of oaken uprights struts and braces black with age the panelled masonry between plastered and whitewashed giving to the structure a quaint almost fantastic appearance heightened by an irregular roof of steep pitch with the projecting dormers gables acute angled overhanging windows and carving at the coins of such ancient domiciles there are yet many to be met with on the y their antiquity vouched for by the materials used in their construction when bricks were a costly commodity and wood to be had almost for the asking about this one the enclosing stone walls have been a later erection as also the pillared gate entrance to its ornamental grounds through which runs a carriage drive to the sweep in front many a glittering equipage may have gone round on that sweep for glengog was once a manor-house now it is but the remains of one so much out of repair as to show smashed panes in several of its windows while the unsent walls are only upright where sustained by the upholding ivy the shrubbery run wild the walks and carriage drive weed covered on the latter neither recent track of wheel nor hoof mark of horse for all the house is not uninhabited three or four of the windows appear sound with blinds inside them while at most hours smoke may be seen ascending from at least two of the chimneys few approach near enough the place to note its peculiarities the traveller gets but a distant glimpse of its chimney-pots for the country road avoiding the dip of the ravine is carried round its head and far from the house it can only be approached by a long narrow lane leading nowhere else so steep as to deter any explorer save a pedestrian while he too would have to contend with an obstruction of overgrowing thorns and trailing brambles notwithstanding these disadvantages glengog has something to recommend it a prospect not surpassed in the western shires of england he who selected its site must have been a man of tastes rather aesthetic than utilitarian for the land attached and belonging some fifty or sixty acres is barely arable lying against the abruptly sloping sides of the ravine but the view is superb below the y winding through a partially wood-covered plain like some grand constrictor snake its sinuosities only here and there visible through the trees resembling a chain of detached lakes till sweeping past the cuckoo's glen it runs on in straight reach towards langorn eye of man never looked upon lovelier landscape mind of man could not contemplate one more suggestive of all that is or ought to be interesting in life peaceful smokes ascending out of far-off chimneys farmhouses with their surrounding walls standing amid the greenery of old homestead trees now in full leaf for it is the month of june here and there the sharp spire of a church or the showy facade of a gentleman's mansion in the distant background the dark blue mountains of monmouthshire among them conspicuous the blorange scarred and sugar-loaf the man who could look on such a picture without drawing from it inspirations of pleasure must be out of sorts with the world if not weary of it and yet just such a man is now viewing it from glengog house or rather the bit of shrubbery ground in front he is seated on a rustic bench partly shattered barely enough of it whole to give room beside him for a small japanned tray on which are tumbler bottle and jug the two last respectively containing brandy and water while in the first is an admixture of both he is smoking a meerschaum pipe which at short intervals he removes from his mouth to give place to the drinking-glass the personal appearance of this man is in curious correspondence with the bench on which he sits the walls around and the house behind like all these he looks dilapidated not only is his apparel out of repair but his constitution too 
as shown by hollow cheeks and sunken eyes with crow's feet ramifying around them this do not as with the surrounding objects to age for he is still under forty nor yet any of the natural infirmities to which flesh is heir but evidently to drink some reddish spots upon his nose and flecks on the forehead with the glass held in shaking hand proclaims this a cause and it is lewin murdoch such is the man's name has led a dissipated life not much of it in england still less in herefordshire and only its earlier years in the house he now inhabits his paternal home since boyhood he has been abroad staying none can say where and straying no one knows whither often seen however at baden Hamburg, and other hells punting high or low as the luck has gone for or against him at a later period in paris during the imperial regime worst hell of all it has stripped him of everything driven him out and home to seek asylum at glingog once a handsome property now but a pied a terre on which he may only set his foot with a mortgage around his neck for even the little land left to it is let out to a farmer and the rent goes not to him he is in fact only a tenant on his patrimonial estate holding but the house at that with the ornamental grounds and an acre or two of orchard of which he takes no care the farmer's sheep may scale the crumbling walls and browse the weedy enclosure at will give lewin murdoch his meerschaum pipe with enough brandy and water and he but laughs not that he is of a jovial disposition not at all given to mirth only that it takes something more than the pasturage of an old orchard to excite his thoughts or turn them to cupidity for all land does this the very thing no limited tract but one of many acres in extent even miles the land of Langorn. it is now before his face and under his eyes as a map unfolded on the opposite side of the river it forms the foreground of the landscape in its midst the many-windowed mansion backed by stately trees with well-kept grounds and green pastures at a little distance the grange or home farm and farther off others that look of the same belonging as they are a smiling picture it is spread before the eyes of lewin murdoch whenever he sits in his front window or steps outside the door and the brighter the sun shines on it the darker the shadow on his brow not much of an enigma either that land of Langorn belonged to his grandfather but now is or soon will be the property of his cousin gwendolen wynne were she not it would be his between him and it runs the wye a broad deep river but what its width or depth compared with that other something between a barrier stronger and more impassable than the stream yet seeming slight as a thread for it is but the thread of a life should it snap or get accidentally severed lewin murdoch would only have to cross the river proclaim himself master of Langorn, and take possession he would scarce be human not to think of all this and being human he does has thought of it oft and many a time with feelings too beyond the mere prompting of cupidity these due to a legend handed down to him telling of an unfair disposal of the Langorn property but a pittance given to his mother who married murdoch of glingog while the bulk went to her brother the father of gwen wynne all matters of testament since the estate is unentailed the only grace of the grandfather towards the murdoch branch being a clause entitling them to possession in the event of the collateral heirs dying out and of these but one is living the heroine of our tale only she but she mutters lewin murdoch in a tone of such bitterness that as if to drown it he plucks the pipe out of his mouth and gulps down the last drop in the glass End of chapter ten volume one chapter eleven of gwen wynn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Paul Stevens. Gwen Wynne, A Romance of the Wye by Main Reed. Volume 1, Chapter 11, A Weed by the Wye Side. Only she, but she, he repeats, grasping the bottle by the neck and pouring more brandy into the tumbler. Though speaking sotto voce, and not supposing himself overheard, he is, nevertheless, by a woman who, coming forth from the house, 
her steps silently behind him, there pausing. Odd-looking apparition she, seen upon the Y side, altogether unlike a native of it, but altogether like one born upon the banks of the Seine, and brought up to tread the boulevards of Paris, like the latter from the crown of her head to the soles of her high-heeled boots, on whose toes she stands poised and balancing. In front of that ancient English manor-house she seems grotesquely out of place, as much as a costermonger driving his moke cart among the pyramids, or smoking a pickwick by the side of the sphinx. For all there is nothing mysterious or even strange in her presence there. She is Lewin Murdoch's wife. If he has left his fortune in foreign lands, with the better part of his life and health, he has thence brought her his better half. Physically a fine-looking woman, despite some ravages due to time, and possibly more to crime. Tall and dark as the daughters of the Latinic race, with features beautiful in the past, even still attractive to those not repelled by the beguiling glances of sin. Such were hers, first given to him in a café chantant of the Tuileries, often afterwards repeated in Jardin, Bois and Bal of the Demi-Monde, till at length she gave him her hand in the Église La Madeleine. Busied with his brandy, and again gazing at Langoran, he has not yet seen her, nor is he aware of her proximity till hearing an exclamation. Eh bien? He starts at the interrogatory, turning round. You think too loud, monsieur. That is if you wish to keep your thoughts to yourself. And you might, seeing that it's a love secret. May I ask who is this she you're soliloquizing about? Some of your old English bon ami, I suppose. This with an air of affected jealousy she is far from feeling. In the heart of the ex-cocotte there is no place for such a sentiment. Got nothing to do with bon ami, young or old, he gruffly replies. Just now I've got something else to think of than sweethearts. Enough occupation for my thoughts in the how I'm to support a wife. Yourself, madame. It wasn't me you meant. No, indeed. Some other, in whom you appear to feel a very profound interest. There you're right. It was one other, in whom I feel all that. Merci, monsieur, ma foi. Your candour deserves all thanks. Perhaps you'll extend it, and favour me with the lady's name. A lady, I presume. A grand seigneur, Lewin Murdoch, would not be giving his thoughts to less. Ignorance pretended. She knows or surmises to whom he has been giving them, for she has been watching him from a window, and observed the direction of his glances. And she has more than a suspicion as to the nature of his reflections, since she is well aware as he of that something besides a river separating them from Langoran. Her name? she again asks, in tone of more demand, with eyes bent searchingly on his. Avoiding her glance, he still pulls away at his pipe, without making answer. It is a love secret, then. I thought so. It's cruel of you, Lewin. This is the return for giving you all I had to give. She may well speak hesitatingly, and hint at a limited sacrifice. Only her hand, and it more than tenderly pressed by scores, I hundreds of others, before being bestowed upon him. No false pretense, however, on her part. He knew all that, or should have known it. How could he help? Olymp, the belle of the Jardin Mabille, was no obscurity in the demi-monde of Paris, even in its days of glory under Napoleon Le Petit. Her reproach is also a pretense, though possibly with some sting felt. She is drawing on to that term of life termed passé, and begins to feel conscious of it. He may be the same, not that for his opinion she cares a straw, save in a certain sense, and for reasons altogether independent of slighted affection the very purpose she is now working upon, and for which she needs to hold over him the power she has hitherto had, and well knows she how to retain it, rekindling love's fire when it seems in danger of dying out, either through appeal to his pity or exciting his jealousy, which she can adroitly do by her artful French ways and dark flashing eyes. As he looks in them now the old flame flickers up, and he feels almost as much her slave as when he first became her husband. For all he does not show it. This day he is out of sorts with himself, and her, and all the world besides. So instead of reciprocating her sham tenderness, as if knowing it such, he takes another swallow of brandy, and smokes on in silence. Now really incensed, or seeming so, she exclaims, Perfide! adding with a disdainful toss of the head, such as only the dam of the demi-monde know how to give, Keep your secret! What care I? Then changing tone, Mon Dieu! France! Dear France! Why did I ever leave you? 
because your dear France became too dear to live in. Clever double entendre, no doubt you think it witty. Dear or not, better a garret there, a room in its humblest entresol than this. I'd rather serve in a cigar shop, keep a gageot in the Faubourg Montmartre, than lead such a triste life as we're now doing, living in this wretched kennel of a house that threatens to tumble on our heads. How would you like to live in that over yonder? He nods towards Langoran Court. You are merry, monsieur, but your jests are out of place in presence of the misery around us. You may some day, he goes on, without heeding her observation. Yes, when the sky falls we may catch larks. You seem to forget that Mademoiselle Wynne is younger than either of us, and by the natural laws of life will outlive both. Must, unless she break her neck in the hunting field, get drowned out of a boat, or meet some other mischance. She pronounces the last three words slowly and with marked emphasis, pausing after she has spoken them and looking fixedly in his face, as if to note their effect. Taking the meerschaum from his mouth, he returns her look, almost shuddering as his eyes meet hers, and he reads in them a glance such as might have been given by Messalina or the murderess of Duncan. Hardened as his conscience has become through a long career of sin, it is yet tender in comparison with hers, and he knows it, knowing her history, or enough of it, her nature as well, to make him think her capable of anything, even the crime her speech seems to point to, neither more nor less than... He dares not think, let alone pronounce, the word. He is not yet up to that, though day by day, as his desperate fortunes press upon him, his thoughts are being familiarized with something akin to it, a dread, dark design, still vague, but needing not much to assume shape and tempt to execution. And that the tempter is by his side, he is more than half conscious. It is not the first time for him to listen to fell speech from those fair lips. Today he would rather shun allusion to a subject so grave yet so delicate. He has spent part of the preceding night at the Welsh Harp, the tavern spoken of by Wingate, and his nerves are unstrung, yet not recovered from the revelry. Instead of asking her what she means by some other mischance, he but remarks with an air of careless indifference. True, Olymp, unless something of that sort were to happen, there seems no help for us but to resign ourselves to patience and live on expectations. Starve on them, you mean? This in a tone and with a shrug, which seemed to convey reproach for its weakness. Well, Cherie, he rejoins, we can at least feast our eyes on the source whence our fine fortunes are to come. And a pretty sight, isn't it? Un coup d'ail charmant. He again turns his eyes upon Langoran, and also she, and for some time both are silent. Attractive at any time, the court is unusually so on this same summer's day, for the sun lighting up the verdant lawn also shines upon a large white tent there erected, a marquee from whose ribbed roof projects a signal staff, with flag floating at its peak. They have no direct information of what all this is for, since to Lewin Murdoch and his wife the society of Herefordshire is tabooed. But they can guess from the symbols that it is to be a garden party, or something of the sort, there often given. While they are still gazing, its special kind is declared, by figures appearing upon the lawn and taking stand in groups before the tent. There are ladies gaily attired, in the distance looking like bright butterflies, some dressed a la Diane, with bows in hand and quivers slung by their sides the feathered shafts showing over their shoulders, a proportionate number of gentlemen attendant, while liveried servants stride to and fro, erecting the ringed targets. Murdoch himself cares little for such things. He has had his surfeit of fashionable life, not only sipped its sweets, but drank its dregs of bitterness. He regards Langoran with something in his mind more substantial than its sports and pastimes. With different thoughts looks the Parisian upon them. In her heart a chagrin only known to those whose zest for the world's pleasure is of keenest edge, yet checked and baffled from indulgence. Ambitions uncontrollable, but never to be attained. As Satan gazed back when hurled out of the Garden of Eden, so she at that scene upon the lawn of Langoran. No jardin of Paris, not the Bois itself, ever seemed to her so attractive as those grounds, with that aristocratic gathering, a heaven none of her kind can enter, and but few of her country. After long regarding it with envy in her eyes and spleen in her soul, tantalized almost to torture, she faces towards her husband, saying, 
"'And you've told me, between all that and us, there's but one life.' Two, interrupts a voice, not his. Both turning, startled, behold, Father Rogier. End of Volume 1, Chapter 11《ボリューム1 Chapter 12 of Gwen Wynn》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Stevens《Gwen Wynn A Romance of the Y》by Maine Reed《Volume 1 Chapter 12 A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing》Father Rogier is a French priest of a type too well known all over the world, the Jesuitical. Spare of form, thin-lipped, nose with the cuticle drawn across it tight as drum parchment, skin dark and cadaverous, he looks Loyola from head to heel. He himself looks no one straight in the face. Confronted, his eyes fall to his feet, or turn to either side, not in timid abashment, but as those of one who feels himself a felon. And but for his habiliments, he might well pass for such though even the sacerdotal garb and assumed air of sanctity do not hinder the suspicion of a wolf in sheep's clothing, rather suggesting it. And in truth is he one, a very Pharisee, inquisitor to boot, cruel and keen as ever sat in secret council over an auto de fe. What is such a man doing in Herefordshire? What in Protestant England? Time was, and not so long ago, when these questions would have been asked with curiosity and some degree of indignation, as, for instance, when our popular queen added to her popularity by somewhat ostentatiously declaring that no foreign priest should take tithe or toll in her dominions, even forbidding them their distinctive dress. Then they stole timidly and sneakingly through the streets, usually seen hunting in couples, and looking as if conscious their pursuit was criminal or at the least illegal. All that is over now, the ban removed, the boast unkept, to all appearance forgotten. Now they stalk boldly abroad or saunter in squads, exhibiting their shorn crowns and pallid faces without fear or shame, instead triumphantly flouting their vestments in public walks or parks, or loitering in the vestibules of convents and monasteries, which begin to show thick over the land threatening us with a curse as that anterior to the time of bluff King Hal. No one now thinks it strange to see shovel-hatted priest or sandaled monk, no matter in what part of England, nor would wonder at one of either being resident upon Wyside. Father Rogier, one of the former, is there with similar motive, and for the same purpose, his sort are sent everywhere, to enslave the souls of men and get money out of their purses, in order that other men, princes and priests like himself, may lead luxurious lives without toil and by trickery. The same old story since the beginning of the world, or man's presence upon it. The same craft as the rain-maker of South Africa, or the medicine-man of the North American Indian, differing only in some points of practice, the religious juggler of a higher civilization, finding his readiest tools not in roots, snakeskins, and rattles, but the weakness of woman. Through this, as by sap and mine, many a strong citadel has been carried, after bidding defiance to the boldest and most determined assault. Père Rogier well knows all this, and by experience having played the propagandist game with some success since his settling in Herefordshire. He has not been quite three years resident on Wyside, and yet has contrived to draw around him a considerable coterie of weak-minded Marthas and Marys, built him a little chapel with a snug dwelling-house, and is in a fair way of further feathering his nest. True, his neophytes are nearly all of the humbler class and poor, but the Peter's pence count up in a remarkable manner, and are paid with a regularity which only blind devotion or the zeal of religious partisanship can exact. Fear of the devil and love of him are alike effective in drawing contributions to the box of the Rugs Ferry Chapel and filling the pockets of its priest. And if he have no grand people among his flock, and few disciples of the class called Middle, he can boast of at least two claiming to be genteel, the Murdochs. With the man no false assumption either, neither does he assume or value it. Different the woman. 
born in the Faubourg Montmartre, her father a common ouvrier, her mother a blanchicheuse, herself a beautiful girl, Olympe Renault soon found her way into a more fashionable quarter. The same ambition made her Lewin Murdoch's wife, and has brought her on to England, for she did not marry him without some knowledge of his reversionary interest in the land of which they have just been speaking, and at which they are still looking. That was part of the inducement held out for obtaining her hand. Her heart he never had. That the priest knows something of the same, indeed all, is evident from the word he has respondingly pronounced. With step, silent and cat-like, his usual mode of progression, he has come upon them unawares, neither having note of his approach till startled by his voice. On hearing it, and seeing who, Murdoch rises to his feet, as he does so saluting. Notwithstanding long years of a depraved life, his early training has been that of a gentleman, and its instincts at times return to him. Besides, born and brought up Roman Catholic, he has that respect for his priest, habitual to a proverb, would have, even if knowing the latter to be the veriest Pharisee that ever wore a single-breasted black coat. Salutations exchanged, and a chair brought out for the newcomer to sit upon, Murdoch demands explanation of the interrupting monosyllable, asking, What do you mean, Father Rogier, by two? What I have said, monsieur, that there are two between you and that over yonder, or soon will be, in time perhaps ten. A fair paysage it is, he continues, looking across the river, a very vale of Tempe or garden of the Hesperides. Parbleu, I never believed your England so beautiful. Ah, what's going on at Langoran? This as his eyes rest upon the tent, the flags, and gaily dressed figures. A fete champêtre, mademoiselle making merry, in honour of the anticipated change, no doubt. Still, I don't comprehend, says Murdoch, looking puzzled. You speak in riddles, Father Rogier. Riddles easily read, monsieur. Of this particular one you'll find the interpretation there. This, pointing to a plain gold ring on the fourth finger of Mrs. Murdoch's left hand put upon it by Murdoch himself on the day he became her husband. He now comprehends his quick-witted wife sooner. Ha! she exclaims, as if pricked by a pin. Mademoiselle to be married! The priest gives an assenting nod. That's news to me, mutters Murdoch, in a tone more like he was listening to the announcement of a death. Moi, si! Who, père? Not Monsieur Shenstone, after all? The question shows how well she is acquainted with Miss Wynne, if not personally, with her surroundings and predilections. No, answers the priest, not he. Who, then? asked the two simultaneously. A man likely to make many heirs to Langoran, widen the breach between you and it. Ah, to the impossibility of that ever being bridged. Père Rogier, appeals Murdoch, I pray you speak out. Who is to do this? His name— the Capitaine Rycroft. Captain Rycroft? Who? What is he? An officer of hussars. A fine-looking fellow, sort of combination of Mars and Apollo, strong as Hercules. As I've said, likely to be father to no end of sons and daughters, with Gwen Wynne for their mother. Eh la! I can fancy seeing them now, at play over yonder, on the lawn. Captain Rycroft, repeats Murdoch musingly. I never saw, never heard of the man. You hear of him now, and possibly see him too. No doubt he's among those gay toxophilites. Ha! No, he's nearer. What a strange coincidence. The old saws speak of the fiend. There's your fiend, Monsieur Murdoch. He points to a boat on the river with two men in it, one of them wearing a white cap. It is dropping down in the direction of Langoran Court. Which? asks Murdoch mechanically. He with the chapeau blanc. That's whom you have to fear. The others but the waterman Wingate, honest fellow enough, whom no one need fear, unless indeed our worthy friend Coracle Dick, his competitor for the smiles of the pretty Mary Morgan. Yes, mes amis, under that conspicuous capy you behold the future lord of Langoran. Never! exclaims Murdoch, angrily gritting his teeth. Never! The French priest and ci devant French courtesan exchange secret but significant glances a pleased expression showing on the faces of both. "'You speak excitedly, monsieur,' says the priest, emphatically, too. But how is it to be hindered?' "'I don't know,' sourly rejoins Murdoch. "'I suppose it can't be,' he adds, 
drawing back, as if conscious of having committed himself. "'Never mind now. Let's drop the disagreeable subject. You'll stay for dinner with us, Father Rogier? If not putting you to inconvenience. Nay, it's you who'll be inconvenienced. Starved, I should rather say. The butchers about here are not of the most amiable type, and, if I mistake not, our menu for today is a very primitive one. Bacon and potatoes, with some greens from the old garden. Monsieur Murdoch, it is not the fare but the fashion which makes a meal enjoyable. A crust and welcome is to me better cheer than a banquet with a grudging host at the head of the table. Besides, your English bacon is a most estimable dish, and with your succulent cabbages, delectable. With a bit of wise salmon to proceed, and a pheasant to follow, it were food to satisfy Lucullus himself. Ah, true, assents the broken-down gentleman, with the salmon and pheasant. But where are they? My fishmonger, who is conjointly also a game-dealer, is at present as much out with me as is the butcher, I suppose from my being too much in with them, in their books. Still, they have not ceased acquaintance, so far as calling is concerned. That they do with provoking frequency. Even this morning, before I was out of bed, I had the honour of a visit from both the gentlemen. Unfortunately, they bought neither fish nor meat. Instead, two sheets of that detestable blue paper, with red lines and rows of figures, an arithmetic not nice to be bothered with at one's breakfast. So, Pear, I am sorry I can't offer you any salmon, and as for pheasant, you may not be aware that it is out of season. It's never out of season, any more than barn or fowl, especially if a young last year's cock that hasn't been successful in finding a mate. But it's close time now, urges the Englishman, stirred by his old instincts of gentleman sportsman. Not to those who know how to open it, returns the Frenchman, with a significant shrug. And suppose we do that today? I don't understand. Will your reverence enlighten me? Well, monsieur, being Whit Monday, and coming to pay you a visit, I thought you mightn't be offended by my bringing along with me a little present for madame here, that we're talking of, salmon and pheasant. The husband, more than the wife, looks incredulous. Is the priest jesting? Beneath the frock, fitting tight his thin spare form, there is nothing to indicate the presence of either fish or bird. "'Where are they?' asks Murdoch mechanically. "'You say you've brought them along?' "'Ah, that was metaphorical. I meant to say I had sent them, and if I mistake not, they are near now. Yes, there's my messenger.' He points to a man making up the glen threading his way through the tangle of wild bushes that grow along the banks of the rivulet. "'Coracle Dick!' exclaims Murdoch, recognising the poacher. "'The identical individual,' answers the priest, adding, "'who, though a poacher, and possibly has been something worse, is not such a bad fellow in his way, for certain purposes. True, he's neither the most devout nor best behaved of my flock.' Still a useful individual, especially on Fridays, when one has to confine himself to a fish diet. I find him convenient in other ways as well, as so might you, Monsieur Murdoch, some day. Should you ever have need of a strong hard hand, with a heart in correspondence, Richard Dempsey possesses both, and would no doubt place them at your service, for a consideration. While Murdoch is cogitating on what the last words are meant to convey, the individual so recommended steps upon the ground. A stout, thick-set fellow, with a shock of black curly hair coming low down almost to his eyes, thus adding to their sinister and lowering look. For all a face not naturally uncomely, but one on which crime has set its stamp, deep and indelible. His garb is such as gamekeepers usually wear, and poachers almost universally affect. A shooting coat of velveteen, corduroy smalls, and sheepskin gaiters buttoned over thick-soled shoes iron-tipped at the toes. In the ample skirt pockets of the coat, each big as a game-bag, appear two protuberances that about balance one another, the presence of which the priest has already delivered the invoice, in the one being a salmon blotcher weighing some three or four pounds, in the other a young cock pheasant. Having made obeisance to the trio in the grounds of Glingog, he is about drawing them forth when the priest prevents him, exclaiming, Arete! They're not commodities that keep well in the sun. Should a water bailiff or one of the Langoran gamekeepers chance to set eyes on them, they'd spoil at once. Those lynx-eyed fellows can see a long way, especially on a day bright as this. 
So, worthy Coracle, before uncarting, you'd better take them back to the kitchen. Thus instructed, the poacher strides off round to the rear of the house, Mrs. Murdoch entering by the front door to give directions about dressing the dinner. Not that she intends to take any hand in cooking it. Not she. That would be infradig for the ancien belle of Mabille. Poor as is the establishment of Glingog, it can boast of a plain cook, with a Slavi to assist. The other two remain outside, the guest joining his host in a glass of brandy and water. More than one, for Father Rogier, though French, can drink like a born Hibernian. Nothing of the good Templar in him. After they have been for nigh an hour hobnobbing, conversing, Murdoch still fighting shy of the subject, which is nevertheless uppermost in the minds of both, the priest once more approaches it, saying, Parbleu! They appear to be enjoying themselves over yonder. He is looking at the lawn where the bright forms are flitting to and fro. And most of all, I should say, Monsieur White Cap, for tasting the sweets of which he'll ere long enter into full enjoyment when he becomes master of Langoran. "'That never!' exclaims Murdoch, this time adding an oath. "'Never while I live! When I'm dead! Dinner!' interrupts a female voice from the house, that of its mistress seen standing on the doorstep. "'Madame summons us,' says the priest. "'We must in, monsieur. While picking the bones of the pheasant, you can complete your unfinished speech. Allons!' End of Volume 1, Chapter 12《ボリューム1 Chapter 13 of Gwen Wynn》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Stevens. — Gwen Wynn, A Romance of the Y, by Main Reed. — Volume 1 Chapter 13 — Among the Arrows The invited to the archery meeting have nearly all arrived, and the shooting has commenced half a dozen arrows in the air at a time, making for as many targets. Only a limited number of ladies compete for the first score, each having a little coterie of acquaintances at her back. Gwen Wynne herself is in this opening contest, good with the bow as at the oar, indeed with county celebrity as an archer, carrying the champion badge of her club. It is almost a foregone conclusion she will come off victorious. Soon, however, those who are backing her begin to anticipate disappointment. She is not shooting with her usual skill, nor yet earnestness. Instead, negligently, and to all appearance with thoughts abstracted, her eyes every now and then straying over the ground, scanning the various groups as if in search of a particular individual. The gathering is large, nearly a hundred people present, and one might come or go without attracting observation. She evidently expects one to come who is not yet there and oftener than elsewhere her glances go towards the boat dock, as if the personage expected should appear in that direction. There is a nervous restlessness in her manner, and after each reconnaissance of this kind an expression of disappointment on her countenance. It is not unobserved. A gentleman by her side notes it, and with some suspicion of its cause, a suspicion that pains him. It is George Shenstone, who is attending on her, handing the arrows, in short, acting as her aide-de-camp. Neither is he adroit in the exercise of his duty. Instead performs it bunglingly, his thoughts preoccupied and eyes wandering about. His glances, however, are sent in the opposite direction, to the gate entrance of the park, visible from the place where the targets are set up. They are both prospecting for the self-same individual, but with very different ideas one eagerly anticipating his arrival, the other as earnestly hoping he may not come. For the expected one is a gentleman, no other than Vivian Rycroft. Shenstone knows the Hussar officer has been invited, and, however hoping or wishing it, has but little faith he will fail. Were it himself, no ordinary obstacle could prevent his being present at that archery meeting, any more than would five-bar gate or bullfinch hinder him from keeping up with hounds. As time passes without any further arrivals, and the tardy guest has not yet put in appearance, Shenstone begins to think he will this day have Miss Wynne to himself, or at least without any formidable competitor. There are others present who seek her smiles, some aspiring to her hand, but none he fears so much as the one still absent. 
Just as he is becoming calm and confident, he is saluted by a gentleman of the genus Swell, who, approaching, drawls out the interrogatory. Who is that fellow, Shenstone? What fellow? He with the very peculiar headgear. Indian affair. Topi, I believe they call it. Where? asks Shenstone, starting and staring to all sides. Yonder, approaching from the direction of the river. Looks a fresh arrival. I take it he must have come by boat. Nor him? George Shenstone, strong man though he be, visibly trembles. Were Gwen Wynne at that moment to face about and aim one of her arrows at his breast, it would not bring more pallor upon his cheeks, nor pain to his heart. For he wearing the peculiar headgear is the man he most fears, and whom he had hoped not to see this day. So much is he affected, he does not answer the question put to him, nor indeed has he opportunity, as just then Miss Wynne, citing the topi too, suddenly turning, says to him, George, be good enough to take charge of these things. She holds her bow with an arrow she has been affixing to the string. Yonder's a gentleman just arrived, who you know is a stranger. Aunt will expect me to receive him. I'll be back as soon as I've discharged my duty. Delivering the bow and unspent shaft, she glides off without further speech or ceremony. He stands looking after, in his eyes anything but a pleased expression. Indeed sullen, almost angry, as watching her every movement, he notes the manner of her reception, greeting the newcomer with a warmth and cordiality he, Shenstone, thinks uncalled for, however much stranger the man may be. Little irksome to her seems the discharge of that so-called duty, but so exasperating to the baronet's son, he feels like crushing the bow-stick between his fingers, or snapping it in twain across his knee. As he stands with eyes glaring upon them, he is again accosted by his inquisitive acquaintance, who asks, "'What's the matter, George? You haven't answered my interrogatory.' "'What was it? I forget.' "'Oh, indeed, that's strange. I merely wish to know who Mr. Whitecap is.' "'Just what I'd like to know myself. All I can tell you is that he's an army fellow, in the cavalry, I believe, by name Rycroft.' "'Oh, yes, cavalry. That's evident by the bend of his legs. Wycroft.' Wycroft, you say? So he calls himself. A captain of hussars. His own story. This in a tone and with shrug of insinuation. But you don't think he's an adventurer? Can't say whether he is or not. Who's his endorser? How came he introduced at Langowan? That I can't tell you. He could, though, for Miss Wynne, true to her promise, has made him acquainted with the circumstances of the river adventure, though not those leading to it and he, true to his, has kept them a secret. In a sense, therefore, he could not tell, and the subterfuge is excusable. By Jove! The light bob appears to have made good use of his time, however introduced. Miss Gwen seems quite familiar with him, and yonder the little Lee shaking hands, as though the two had been acquainted ever since coming out of their cradles. See, they're dragging him up to the ancient spinster, who sits enthroned in her chair, like a queen of the tournament times. Very medieval, the whole affair, very. Instead, very modern, in my opinion, disgustingly so. Why do you say that, George? Why? Because in either olden or medieval times such a thing couldn't have occurred, here in Herefordshire. What thing, pray? A man admitted into good society without endorsement or introduction. Nowadays any one may be so, claim acquaintance with a lady, and force his company upon her, simply from having had the chance to pick up a dropped pocket-handkerchief, or offer his umbrella in a skiff of a shower. But surely that isn't how the gentleman yonder made acquaintance with the fair Gwendolyn. Oh, I don't say that, rejoins Shenstone, with forced attempt at a smile, more natural, as he sees Miss Wynne separate from the group they are gazing at, and come back to reclaim her bow. Better satisfied now, he is rather worried by his importunate friend, and to get rid of him adds, If you are really desirous to know how Miss Wynne became acquainted with him, you can ask the lady herself. Not for all the world would the swell put that question to Gwen Wynne. It would not be safe, and thus snubbed, he saunters away, before she is up to the spot. Rycroft, left with Miss Linton, remains in conversation with her. It is not his first interview, for several times already he has been a visitor at Langoran. 
introduced by the young ladies as the gentleman who, when the pleasure boat was caught in a dangerous whirl, out of which old Joseph was unable to extricate it, came to their rescue, possibly to the saving of their lives. Thus the version of the adventure, vouchsafed to the aunt, sufficient to sanction his being received at the court. And the ancient toast of Cheltenham has been charmed with him. In the handsome Hussar officer she beholds the typical hero of her romance reading, so much like it that Lord Lutestring has long ago gone out of her thoughts, passed from her memory as though he had been but a musical sound. Of all who bend before her this day, the worship of none is so welcome as that of the martial stranger. Resuming her bow, Gwen shoots no better than before. Her thoughts, instead of being concentrated on the painted circles, as her eyes, are half the time straying over her shoulders to him behind, still in a tete-a-tete -tete with the aunt. Her arrows fly wild and wide, scarce one sticking in the straw. In fine, among all the competitors, she counts lowest score, the poorest she has herself ever made. But what matters it? She is only too pleased when her quiver is empty, and she can have excuse to return to Miss Linton, on some question connected with the hospitalities of the house. Observing all this, and much more besides, George Shenstone feels aggrieved, indeed exasperated, so terribly it takes all his best breeding to withhold him from an exhibition of bad behaviour. He might not succeed were he to remain much longer on the ground, which he does not, as if misdoubting his power of restraint and fearing to make a fool of himself, he too frames excuse and leaves Langoran long before the sports come to a close. Not rudely, or with any show of spleen, he is a gentleman, even in his anger, and bidding a polite and formal adieu to Miss Linton, with one equally ceremonious, but more distant, to Miss Wynne, he slips round to the stables, orders his horse, leaps into the saddle, and rides off. Many the day he has entered the gates of Langoran with a light and happy heart. This day he goes out of them with one heavy and sad. If missed from the archery meeting, it is not by Miss Wynne. Instead, she is glad of his being gone, notwithstanding the love-passion for another now occupying her heart, almost filling it, there is still room there for the gentler sentiment of pity. She knows how Shenstone suffers, how could she help knowing, and pities him. Never more than at this same moment, despite that distant, half-disdainful adieu, vouchsafe to her at parting, by him intended to conceal his thoughts as his sufferings, while but the better revealing them. How men underrate the perception of women, in matters of this kind a very intuition. None keener than that of Gwen Wynne. She knows why he has gone so short away, well as if he had told her, and with the compassionate thought still lingering she heaves a sigh, sad as she sees him ride out through the gate, going in reckless gallop, but succeeded by one of relief, soon as he is out of sight. In an instant after she is gay and gladsome as ever, once more bending the bow and making the catgut twang, but now shooting straight, hitting the target every time, and not unfrequently lodging a shaft in the gold. For he who now attends her not only inspires confidence, but excites her to the display of skill. Captain Rycroft has taken George Shenstone's place as her aide-de-camp, and while he hands the arrows, she spending them, others of a different kind pass between, the shafts of Cupid of which there is a full quiver in the eyes of both. End of Volume 1, Chapter 13。Volume 1, Chapter 14 of Gwen Wynne。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Stevens. Gwen Wynne, A Romance of the Why, by Maine Reed. Volume 1, Chapter 14, Beating About the Bush. Naturally, Captain Rycroft is the subject of speculation among the archers at Langoran. A man of his mien would be so anywhere, if stranger. The old story of the unknown knight suddenly appearing on the tourney's field with closed visor, only recognisable by a love-lock or other favour of the lady whose cause he comes to champion. He, too, wears a distinctive badge, in the white cap, 
for though our tale is of modern time, it antedates that when Brown began to affect the Pougaree, sham of Manchester Mills, as an appendage to his cheap straw hat. That on the head of Captain Rycroft is the regular forage cap with quilted cover. Accustomed to it in India, whence he has but lately returned, he adheres to it in England without thought of its attracting attention, and as little caring whether it do or not. It does, however. Insular, we are supremely conservative, some might call it caddish, and view innovations with a jealous eye, as witness the so-called moustache movement not many years ago, and the fierce controversy it called forth. For other reasons, the officer of Hussars is at this same archery gathering a cynosure of eyes. There is a perfume of romance about him, in the way he has been introduced to the ladies of Langoran, a question asked by others besides the importunate friend of George Shenstone. The true account of the affair with the drunken foresters has not got abroad, these keeping dumb about their own discomfiture, while Jack Wingate, a man of few words, and on this special matter admonished to silence, has been equally close-mouthed, Joseph also mute for reasons already mentioned. Withal, a vague story has currency in the neighbourhood, of a boat with two young ladies in danger of being capsized, by some versions actually upset, and the ladies rescued from drowning by a stranger who chanced to be salmon-fishing nearby, his name Rycroft. And as this tale also circulates among the archers at Langoran, it is not strange that some interest should attach to the supposed hero of it now present. Still, in an assemblage so large, and composed of such distinguished people, many of whom are strangers to one another, no particular personage can be for long an object of special concern. And if Captain Rycroft continue to attract observation, it is neither from curiosity as to how he came there, nor the peculiarity of his headdress, but the dark, handsome features beneath it. On these more than one pair of bright eyes occasionally become fixed, regarding them with admiration. None so warmly as those of Gwen Wynne, though hers neither openly nor in a marked manner, for she is conscious of being under the surveillance of other eyes, and needs to observe the proprieties, in which she succeeds, so well that no one watching her could tell, much less say, there is aught in her behaviour to Captain Rycroft beyond the hospitality of host, which in a sense she is, to guest claiming the privileges of a stranger. Even when during an interregnum of the sports the two go off together, and, after strolling for a time through the grounds, are at length seen to step inside the summer-house, it may cause, but does not merit, remark. Others are acting similarly, sauntering in pairs, loitering in shady places, or sitting on rustic benches. Good society allows the freedom, and to its credit. That which is corrupt alone may cavil at it, and shame the day when such confidence be abused and abrogated. Side by side they take stand in the little pavilion, under the shadow of its painted zinc roof. It may not have been all chance their coming thither, no more the archery party itself. That Gwendolyn Wynne, who suggested giving it, can alone tell. But standing there with their eyes bent on the river, they are for a time silent, so much that each can hear the beating of the other's heart, both brimful of love. At such moment one might suppose there could be no reserve or reticence, but confession full, candid, and mutual. Instead, at no time is this farther off. If le joie fait peur, far more l'amour. And with all that has passed is there fear between them, on her part springing from a fancy she has been over-forward, in her gushing gratitude for that service done, given too free expression to it, and needs being more reserved now. On his side speech is stayed by a reflection somewhat akin, with others besides. In his several calls at the court his reception has been both welcome and warm, still not beyond the bounds of well-bred hospitality. But why on each and every occasion has he found a gentleman there, the same every time, George Shenstone by name? there before him, and staying after, and this very day what meant Mr. Shenstone by that sudden and abrupt departure. Above all, why her distraught look, with the sigh accompanying it, as the baronet's son went galloping out of the gate. Having seen the one, and heard the other, 
Captain Rycroft has misinterpreted both. No wonder his reluctance to speak words of love. And so for a time they are silent, the dread of misconception with consequent fear of committal holding their lips sealed. On a simple utterance now may hinge their life's happiness or its misery. Nor is it so strange that in a moment fraught with such mighty consequence, conversation should be not only timid, but commonplace. They who talk of love's eloquence, but think of it in its lighter phases, perhaps its lying. When truly, deeply felt, it is dumb, as devout worshipper in the presence of the divinity worshipped. Here, side by side, are two highly organized beings, a man handsome and courageous, a woman beautiful and aught but timid, both well up in the accomplishments and gifted with the graces of life, loving each other to their soul's innermost depths, yet embarrassed in manner and constrained in speech as though they were a couple of rustics. More, for Corridon would fling his arms round his Phyllis and give her an eloquent smack, which she with like readiness would return. Very different the behaviour of these in the pavilion. They stand for a time silent as statues, though not without a tremulous motion scarce perceptible, as if the amorous electricity around stifled their breathing, for the time hindering speech, and when at length this comes it is of no more significance than what might be expected between two persons lately introduced, and feeling but the ordinary interest in one another. It is the lady who speaks first. I understand you've been but a short while resident in our neighbourhood, Captain Rycroft. Not quite three months, Miss Wynne. Only a week or two before I had the pleasure of making your acquaintance. Thank you for calling it a pleasure. Not much in the manner, I should say, but altogether the contrary. She laughs, adding, And how do you like our why? Who could help liking it? There's been much said of its scenery in books and newspapers. You really admire it? I do indeed. His preference is pardonable under the circumstances. I think it the finest in the world. What? You such a great traveller, in the tropics too, upon rivers that run between groves of evergreen trees and over sands of gold? Do you really mean that, Captain Rycroft? Really, truthfully. Why not, Miss Wynne? Because I suppose those grand rivers we read of were all so much superior to our little Herefordshire stream. In flow of water, scenery, everything. Nay, not everything, he says, interruptingly. In volume of water they may be, but far from it in other respects. In some it is superior to them all. Rhine, Rhone, ah, Hippocrene itself. His tongue is at length getting loosed. What other respects? she asks. The forms reflected in it, he answers hesitatingly. Not those of vegetation. Surely our oaks, elms, and poplars cannot be compared with the tall palms and graceful tree ferns of the tropics. No, not those. Our buildings neither, if photography tells truth, which it should. Those wonderful structures, towers, temples, pagodas, of which it has given us the facsimiles, far excel anything we have on the Wye, or anything in England. Even our Tintern, which we think so very grand, were but as nothing to them. Isn't that so? True, he says assentingly. One must admit the superiority of Oriental architecture. But you've not told me what form our English river reflects so much to your admiration. He has a fine opportunity for poetical reply. The image is in his mind, her own, with the word upon his tongue, woman's. But he shrinks from giving it utterance. Instead, retreating from the position he had assumed, he rejoins evasively, The truth is, Miss Wynne, I have had a surfeit of tropical scenery, and was only too glad once more to feast my eyes on the hill and dale landscapes of dear old England. I know none to compare with these of the Wyside. It's very pleasing to hear you say that, to me especially. It's but natural I should love our beautiful Wye, I, born on its banks, brought up on them, and I suppose likely to— What? he asks, observing that she has paused in her speech. Be buried on them, she answers laughingly. She intended to have said, stay on them for the rest of my life. You'll think that a very grave conclusion, she adds, keeping up the laugh. One at all events very far off, it is to be hoped, an eventuality not to arise till after you've passed many long and happy days— whether on the Y or elsewhere. Ah, who can tell? The future is a sealed book to all of us. Yours need not be, at least as regards its happiness. I think that is assured. Why do you say so, Captain Rycroft? Because it seems to me as though you had yourself the making of it. He saying no more than he thinks, far less. For he believes she could make fate itself, 
control it, as she can his. And as he would now confess to her, is almost on the eve of it, but hindered by recalling that strange look and sigh sent after Shenstone. His fond fancies, the sweet dreams he has been indulging in ever since making her acquaintance, may have been but illusions. She may be playing with him, as he would with a fish on his hook. As yet no word of love has passed her lips. Is there thought of it in her heart, for him? In what way? What mean you? she asks, her liquid eyes turned upon him with a look of searching interrogation. The question staggers him. He does not answer it as he would and again replies evasively, somewhat confusedly. "'Oh, I only meant, Miss Wynne, that you so young, so, well, with all the world before you, surely you have your happiness in your own hands.' If he knew how much it is in his, he would speak more courageously, and possibly with greater plainness. But he knows not, nor does she tell him. She, too, is cautiously retentive, and refrains taking advantage of his words, full of suggestion." It will need another séance, possibly more than one, before the real confidence can be exchanged between them. Natures like theirs do not rush into confession as the common kind. With them it is as with the wooing of eagles. She simply rejoins, I wish it were, adding with a sigh, far from it, I fear. He feels as if he had drifted into a dilemma, brought about by his own gaucherie, from which something seen up the river on the opposite side offers an opportunity to escape. A house. It is the quaint old habitation of Tudor times. Pointing to it, he says, A very odd building, that. If I've been rightly informed, Miss Wynne, it belongs to a relative of yours. I have a cousin who lives there. The shadow suddenly darkening her brow, with the slightly explicit rejoinder, tells him he is again on dangerous ground. He attributes it to the character he has heard of Mr. Murdoch. His cousin is evidently disinclined to converse about him. And she is, the shadow still staying. If she knew what is at that moment passing within Glingog, could but hear the conversation carried on at its dining-table, it might be darker. It is dark enough in her heart as on her face, possibly from a presentiment. Rycroft, more than ever embarrassed, feels it a relief when Ellen Lees, with the Reverend Mr. Musgrave as her cavalier attendant, they too, straying solitarily, approach near enough to be hailed, and invited into the pavilion. So the dialogue between the cautious lovers comes to an end, to both of them unsatisfactory enough. For this day their love must remain unrevealed, though never man and woman more longed to learn the sweet secret of each other's heart. End of Volume 1, Chapter 14《Volume One, Chapter Fifteen of Gwen Wynn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Stevens. Gwen Wynn, A Romance of the Why by Maine Reed. Volume One, Chapter Fifteen A Spiritual Advisor. While the sports are in progress outside Langoran Court, inside Glingog House is being eaten that dinner to commence with salmon in season and end with pheasant out. It is early, but the Murdochs, often glad to eat what Americans call a square meal, have no set hours for eating, while the priest is not particular. In the faces of the trio seated at the table, a physiognomist might find interesting study, and note expressions which would puzzle Lavater himself. Nor could they be interpreted by the conversation which, at first, only refers to topics of a trivial nature. But now and then a mot of double meaning let down by Rogier, and a glance surreptitiously exchanged between him and his countrymen, tell that the thoughts of these two are running upon themes different from those about which are their words. Murdoch, by no means of a trusting disposition, but oft-times furiously jealous, has nevertheless, in this respect, no suspicion of the priest, less from confidence than a sort of contempt for the pallid, puny creature, whom he feels he could crush in a moment of mad anger. And broken though he be, the stalwart and once strong Englishman could still do that. 
To imagine such a man as Rogier a rival in the affections of his own wife would be to belittle himself. Besides, he holds fast to that proverbial faith in the spiritual adviser, not always well founded, in his case certainly misplaced. Knowing naught of this, however, their exchanged looks, however markedly significant, escape his observation. Even if he did observe, he could not read in them aught relating to love. For this day there is not. The thoughts of both are absorbed by a different passion, cupidity. They are bent upon a scheme of no common magnitude, but grand and comprehensive, neither more nor less than to get possession of an estate worth ten thousand pounds a year, that Langoran. They know its value as well as the steward who gives receipts for its rents. It is no new notion with them, but one for some time entertained, and steps considered. Still nothing definite either conceived or determined on. A task so Herculean as dangerous and difficult will need care in its conception, and time for its execution. True, it might be accomplished almost instantaneously with six inches of steel, or as many drops of belladonna. Nor would two of the three seated at the table stick at employing such means. Olympe Renault and Grégoire Rogier have entertained thoughts of them, if not more. In the third is the obstructor. Lewin Murdoch would cheat at Dyson cards, do money-lenders without remorse, and tradesmen without mercy, I steal if occasion offered. But murder, that is different, being a crime not only unpleasant to contemplate, but perilous to commit. He would be willing to rob Gwendolyn Wynne of her property, glad to do it, if he only knew how, but to take away her life he is not yet up to that. But he is drawing up to it urged by desperate circumstances, and spurred on by his wife, who loses no opportunity of bewailing their broken fortunes, and reproaching him for them, at her back the Jesuit secretly instructing and dictating. Not till this day have they found him in the mood for being made more familiar with their design. Whatever his own disposition, his ear has been hitherto deaf to their hints, timidly and ambiguously given. But today things appear more promising, as evinced by his angry exclamation, NEVER! Hence their delight at hearing it. During the earlier stages of the dinner, as already said, they converse about ordinary subjects, like the lovers in the pavilion, silent upon that paramount in their minds. How different the themes, as love itself from murder! And just as the first word was unspoken in the summer-house at Langoran, so is the last unheard in the dining-room of Glingog. While the blotcher is being carved with a spoon, there is no fish slice among the chattels of Mr. Murdoch, the priest, in good appetite and high glee, pronounces it crimp. He speaks English like a native, and is even up in its provincialisms, few in Herefordshire whose dialect is of the purest. The phrase of the fishmonger received smilingly, the salmon is distributed and handed across the table. The attendants of the slavey, with claws not over clean, and ears that might be unpleasantly sharp, having been dispensed with. There is wine without stint, for although Murdoch's town tradesman may be hard of heart, in the Welsh harp there is a tender string he can still play upon, the Boniface of the Rugs Ferry hostelry having a belief in his post-obit expectations. Not such an indifferent wine, either, but some of the choicest vintage. The guests of the harp, however rough in external appearance and rude in behaviour, have wonderfully refined ideas about drink, and may be often heard calling for fizz, some of them as well acquainted with the qualities of Moet and Clicquot as a connoisseur of the most fashionable club. Profiting by their aesthetic tastes, Lewin Murdoch is enabled to set wine upon his table of the choicest brands. Light Bordeaux first with the fish, then sherry with the heavier greens and bacon, followed by champagne as they get engaged upon the pheasant. At this point the conversation approaches a topic, hitherto held in reserve, Murdoch himself starting it. So, my cousin Gwen's going to get married, eh? Are you sure of that, Father Rogier? I wish I were as sure of going to heaven. But what sort of man is he? You haven't told us. Yes, I have. 
You forget my description, monsieur. Cross between Mars and Phoebus, strength Herculean, sure to be father to a progeny numerous as that which spring from the head of Medusa, enough of them to make heirs for Langoran to the end of time. Keep you out of the property if you live to be the age of Methuselah. Ah, fine-looking fellow, I can assure you, against whom the baronet's son, with his rubicon cheeks and hay-coloured hair, wouldn't stand the slightest chance, even if there were nothing more to recommend the martial stranger. But there is. What more? The mode of his introduction to the lady. That quite romantic. How was he introduced? Well, he made her acquaintance on the water. It appears Mademoiselle Wynne and her companion Lise were out on the river for a row alone. Unusual, that. Thus out, some fellows, Forest of Dean dwellers, offered them insult, from which a gentleman angler, who chanced to be whipping the stream close by, saved them. He no other than Le Capitaine Rycroft. With such commencement of acquaintance, a man couldn't be much worth who didn't know how to improve it even to terminating in a marriage if he wished. And with such a rich heiress as Mademoiselle Gwendolyn Wynne, to say naught of her personal charms, there are few men who wouldn't wish it so to end. That he, the hussar officer, captain, colonel, or whatever his rank, does, I've good reason to believe, as also that he will succeed in accomplishing his desires. No more doubt of it than of my being seated at this table. Yes, Sure as I sit here, that man will be the master of Langoran. I suppose he will. Must, rejoins Murdoch, drawing out the words as though not greatly concerned one way or the other. Olymp looks dissatisfied, but not Rogier, nor she, after a glance from the priest, which seems to say, wait. He himself intends waiting till the drink has done its work. Taking the hint, she remains silent her countenance showing calm, as with the content of innocence, while in her heart is the guilt of hell and the deceit of the devil. She preserves her composure all through, and soon as the last course is ended, with a show of dessert placed upon the table, poor and pro forma, obedient to a look from Rogier, with a slight nod in the direction of the door, she makes her congé and retires. Murdoch lights his meerschaum, the priest one of his paper cigarettes, of which he carries a case, and for some time they sit smoking and drinking, talking too, but upon matters with no relation to that uppermost in their minds. They seem to fear touching it, as though it were a thing to contaminate. It is only after repeatedly emptying their glasses, their courage comes up to the standard required, that of the Frenchman first, who nevertheless approaches the delicate subject with cautious circumlocution. "'By the way, monsieur,' he says, "'we've forgotten what we were conversing about when summoned to dinner, "'a meal I've greatly enjoyed, "'notwithstanding your depreciation of the menu. "'Indeed, a very bon bouche, your English bacon, "'and the greens excellent, and also the pomme de terre. "'You were speaking of some event or circumstance "'to be conditional on your death. "'What is it? Not the deluge, I hope. "'True, your wise subject to sudden floods. "'Might it have aught to do with them? "'Why should it?' asks Murdoch, not comprehending the drift. Because people sometimes get drowned in these inundations, indeed often. Scarce a week passes without someone falling into the river, and there remaining, at least till life is extinct. What with its whirls and rapids, it's a very dangerous stream. I wonder at Mademoiselle Wynne venturing so courageously, so carelessly, upon it. The peculiar intonation of the last speech, with emphasis on the word carelessly, gives Murdoch a glimpse of what it is intended to point to. "'She's got courage enough,' he rejoins, without appearing to comprehend. "'About her carelessness, I don't know.' "'But the young lady certainly is careless, recklessly so. That affair of her going out alone is proof of it. What followed may make her more cautious. Still, Boating is a perilous occupation, and boats, whether for pleasure or otherwise, are awkward things to manage, fickle and capricious as women themselves. Suppose hers should some day go to the bottom, she being in it. Well, that would be bad. Of course it would. Though, Monsieur Murdoch, many men situated as you 
instead of grieving over such an accident, would but rejoice at it. No doubt they would. But what's the use of talking of a thing not likely to happen? Oh, true! Still, boat accidents being of such common occurrence, one is as likely to befall Mademoiselle Wynne as anybody else. A pity if it should. A misfortune. But so is the other thing. What other thing? that such a property as Langoran should be in the hands of heretics, having but a lame title too. If what I have heard is true, you yourself have as much right to it as your cousin. It were better it belonged to a true son of the church, as I know you to be, monsieur." Murdoch receives the compliment with a grimace. He is no hypocrite. Still with all his depravity, he has a sort of respect for religion, or rather its outward forms regularly attends Rogier's chapel, and goes through all the ceremonies and genuflections, just as the Italian bandit, after cutting a throat, will drop on his knees and repeat a paternoster, and hearing the distant bell of the Angelus. "'A very poor one,' he replies, with a half-smile, half-grin. "'In a worldly sense, you mean? I am aware you are not very rich. In more senses than that, your reverence—' I have been a great sinner, I admit. Admission is a good sign, giving promise of repentance, which need never come too late, if a man be disposed to it. It is a deep sin the Church cannot condone, a dark crime indeed. Oh, I haven't done anything deserving the name, only such as a great many others. But you might be tempted some day. Whether or not, it's my duty as your spiritual adviser to point out the true doctrine how the Vatican views such things. It's, after all, only a question of balance between good and evil, that is, how much evil a man may have done, and the amount of good he may do. This world is a ceaseless war between God and the devil, and those who wage it in the cause of the former have often to employ the weapons of the latter. In our service the end justifies the means, even though these be what the world calls criminal. I even to the taking of life, else why should the great and good Loyola have counselled drawing the sword, himself using it? True, grunts Murdoch, smoking hard. You are a great theologian, Father Rogier. I confess ignorance in such matters. Still, I see reason in what you say. You may see it clearer if I set the application before you. As, for instance, if a man have the right to a certain property, or estate, and is kept out of it by a quibble, any steps he might take to possess himself would be justifiable, providing he devote a portion of his gains to the good cause, that is, upholding the true faith, and so benefiting humanity at large. Such an act is held by the best of our church authorities to compensate for any sin committed, supposing the money donation sufficient to make the amount of good it may do preponderate over the evil, and such a man would not only merit absolution, but freely receive it. Now, monsieur, do you comprehend me? Quite, says Murdoch, taking the pipe from his mouth, and gulping down a half-tumbler of brandy, for he has dropped the wine. With all, he trembles at the programme thus metaphorically put before him, and fears admitting the application to himself. Soon the more potent spirit takes away his last remnant of timidity, which the tempter perceiving says, You say you have sinned, monsieur, and if it were only for that you ought to make amends. In what way could I? The way I have been speaking of. Bestow upon the church the means of doing good, and so deserve indulgence. Ah! Where am I to find this means? On the other side of the river. You forget that there's more than the stream between. Not much to a man who would be true to himself. I am that man all over. The brandy had made him bold, at length untying his tongue while unsteadying it. Yes, Père Rogier, I am ready for anything that will release me from this damnable fix, debt over the years, duns every day. Ha! I'd be true to myself, never fear. It needs being true to the Church as well. I'm willing to be that when I have the chance, if ever I have it. And to get it, I'd risk life. Not much if I lose it. It's become a burden to me, heavier than I can bear. 
you may make it as light as a feather, monsieur, cheerful as that of any of those gay gentry you saw disporting themselves on the lawn at Langoran, even that of its young mistress. How, pair? By yourself becoming its master. Ah, if I could! You can! With safety? Perfect safety. And without committing? He fears to speak the ugly English word, but expresses the idea in French. Set dernier coup? Certainly. Who dreams of that? Not I, monsieur. But how is it to be avoided? Easily. Tell me, Father Rogier. Not to-night, Murdoch. He has dropped the distant monsieur. Not to-night. It's a matter that calls for reflections, consideration, calm and careful. Time, too. Ten thousand livres esterly per annum. We must both ponder upon it, sleep nights and think days over it, possibly have to draw Coracle Dick into our deliberations. But not to-night. Par Dieu, it's ten o'clock, and I have business to do before going to bed. I must be off. No, your reverence, not till you had another glass of wine. One more, then. But let me take it standing. The tastis strop, as you call it. Murdoch assents, and the two rise up to drink the stirrup cup. But only the Frenchman keeps his feet till the glasses are emptied, the other, now dead drunk, dropping back into his chair. Bonsoir, monsieur, says the priest, slipping out of the room, his host answering only by a snore. For all, Father Rogier does not leave the house so unceremoniously. In the porch outside he takes more formal leave of a woman he there finds waiting for him. As he joins her going out, she asks, sotto voce, C'est arrangé? Pas encore serai tout de suite. This is the sole speech that passes between them, but something besides which, if seen by her husband, would cause him to start from his chair. Perhaps some little sober him. End of Volume 1, Chapter 15《ヴォリューム1 Chapter 16 of Gwen Wen。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chieko。Gwen Wen, A Romance of the Y by Maine Reed。Chapter 16 《Coracle Dick。A traveller making the tour of the Y will now and then see moving along its banks or across the contiguous meadows what he might take for a gigantic tortoise walking upon its tail mystified by a sight so abnormal and drawing nigh to get an explanation of it he will discover that the moving object is after all but a man carrying a boat upon his back still the tourist will be astonished at a feat so herculean rival to that of atlas and will only be altogether enlightened when the boat-bearer lays down his burden which if asked he will obligingly do and permits him the stranger to satisfy his curiosity by an inspection of it set square on the sward at his feet he will look upon a craft quaint as was ever launched on lake stream or tidal wave for he will be looking at a coracle not only quaint in construction but singularly ingenious in design considering the ends to be accomplished in addition historically interesting so much as to deserve more than passing notice even in the pages of a novel nor will i dismiss it without a word however it may seem out of place in shape the coracle bears resemblance to the half of a humming top or swedish turnip cloven longitudinally the cleft face scooped out leaving but the rind the timbers consist of slender saplings peeled and split to obtain lightness disposed some fore and aft others athwart ships still others diagonally as struts and ties all having their ends in a band of wicker work which runs around the gunwale holding them firmly in place itself forming the rail over this framework is stretched a covering of tarred and of course waterproof canvas tight as a drum in olden times it was the skin of ox or horse but the modern material is better because lighter and less liable to decay besides being cheaper there is but one seat or thwart as the coracle is designed for only a single occupant though in a pinch it can accommodate two 
this is a thin board placed nearly amidships partly supported by the wicker rail and in part by another piece of light scantling set edgeways underneath in all things ponderosity is as much as possible avoided since one of the essential purposes of the coracle is portage and to facilitate this it is furnished with a leathern strap the ends attached near each extremity of the thwart to be passed across the breast when the boat is borne overland the bearer then uses his oar there is but one a broad-bladed paddle by way of walking-stick and so proceeds as already said like a tortoise travelling on its tail in this convenience of carriage lies the ingenuity of the structure unique and clever beyond anything in the way of watercraft i have observed elsewhere either among savage or civilized nations the only thing approaching it in this respect is the birch bark canoe of the eskimo and chippewa indians but though more beautiful this it is far behind our native craft in an economic sense in cheapness and readiness for while the chippewaian would be stripping his bark from the tree and rearming it to say not of fitting to the frame timbers stitching and paying it a subject of king caradoc would have launched his coracle upon the wye and paddled it from plinlimon to chepstow as many a modern welshman would the same above all is the coracle of rare historic interest as the first venture upon water of a people the ancestors of a nation that now rules the sea their descendants proudly styling themselves its lords not without right and reason why called coracle is a matter of doubt and dispute by most admitted as a derivative from the latin corum a skin this being its original covering but certainly a misconception since we have historic evidence of the basket and hide boat being in use around the shores of albion hundreds of years before these ever saw roman ship or standard besides at the same early period under the almost homonym of corag it floated still floats on the waters of the lern far west of anywhere the romans ever went among the common people on the wye it bears a less ancient appellation that of truckle from whatever source the craft derives its name it has itself given a sobriquet to one of the characters of our tale richard dempsey why the poacher is thus distinguished is not easy to tell possibly because he more than any other in his neighbourhood makes use of it and is often seen trudging about the river bottoms with a huge carapace on his shoulders it serves his purpose better than any other kind of boat for dick though a snare of hares and pheasants is more of a salmon poacher and for this the water branch of his amphibious calling the coracle has a special adaptation it can be lifted out of the river or launched upon it anywhere without leaving trace whereas with an ordinary skiff the moorings might be marked the embarkation observed and the night netter followed to his netting place by the watchful water bailiff despite his cunning and the handiness of his craft dick has not always come off scot-free his name has several times figured in the reports of quarter sessions and himself in the cells of the county jail this only for poaching but he has also served a spell in prison for a crime of a less venal kind burglary as the job was done in a distant shire there has been nothing heard of it in that where he now resides the worst known of him in the neighbourhood is his game and fish trespassing though there is worse suspected he whose suspicions are strongest being the waterman wingate but jack may be wronging him for a certain reason the most powerful that ever swayed the passion or warped the judgment of man rivalry for the affections of a woman no heart however hardened is proof against the shafts of cupid and one has penetrated the heart of coracle dick as deeply as has another that of jack wingate and both from the same bow and quiver the eyes of mary morgan she is the daughter of a small farmer who lives by the wise side and being a farmer's daughter above both in social rank still not so high but that love's ladder may reach her and each lives in hope he may some day scale it for evan morgan holds as a tenant and his land is of limited acreage dick dempsey and jack wingate are not the only ones who wish to have him for a father-in-law but the two most earnest and whose chances seem best not that these are at all equal on the contrary greatly disproportionate dick having the advantage in his favour is the fact that farmer morgan is a roman catholic his wife fanatically so he dempsey professing the same faith while wingate is a protestant of pronounced type 
under these circumstances coracle has a friend at headquarters in mrs morgan and an advocate who visits there in the person of father roger with this united influence in his favour the odds against the young waterman are great and his chances might appear slight indeed would be were it not for an influence to counteract he too has a partisan inside the citadel and a powerful one since it is the girl herself he knows is sure of it as man may be of any truth communicated to him by loving lips amid showers of kisses for all this has passed between mary morgan and himself and nothing of it between her and richard dempsey instead on her part coldness and distant reserve it would be disdain i scorn if she dares show it for she hates the very sight of the man but controlled and close watched she has learnt to smile when she would frown the world or that narrow circle of it immediately surrounding and acquainted with the morgan family wonders at the favourable reception it vouchsafes to richard dempsey a known and noted poacher but in justice to mrs morgan it should be said she has but slight acquaintance with the character of the man only knows it as represented by rogier absorbed in her paternosters she gives little heed to aught else her thoughts as her actions being all of the dictation and under the direction of the priest in her eyes coracle dick is as the latter has painted him thus a worthy fellow poor it is true but honest withal a little addicted to fish and game-taking as many another good man who wouldn't with such laws unrighteous oppressive to the poor were they otherwise the poacher would be a patriot as for dempsey they who speak ill of him are only the envious envying his good looks and fine mental qualities for he's clever and they can't say nay energetic and likely to make his way in the world yet one thing he would make that's a good husband to your daughter mary one who has the strength and courage to take care of her so counsels the priest and as he can make mrs morgan believe black white she is ready to comply with his counsel if the result rested on her coracle dick would have nothing to fear but it does not he knows it does not and it is troubled with all the influence in his favour he fears that other influence against him if against him far more than a counterpoise to mrs morgan's religious predilections or the partisanship of his priest still he is not sure one day the slave of sweet confidence the next a prey to black bitter jealousy and thus he goes on doting and doubting as if he were never to know the truth a day comes when he is made acquainted with or rather a night for it is after sundown the revelation reaches him indeed nigh on to midnight his favoured yet defeated aspirations are more than twelve months old they have been active all through the preceding winter spring and summer it is now autumn the leaves are beginning to turn sere and the last sheaves have been gathered to the stack no shire than that of hereford more addicted to the joys of the harvest home this often celebrated in a public and general way instead of at the private and particular farmhouse one such is given upon the summit of garran hill a grand gathering to which all go of the class who attend such assemblages small farmers with their families their servants too male and female there is a crumb look on the hill's top around which they annually congregate and beside this ancient relic are set up the symbols of a more modern time the maypole though it is autumn with its strings and garlands the show booths and the refreshment tents with their display of cakes fruits perry and cider and there are sports of various kinds pitching the stone climbing the greased pole that of may now so slippery jumping racing in sacks dancing among other dances the morris with a grand finale of fireworks at this year's fete farmer morgan is present accompanied by his wife and daughter it need not be said that dick dempsey and jack wingate are there too they are and have been all the afternoon ever since the gathering began but during the hours of daylight neither approaches the fair creature to which his thoughts tend and on which his eyes are almost constantly turning the poacher is restrained by a sense of his own unworthiness a knowledge that there is not the place to make show of his aspirations to one all believes so much above him while the waterman is kept back and aloof by the presence of the watchful mother with all her watchfulness he finds opportunity to exchange speech with the daughter only a few words but enough to make hell in the heart of dick dempsey who overhears them it is at the closing scene of the spectacle when pyrotechnists are about to send up their final feu de joie 
mrs morgan treated by numerous acquaintances to aniseed and other toothsome drinks has grown less thoughtful of her charge which gives jack wingate the opportunity he has all along been looking for sidling up to the girl he asks in a tone which tells of lovers and rapport mutually and mistakably when mary saturday night next the priest's coming to supper i'll make an errand to the shop soon as it gets dark where the old place under the big elm you're sure you'll be able sure never fear i'll find a way god bless you dear girl i'll be there if anywhere on earth this is all that passes between them but enough more than enough for richard dempsey as a rocket just then going up throws its glare over his face as also the others no greater contrast could be seen or imagined on the countenances of the lovers an expression of contentment sweet and serene on his a look such as mephistopheles gave to gretchen escaping from his toils the curse in coracle's heart is but hindered from rising to his lips by a fear of its foiling the vengeance he there and then determines on End of chapter 16volume one chapter seventeen of gwen wynne this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org gwen wynne a romance of the why by main reed chapter seventeen the corpse candle jack wingate lives in a little cottage whose bit of garden ground brinks the country road where the latter trends close to the wye at one of its sharpest sinuosities the cottage is on the convex side of the bend having the river at back with a deep drain or wash running up almost to its walls and forming a fence to one side of the garden this gives the waterman another and more needed advantage a convenient docking place for his boat there the mary moored swings at her painter in safety and when a rise in the river threatens he is at hand to see she is not swept off to guard against such catastrophe he will start up from his bed at any hour of the night having more than one reason to be careful of the boat for besides being his gagney pain it hears the name by himself given of her the thought of whom sweetens his toil and makes his labour light for her he bends industriously to his oar as though he believed every stroke made and every boat's length gained was bringing him nearer to mary morgan and in a sense so is it whichever way the boat's head may be turned the farther he rows her the grander grows that heap of gold he is hoarding up against the day when he hopes to become a benedict he has a belief that if he could but display before the eyes of farmer morgan sufficient money to take a little farm for himself and stock it he might then remove all obstacles between him and mary mother's objections and sinister and sacerdotal influence included he is aware of the difference of rank that social chasm between being oft bitterly reminded of it but emboldened by mary's smiles he has little fear but that he will yet be able to bridge it favouring the programme thus traced out there is fortunately no great strain on his resources by way of drawback only the maintaining of his own mother a frugal dame thrifty besides who instead of adding to the current expenses rather curtails them by the adroit handling of her needle it would have been a distaff in the olden days thus helped in his housekeeping the young waterman is enabled to put away almost every shilling he earns by his oar and this same summer all through till autumn which it now is has been more than usually profitable to him by reason of his so often having captain ryecroft as his fare for although the hussar officer no longer goes salmon fishing he has somehow been spoilt for that there are other excursions upon which he requires the boat and it ever generously even lavishly pays for it from one of these the young waterman has but returned and after carefully bestowing the mary at her moorings stepped inside the cottage it is saturday within one hour of sundown that same saturday spoken of at the harvest home but though jack is just home he shows no sign of an intention to stay there instead behaves as if he intended going out again though not in his boat and he does so intend for a purpose unsuspected by his mother to keep that appointment made hurriedly and in a half whisper 
amid the fracas of the fireworks. The good dame had already set the table for tea, ready against his arrival, covered it with a cloth, snow white of course, the tea things superimposed, in addition, a dining plate, knife and fork, these for a succulent beefsteak heard hissing on the gridiron almost as soon as the Mary made appearance at the mouth of the wash, and soon as the boat was docked, done. It is now on the table alongside the teapot, its savoury odour mingling with the fragrance of the freshly drawn tea, fills the cottage kitchen with a perfume to delight the gods. For all, it gives no gratification to Jack Wingate the waterman. The appetising smell of the meat and the more ethereal aroma of the Chinese shrub are alike lost upon him. Appetite he has none, and his thoughts are elsewhere. Less from observing his abstraction than the slow, negligent movements of his knife and fork, the mother asks, "'What's the matter with you, Jack? You don't eat.' "'I ain't hungry, mother. But you've been out since morning and took nothing with you.' true but you forget who i have been out with the captain ain't the man to let his boatman be a hungered we wore down the day far as simmons yacht where he treated me to dinner at the hotel the daintiest kind of dinner too no wonder at my not having much care for eating now nice as you've made things mother notwithstanding the compliment the old lady is little satisfied less as she observes the continued abstraction of his manner he fidgets uneasily in his chair, every now and then giving a glance at the little Dutch clock suspended against the wall, which in loud ticking seems to say, You'll be late, you'll be late. She suspects something of the cause, but inquires nothing of it. Instead she but observes, speaking of the patron, He be very good to ye, Jack. Ah, that he be, good to every one as comes nigher him, and deservin it. But ain't he stayin' in the neighbourhood longer than he first spoke of doin'? Maybe he is. Grand gentry such as he ain't like us poor folk. They can go and come when's ever it please em. I suppose he have his reasons for remaining. Now, Jack, you know he have, and I have heard something about em myself. What have you heard, mother? Oh, what? You hadn't been a rowing him up and down the river now nigh on five months without finding out. And if you haven't, others have. It's going all about that he's after a young lady as lives somewhere below. Tidy girl, they say, though I never seed her myself. Is it so, my son? Say. Well, mother, since you've put it straight at me in that way, I won't deny it to you, though I'm in a manner bound to sacrecy with others. It be true that the captain have some notion of such a lady. There be a story, too, of her being nigh drowned and his saving her out of a boat. Now, Jack, whose boat could that be if it weren't yourn? Twar mine, mother, that's true enough. I would have told you long ago, but he asked me not to talk of the thing. Besides, I didn't suppose you'd care to hear about it. Well, she says, satisfied, tain't much to me, nor you neither, Jack. Only as the captain being so kind, we'd both like to know the best about him. If he have took a fancy for the young lady, I hope she return it. She ought after his doing what he did for her. I hadn't heard her name. What be it? She's a Miss Wynne, mother, a very rich heiress. Deed, I believe she ain't a heiress any longer, or won't be after next Thursday, since that day she comes a age, and that night there's to be a big party at her place, dancing and all sorts of festivities. I know it because the captain's going there and has bespoke the boat to take him. Win, eh? That be a Welsh name. Wonder if she's any kin of the great Sir Watkin. Can't say, mother. I believe there be several branches of the Win family. Yes, and all of the good sort. If she be one of the Welsh winds, the captain can't go far astray in having her for his wife. Mrs. Wingate is herself of Quimic ancestry, originally from the shire of Pembroke, but married to a man of Montgomery, where Jack was born. It is only of late, in her widowhood, she has become a resident of Herefordshire. So you think he have a notion of her, Jack? More than that, mother, I may as well tell you, he be dead in love with her. And if you seed the young lady herself, you wouldn't wonder at it. She be most as good-looking as... Jack suddenly interrupted himself on the edge of a revelation he would rather not make to his mother nor anyone else, for he has hitherto been as careful in keeping his own secret as that of his patron. As who, she asks, looking him straight in the face and with an expression in her eyes of no common interest, that of maternal solicitude. Who? Well... He answers confusedly, I were going to mention the name o' a girl who the people about here think the best looking at any in the neighbourhood. 
and nobody more in yourself my son you needn't give her name i know it oh mother what do you mean he stammers out with eyes on the but half-eaten beefsteak i take it they've been telling you some stories about me no they han't nobody said a word about you relating to that i've seen it for myself long since though you've tried to hide it i'm not going to blame you either for i believe she be a tidy proper girl but she's far aboon you my son and you mourn mind how you behave yourself if the young lady be anything like as good-looking as mary morgan yes mother that's the strangest thing at all he interrupts her speaking excitedly again interrupting himself what strangest she inquires with a look of wonderment never mind mother i'll tell you all about it some other time i can't now you see it's nine nine of the clock well and what if it be because i may be too late too late for what surely you aren't going out again the night she asks this seeing him rise up from his chair i must mother but why well the boat painters got frailed and i want a bit of whipcord to lap it with they have the thing at the ferry shop and i must get there afore they shut up a fib perhaps pardonable as the thing he designs lapping is not his boat's painter but the waist of mary morgan and not with slender whipcord but his own stout arms why won't it do in the morning asked the ill-satisfied mother well you see there's no knowing but that somebody may come after the boat the cap'n mayn't but he may changing his mind anyhow he'll want her to go down to them grand doings at langowan court langowan court yes that's where the young lady lives that's to be on thursday you said true but then there may come a fair the morrow and what if there do tain't the painter only as wants splicing there's a bit of a leak sprung close to the cup water and i must have some pitch to pay it if jack's mother would only step out and down to the ditch where the mary is moored with a look at the boat she would make him out a liar its painter is smooth and clean as a piece of gimp not a strand unravelled while but two or three gallons of bilge water at the boat's bottom attest to there being little or no leakage but she good dame is not thus suspicious instead so reliant on her son's truthfulness that without questioning further she consents to his going only with a proviso against his staying thus appealingly put you won't be gone long my son i know you won't indeed i shan't mother but why be you so particular about my going out this night more than any other because jack this day more than most others i've been feelin' bothered like and a bit frightened frightened o' what there hadn't been nobody to the house has there no ne'er a rover since you left me in the mornin'. then what's been a scarin' you mother deed i don't know unless it had been brought on by the dream i had last night twere a dreadful unpleasant one i didn't tell you i before you went out thinking it might worry ye tell me now mother it hadn't naught to do with us ourselves after all only concerning them as live nearest us ha the morgans yes the morgans oh mother what did you dream about them that i was standing on the big hill above their house in the middle of the night with black darkness all round me and there looking down what should i see coming out of their door what the canwill corf the canwill corf yes my son i seed it that is i dreamed i seed it coming just out of the farmhouse door then through the yard and over the footplank at the bottom of the orchard when it went flaring up the meadows straight towards the ferry though you can't see that from the hill i dreamed i did and seed the candle go out on the chapel and into the burying ground that woke me what nonsense mother a ridiculous superstition i thought you'd left all that sort of stuff behind in the mountains of montgomery or pembrokeshire where the thing comes from as i've heard you say no my son it's not stuff nor superstition neither though english people say that to put slur upon us welsh your father before you believed in the camwell corf and with more reason ought i your mother i never told you jack but the night before your father died i seed it go past our own door and on to the graveyard of the church where he now lies sure as we stand here there be some one doomed in the house at evan morgan there be only three in the family i do hope it ain't her as you might some day be wantin' me to call daughter mother you'll drive me mad i tell you it's all nonsense mary morgan be at this moment healthy and strong most as much as myself if the dead candle you've been dreaming about were all of it true it couldn't be a burnin for her more like for mrs morgan who's half daft by believing in church candles and such things 
enough to turn her crazy if it doesn't kill her outright. As for you, my dear mother, don't let the dream bother you the least bit, and you mustn't be feeling lonely as I shan't be long gone. I'll be back by ten, sure. Saying which, he sets his straw hat jauntily on his thick curly hair, gives his guernsey a straightening twitch, and with a last cheering look and encouraging word to his mother, steps out into the night. Left alone, she feels lonely withal, and more than ever afraid. Instead of sitting down to her needle, or making to remove the tea things, she goes to the door, and there stays, standing on its threshold and peering into the darkness, for it is a pitch-dark night. She sees, or fancies, a light moving across the meadows as if it came from Farmer Morgan's house, and going in the direction of Rugg's Ferry. While she continues gazing, it twice crosses the Y by reason of the river's bend. As no mortal hand could thus carry it, surely it is the Canwell Corf. End of chapter 17 Volume 1, Chapter 18 of Gwen Wynne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gwen Wynne, A Romance of the Why by Main Reed. Chapter 18, A Cat in the Cupboard. Evan Morgan is a tenant farmer holding Abagan. By Herefordshire custom, every farm or its stead has a distinctive appellation. Like the land belonging to Glingog, that of Abergann lies against the sides of a sloping glen, one of the hundreds or thousands of lateral ravines that run into the valley of the Wye. But unlike the old manor house, the domicile of the farmer is at the glen's bottom and near the river's bank, nearer yet to a small influent stream rapid and brawling which sweeps past the lower end of the orchard in a channel worn deep into the soft sandstone. Though with the usual imposing array of enclosure walls, the dwelling itself is not large nor the outbuildings extensive, for the arable acreage is limited. This because the ridges around are too high pitched for ploughing, and if ploughed would be unproductive. They are not even in pasture, but overgrown with woods, less for the sake of the timber which is only scrub, than as a covert for foxes. They are held in hand by Evan Morgan's landlord, a noted Nimrod. For the same reason the farmhouse stands in a solitary spot remote from any other dwelling. The nearest is the cottage of the Wingates, distant about half a mile but neither visible from the other. Nor is there any direct road between, only a footpath, which crosses the brook at the bottom of the orchard, thence running over a wooded ridge to the main highway. The last, after passing close to the cottage, as already said, is deflected away from the river by this same ridge, so that when Evan Morgan would drive anywhere beyond the boundaries of his farm, he must pass out through a long lane, so narrow that were he to meet anyone driving in, there would be a deadlock. However, there is no danger, as the only vehicles having occasion to use this thoroughfare are his own farm wagon and a lighted trap in which he goes to market and occasionally with his wife and daughter to merry-makings. When the three are in it there is none of his family at home, for he has but one child, a daughter. Nor would he long have her were a half-score of young fellows allowed their way. At least this number would be willing to take her off his hands and give her a home elsewhere. Remote as is the farmhouse of Abigan and narrow the lane leading to it, there are many who would be glad to visit there if invited. In truth, a fine girl is Mary Morgan, tall, bright-haired, and with blooming cheeks, beside which red rose leaves would seem fade. Living in a town, she would be its talk. In a village, its bell. Even from that secluded glen has the fame of her beauty gone forth and afar. Of husbands she could have her choice, and among men much richer than her father. In her heart she has chosen one, not only much poorer, but lower in social rank, Jack Wingate. She loves the young waterman and wants to be his wife, but no, she cannot without the consent of her parents. Not that either has signified opposition, since they have never been asked. Her longings in that direction she has kept secret from them, nor does she so much dread refusal by the father. Evan Morgan had been himself poor, began life as a farm labourer, and though now an employer of such, his pride had not kept pace with his prosperity. Instead, he is, as ever, the same modest, unpresuming man of which the lower middle classes of the English people present many noble examples. 
from him jack wingate would have little to fear on the score of poverty he is well acquainted with the young waterman's character knows it to be good and has observed the efforts he is making to better his condition in life it may be with suspicion of the motive at all events admiringly remembering his own and although a roman catholic he is anything but bigoted were he the only one to be consulted his daughter might wed with the man upon whom she has fixed her affections at any time it pleases them ay at any place too even within the walls of a protestant church by him neither would jack wingate be rejected on the score of religion very different with his wife of all the worshippers who compose the congregation at the bugs ferry chapel none bend the knee to baal as low as she and over no one does father rogerer exercise such influence baneful it is like to be since not only has he control of the mother's conduct but through that may also blight the happiness of the daughter apart from religious fanaticism mrs morgan is not a bad woman only a weak one as her husband she is of humble birth and small beginnings like him too neither has prosperity affected her in the sense of worldly ambition perhaps better if it had instead of spoiling a little social pride might have been a bar to the dangerous aspirations of richard dempsey even with the priest standing sponsor for him but she has none her whole soul being absorbed by blind devotion to a faith which scruples not at anything that may assist in its propagandism it is the saturday succeeding the festival of the harvest home a little after sunset and the priest is expected at abergan he is a frequent visitor there by mrs morgan ever made welcome and treated to the best cheer the farmhouse can afford plate knife and fork always placed for him and to do him justice he may be deemed in a way worthy of such hospitality for he is in truth a most entertaining personage can converse on any subject and suit his conversation to the company whether high or low as much at home with the wife of the welsh farmer as with the french ex cocotte and equally so in the companionship of dick dempsey the poacher in his hours of far nient all are alike to him this night he is to take supper at abergan and mrs morgan seated in the farmhouse parlour awaits his arrival a snug little apartment tastefully furnished but with a certain air of austerity observable in roman catholic houses this by reason of some pictures of saints hanging against the walls an image of the virgin and standing niche-like in a corner one of the crucifixion over the mantel shelf with crosses upon books and other like symbols it is near nine o'clock and the table is already set out on grand occasions as this the farmhouse parlour is transformed into dining or supper room indifferently the meal intended to be eaten now is more of the former differing in there being a tea tray upon the table with a full service of cups and saucers as also in the lateness of the hour but the odiferous steam escaping from the kitchen drifted into the parlour when its door is opened tells of something in preparation more substantial than a cup of tea with its usual accompaniment of bread and butter and there is a fat capon roasting upon the spit with a frying pan full of sausages on the dresser ready to be clapped upon the fire at the proper moment as soon as the expected guest makes his appearance and in addition to the tea things there is a decanter of sherry on the table and will be another of brandy when brought on father rogerer's favourite tipple as mrs morgan has reason to know there is a full bottle of this cognac of best brand in the larder cupboard still corked as it came from the welsh harp where it cost six shillings the rugs ferry hostelry as already intimated dealing in drinks of a rather costly kind mary has been directed to draw the cork decant and bring the brandy in and for this purpose has just gone off to the larder thence instantly returning but without either decanter or cognac instead with a tale which sends a thrill of consternation through her mother's heart the cat has been in the cupboard and there made havoc upset the brandy bottle and sent it rolling off the shelf on the stone flags of the floor broken of course and the contents no need for further explanation mrs morgan does not seek it nor does she stay to reflect on the disaster but how it may be remedied it will not mend matters to chastise the cat nor cry over the spilt brandy any more than if it were milk on short reflection she sees but one way to restore the broken bottle by sending to the welsh harp for a whole one true it will cost another six shillings but she recks not of the expense she is more troubled about a messenger 
where and how is one to be had the farm labourers have long since left they are all benedicts on board wages and have departed for their respective wives and homes there is a cowboy, yet he is also absent, gone to fetch the kind from a far-off pasturing place and not be back in time, while the one female domestic maid of all work is busy in the kitchen up to her ears among pots and pans, her face at a red heat over the range. She could not possibly be spared. It's very vexatious, exclaims Mrs. Morgan in a state of lively perplexity. It is indeed, assents her daughter. A truthful girl, Mary in the main, but just now the opposite, for she is not vexed by the occurrence, nor does she deem it a disaster, quite the contrary, and she knows it was no accident, having herself brought it about. It was her own soft fingers, not the cat's claws, that swept that bottle from the shelf, sending it smash upon the stones, tipped over by no maladroit handling of corkscrew, but downright deliberate intention, a stratagem that may enable her to keep the appointment made among the fireworks, that threat when she told Jack Wingate she would find a way. Thus is she finding it, and in furtherance she leaves her mother no time to consider longer about a messenger. I'll go, she says, offering herself as one. The deceit unsuspected and only the willingness appreciated, Mrs. Morgan rejoins. Do, that's a dear girl. It's very good of you, Mary. Here's the money. While the delighted mother is counting out the shillings, the dutiful daughter whips on her cloak, the night is chilly, and adjusts her hat, the best holiday one, on her head, all the time thinking to herself how cleverly she has done the trick, and with a smile of pardonable deception upon her face, she trips lightly across the threshold and on through the little flower garden in front. Outside the gate, at an angle of the enclosure wall, she stops and stands considering. There are two ways to the ferry here forking the long lane and shorter footpath which is she to take the path leads down along the side of the orchard and across the brook by the bridge only a single plank this spanning the stream and originally fixed to the rock at both ends has of late come loose and is not safe to be traversed even by day at night it is dangerous still more on one dark as this and danger of no common kind at any time the channel through which the streams run is twenty feet deep, with rough boulders in its bed. One falling from above would at least get broken bones. No fear of that tonight, but something as bad, if not worse, for it has been raining throughout the earlier hours of the day, and there in the brook, now a raging torrent. One dropping into it would be swept onto the river, and there surely drowned, if not before. It is no dread of any of these dangers which causes Mary Morgan to stand considering which route she will take. She has stepped that plank on nights dark as this, even since it became detached from the fastenings and is well acquainted with its ways. Were there naught else, she would go straight over it and along the footpath which passes the big elm. But it is just because it passes the elm she has now paused and is pondering. Her errand calls for haste, and there she would meet a man sure to delay her. She intends meeting him for all that and being delayed, but not till on her way back. Considering the darkness and obstructions on the footwalk, she may go quicker by the road, though round about. Returning, she can take the path. This thought in her mind, with perhaps remembrance of the adage, business before pleasure, decides her, and drawing closer her cloak, she sets off along the lane. End of chapter 18 Volume 1, Chapter 19 of Gwen Wynn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gwen Wynn, A Romance of the Why by Main Reed. Chapter 19, A Black Shadow Behind. In the Shire of Hereford there is no such thing as a village, properly so called, the tourist expecting to come upon one by the black dot on his guide-book map will fail to find it. Indeed, he will see only a church with a congregation, not the typical cluster of houses around, but no street nor rows of cottages in their midst, the orthodox patch of trodden turf, the green, nothing of all that. Unsatisfied and inquiring the whereabouts of the village itself, he will get answers, only farther confusing him, one will say, here be it, pointing to no place in particular, a second, there, with his eye upon the church, a third, over yonner, nodding to a shop of miscellaneous wares, 
also entrusted with the receiving and distributing of letters, while a fourth, whose ideas run on drink, looks to a house larger than the rest, having a square pictorial signboard with red lion, rampant, fox, passant, horse's head, or such like symbol, proclaiming it an inn or public. Not far from or contiguous to the church will be a dwelling house of special pretension, having a carriage entrance, sweep, and shrubbery of well-grown evergreens, the rectory or vicarage at greater distance, two or three cottages of superior class by their owners styled villas, in one of which dwells the doctor, a young Esculapius, just beginning practice, or an old one who has never had much, in another the relict of a successful shopkeeper left with an independence, while a third will be occupied by a retired military man, captain, of course, whatever may have been his rank, possibly a naval officer or an old salt of the merchant service. In their proper places stand the carpenter's shop and smithy with their array of reapers, rollers, ploughs and harrows seeking repair, among them perhaps a huge steam-threshing machine that has burst its boiler or received other damage. Then there are the houses of the hoi polloi, mostly labouring men, their little cottages wide apart or in twos and threes together, with no resemblance to the formality of town dwellings, but quaint in structure, ivy-clad or honeysuckled, looking and smelling of the country. Farther along the road is an ancient farmstead, its big barns and other outbuildings abutting on the highway, which for some distance is strewn with a litter of rotting straw. By its side a muddy pond with ducks and a half-dozen geese began to giving tongue as the tourist passes by. If a pedestrian with knapsack on his shoulders, the dog barking at him, in the belief he is a tramp or beggar, such is the Herefordshire village, of which many like may be met along Wyeside. The collection of houses known as Rugs Ferry is in some respects different. It does not lie on any of the main country thoroughfares, but a cross-country road connecting the two that lead along the hounding ridges of the river. That passing through it is but little frequented, as the ferry itself is only for foot passengers, though there is a horse-boat which can be had when called for, but the place is in a deep crater-like hollow, where the stream courses between cliffs of the old red sandstone, and can only be approached by the steepest pitches. Nevertheless, Rugg's Ferry has its mark upon the ordnance map, though not with the little crosslet denoting a church. It could boast of no place of worship whatever till Father Rogier laid the foundation of his chapel. For all, it has once been a brisk place in its day of glory, ere the railroad destroyed the river traffic and the bargees made it a stopping port, as often the scene of rude, noisy revelry. It is quieter now, and the tourists passing through might deem it almost deserted. He will see houses of varied construction, thirty or forty of them in all, clinging against the cliff in successive terraces, reached by long rows of steps carved out of the rock, cottages picturesque as Swiss chalets with little gardens on ledges, here and there one trellised with grapevines or other climbers, and a round cone-top cage of wicker holding captive a jackdaw, magpie, or it may be parrot or starling taught to speak. Viewing these symbols of innocence, the stranger will imagine himself to have lighted upon a sort of English Arcadia, a fancy soon to be dissipated, perhaps, by the parrot or starling saluting him with the exclamatory phrase, "'God damn you! Go to the devil! Go to the devil!' And while he is pondering on what sort of personage could have instructed the creature in such profanity, he will likely enough see the instructor himself peering out through a partially open door, his face in startling correspondence with the blasphemous exclamations of the bird. For there are other birds resident at Ruggs Ferry besides those in the cages, several who have themselves been caged in the county jail. The slightly altered name bestowed upon the place by Jack Wingate, as others, is not so inappropriate. It may seem strange such characters congregating in a spot so primitive and rural, so unlike their customary haunts, incongruous as the ex-bell of marble in her high-heeled boutines inhabiting the ancient manor-house of Glingog, but more of an enigma, indeed a moral or psychological puzzle, since one would suppose the, the very last place to find them in, and yet the explanation may partly lie in moral and psychological causes. Even the most hardened rogue has his spells of sentiment, during which he takes delight in rusticity, and as the ferry has long enjoyed the reputation of being a place of abode for him and his sort, he is there sure of meeting company congenial, 
or the scent after him may have become too hot in the town or city where he has been displaying his dexterity while here the policeman is not a power the one constable of the district station dislikes taking and rather steals through it on his rounds notwithstanding all this there are some respectable people among its denizens and many visitors who are gentlemen its quaint picturesqueness attracts the tourists while a stretch of excellent angling ground above and below makes it a favourite with amateur fishermen centrally on a platform of level ground a little back from the river's bank stands a large three-storey house the village inn with a swing sign in front upon which is painted what resembles a triangular gridiron though designed to represent a harp from this the hostelry has its name the welsh harp but however rough the liming and weather blanched the board however ancient the building itself in its business there are no indications of decay and it still does a thriving trade guests of the excursionist kind occasionally dine there while in the angling season piscator stays at it all through spring and summer and if a keen disciple of isaac or an ardent admirer of the wise scenery often prolonging his sojourn into late autumn besides from towns not too distant the sporting tradesmen and fast clerks after early closing on saturdays come hither and remain over till monday for the first train catchable at a station some two miles off the welsh harp can provide beds for all and sitting-rooms besides for it is a roomy caravanserai and if a little rough in its culinary arrangements has a cellar unexceptionable among those who taste its tap are many who know good wine from bad with others who only judge of the quality by the price and in accordance with this criterion the boniface of the harp can give them the very best it is a saturday night and two of those last described connoisseurs lately arrived at the wyside hostelry are standing before its bar counter drinking rhubarb sap which they facetiously call fizz and believe to be champagne as it costs them ten shillings a bottle they are justified in their belief and quite as well will it serve their purpose they are young drapers assistants from a large manufacturing town out for their hebdomadal holiday which they have elected to spend in an excursion to the wye and a frolic at rugs ferry they have had an afternoon's boating on the river and now return to the harp their place of put-up a flush of talk over their adventures quaffing the sham chamois and smoking regalias not anything more genuine while thus indulging they are startled by the apparition of what seems an angel but what they know to be a thing of flesh and blood something that pleases them better a beautiful woman more correctly speaking a girl since it is mary morgan who has stepped inside the room set apart for the distributing of drink taking the cigars from between their teeth and leaving the rhubarb juice just poured into their glasses to discharge its pent-up gas they stand staring at the girl with an impertinence rather due to the drink than any innate rudeness they are harmless fellows in their way would be quiet enough behind their own counters though fast before that of the welsh harp and foolish with such a face as that of mary morgan beside them she gives them scant time to gaze on it her business is simple and speedily transacted a bottle of your best brandy the french cognac as she makes the demand placing ten shillings the price understood upon the lead-covered counter the barmaid a practised hand quickly takes the article called for from a shelf behind and passes it across the counter and with like alertness counting the shillings laid upon it and sweeping them into the till it is all over in a few seconds time and with equal celerity mary morgan slipping the purchased commodity into her cloak glides out of the room vision-like as she entered it who is that young lady asked one of the champagne drinkers interrogating the barmaid young lady tartly returns the latter with a flourish of her heavily chignoned head only a farmer's daughter or oh, exclaims the second tippler in drawling imitation of swelldom only the offspring of a chore bacon she's a monstrously crummy creature you know devilish nice gal affirms the other no longer addressing himself to the barmaid who has scornfully shown them the back of her head with its tower of twisted jute devilish nice gal indeed never saw spicier stand before a counter what a dainty little fish for a farmer's daughter say charlie wouldn't you like to be selling her a pair of kids juven's best helping her draw them on eh by jove yes that would i perhaps you'd prefer it being boots what a stepper she is too suppose we slide after and see where she hangs out capital idea suppose we do all right old fellow i'm ready with the yardstick roll off 
and without further exchange of their professional phraseology they rush out leaving their glasses half full of the effervescing beverage rapidly on the spoil they have sallied forth to meet disappointment the night is black as herborous and the girl gone out of sight nor can they tell which way she has taken and to inquire might get them guide if not worse besides they see no one of whom inquiry could be made a dark shadow passes them apparently the figure of a man but so dimly descried and going at such rapid gait they refrain from hailing him not likely they will see more of the monstrously crummy creature that night they may on the morrow somewhere perhaps at the little chapel close by registering a mental vow to do their devotions there and recalling the bottle of fizz left uncorked on the counter they return to finish it and they drain it dry gulping down several goes of b and s besides ere ceasing to think of the devilish nice gal on whose dainty little fist they would say like fitting kid gloves meanwhile she who has so much interested the dry goods gentleman is making her way along the road which leads past the widow wingate's cottage going at a rapid pace but not continuously at intervals she makes stops and stands listening her glances sent interrogatively to the front she acts as one expecting to hear footsteps or a voice in friendly salutation and see him saluting for it is a man footsteps are there besides her own but not heard by her nor in the direction she is hoping to hear them instead they are behind and light though made by a heavy man for he is treading gingerly as if on eggs evidently desirous not to make known his proximity near he is and were the light only a little clearer she would surely see him favoured by its darkness he can follow close aided also by the shadowing trees and still further from her attention being all given to the ground in advance with thoughts preoccupied but closely he follows her but never coming up when she stops he does the same moving on again as she moves forward and so for several pauses with spells of brisk walking between opposite the wingate cottage she tarries longer than elsewhere there was a woman standing in the door who however does not observe her cannot a hedge of holly between cautiously parting its spinous leaves and peering through the young girl takes a survey not of the woman whom she well knows but of a window the only one in which there is a light and less the window than the walls inside on her way to the ferry she had stopped to do the same then seeing shadows two of them one a woman's the other of a man the woman is there in the door mrs wingate herself the man her son must be elsewhere under the elm by this says mary morgan in soliloquy i'll find him there she adds silently gliding past the gate under the elm mutters the man who follows adding i'll kill her there i both two hundred yards further on and she reaches the place where the footpath debouches upon the road there is a style of the usual rough crossbar pattern proclaiming a right of way she stops only to see there is no one sitting upon it for there might have been then leaping lightly over she proceeds along the path the shadow behind does the same as though it were a spectre pursuing and now in the deeper darkness of the narrow way arcaded over by a thick canopy of leaves he goes closer and closer almost to touching were a light at this moment let upon his face it would reveal features set in an expression worthy of hell itself and cast farther down would show a hand closed upon the haft of a long-bladed knife nervously clutching every now and then half drawing it from its sheath as if to plunge its blade into the back of her who is now scarce six steps ahead and with this dread danger threatening so close mary morgan proceeds along the forest path unsuspectingly joyfully as she thinks of who is before with no thought of that behind no one to cry out or even whisper the word beware End of chapter 19 Volume 1, Chapter 20 of Gwen Wynn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gwen Wynn, A Romance of the Why by Maine Reed Chapter 20, Under the Elm in more ways than one has jack wingate thrown dust in his mother's eyes his going to the ferry after a piece of whipcord and a bit of pitch was fib the first the second his not going there at all for he has not instead in the very opposite direction soon as reaching the road having turned his face towards abergann though his objective point is but the big elm 
Once outside the gate he glides along the holly hedge crouchingly, and with head ducked so that it may not be seen by the good dame who has followed him to the door. The darkness favouring him it is not, and congratulating himself at getting off thus deftly he continues rapidly up the road. Arrived at the stile he makes stop, saying in soliloquy, I take it she be sure to come, but I give something to know which is the two ways. Being so darkish and that plank a bit dangerous to cross, I ha heard, taint often I cross it, just possible she may choose the roundabout of the road. Still she saved the big elm, and to get there she'll have to take the path coming or going back. If I thought coming I'd steer straight there and meet her, but supposing she prefers the road, that'd make it longer to wait. Wonder which it's to be. With hand rested on the top rail of the stile, he stands considering. Since their stolen interchange of speech at the harvest home, Mary has managed to send him word she will make an errand to Rugg's Ferry, hence his uncertainty. Soon again he resumes his conjectured soliloquy. Tain't possible she had been to the ferry and gone back again. God help me, I hope not. And yet there's just a chance. I wish the captain hadn't kept me so long down there, and the fresh from the rain that delayed us nigh half an hour I oughtn't to have stayed a minute after getting home. But mother cooking that nice bit of steak. If I hadn't ate it she'd be angry, and for certain suspected something. Then listening to all that dismal stuff about the corpse candle, and they believe it in the Shire of Pembroke, rot the thing, though I ain't myself now always superstitious, it give me the creeps. Queer her dreamin she seed it go out of Abergann. I do wish she hadn't told me that, and I mustn't say a word of it to Mary. Though she ain't o' the fearsome kind, a thing like that's enough to frighten any one. Well, what do I best do? If she had been to the ferry and scowed home again, then I've missed her and no mistake. Still, she said she'd be at the Elm, and never broke her promise to me when she could keep it. A man ought to take a woman at her word, a true woman, and not be too quick to anticipate. Besides, the surer way's the safer. She appointed the old place, and there I'll abide her. But what am I thinking of? She may be there now, awaiting for me. He doesn't stay by the stile one instant longer, but vaulting over it strikes off along the path. Despite the obscurity of the night, the narrowness of the track and the branches obstructing, he proceeds with celerity. With that part he is familiar, knows every inch of it, well as the way from his door to the place where he docks his boat at least so far as the big elm, under whose spreading branches he and she have oft clandestinely met. It is an ancient patriarch of the forest. Its timber is honeycombed with decay, not having tempted the axe by whose strike its fellows have long ago fallen, and it now stands amid their progeny, towering over all. It is a very few paces distant from the footpath, screened from it by a thicket of hollies interposed between and extending around. From its huge hollow trunk a buttress, horizontally projected, affords a convenient seat for two, making it the very beau ideal of a trysting tree. Having got up and under it, Jack Wingate is a little disappointed, almost vexed at not finding his sweetheart there. He calls her name, in the hope she may be among the hollies, at first cautiously and in a low voice, then louder. No reply. She has either not been, or has, and is gone. As the latter appears probable enough, he once more blames Captain Rycroft, the rain, the river flood, the beefsteak, above all that long yarn about the Canwell Corf, muttering anathemas against the ghostly superstition. Still, she may come yet. It may be but the darkness that's delaying her. Besides, she is not likely to have the fixing of her time. She said she would find a way, and having the will, as he believes, he flatters himself she will find it, despite all obstructions. With confidence thus restored, he ceases to pace about impatiently, as he has been doing ever since his arrival at the tree, and, taking a seat on the buttress, sits listening with all ears. His eyes are of little use in the Sumerian gloom. He can barely make out the forms of the holly bushes, so they are almost within reach of his hand. But his ears are reliable, sharpened by love, and ere long they convey a sound to him, sweeter than any other ever heard in that wood, even the songs of its birds. It is a swishing, as of leaves softly brushed by the skirts of a woman's dress, which it is. He needs no telling who comes. A subtle electricity seeming to proceed warns him of Mary Morgan's presence as though she were already by his side. All doubts and conjectures at an end, he starts to his feet and steps out to meet her. 
soon as on the path he sees a cloaked figure drawing nigh with a grace of movement distinguishable even in the dim glimmering light that you mary a question mechanical no answer expected or waited for before any could be given she is in his arms her lips hindered from words by a shower of kisses thus having saluted he takes her hand and leads her among the hollies not from precaution or fear of being intruded upon few besides the farm people of abergann use the right of way path and unlikely any of them being on it at that hour it is only from habit they retire to the more secluded spot under the elm hallowed to them by many a sweet remembrance they sit down side by side and close for his arm is around her waist how unlike the lovers in the painted pavilion at langoran here there is neither concealment of thought nor restraint of speech no time given to circumlocution none wasted in silence there is none to spare as she has told him at the moment of meeting it's kind of you coming mary he says as soon as they are seated i knew you would oh jack what a work i had to get out the trick i've played mother you'll laugh when you hear it let's hear it darling she relates the catastrophe of the cupboard at which he does laugh beyond measure and with a sense of gratification six shillings thrown away spilled upon the floor and all for him where is the man who would not feel flattered gratified to be the shrine of such sacrifice and from such a worshipper you've been to the ferry then you see she says holding up the bottle i wish i'd known that i could have met you on the road and we'd had more time to be together it's too bad you haven't to go straight back it is but there's no help for it father roger will be there before this and mother mad impatient were in light she would see his brow darken at mention of the priest's name she does not nor does he give expression to the thoughts it has called up in his heart he curses the jesuit often has with his tongue but not now he is too delicate to outrage her religious susceptibilities still he cannot be altogether silent on a theme so much concerning both mary dear he rejoins in grave serious tone i don't want to say a word against father roger seeing how much he be your mother's friend or to speak more truthful her favourite for i don't believe he's the friend of anybody certainly not mine nor yours and i've got it on my mind that man will some day make mischief between us how can he jack ah how a many ways one he's saying ugly things about me to your mother telling her tales that ain't true let him as many as he likes you don't suppose i'll believe them no i don't darling deed i don't a snatched kiss affirms the sincerity of his words hers as well in her lips not being drawn back but meeting him half way for a short time there is silence with that sweet exchange thrilling their hearts it is natural he is the first to resume speech and from a thought the kiss has suggested i know there be a good many who give their lives to get the like of that from your lips mary a soft word or only a smile i've heard talk of several but one spoke of in particular as being special favoured by your mother and backed up by the french priest who she has an idea who indeed knows and the question is only asked to give opportunity of denial i dislike mentioning his name to me it seems like insulting ye the very idea of dick dempsey you needn't say any more she exclaims interrupting him i know what you mean but you surely don't suppose i could think of him as a sweetheart that would insult me i hope it would pleased to hear you say it for all he thinks of you mary not only in the way of sweetheart but he hesitates what i won't say the word tain't fit to be spoke about him and you if you mean wife as i suppose you do listen rather than have richard dempsey for a husband i'd die go down to the river and drown myself that horrid wretch i hate him i'm glad to hear you talk that way right glad but why jack you know it couldn't be otherwise you should after all that's past heaven be my witness you i love and you alone you only ever shall call me wife if not then nobody god bless ye he exclaims in answer to her impassioned speech god bless you darling in the fervour of his gratitude flinging his arms around drawing her to his bosom and showering upon her lips an avalanche of kisses with thoughts absorbed in the delirium of love their souls for a time surrendered to it they hear not a rustling among the late fallen leaves or if hearing supposed it to proceed from bird or beast the flight of an owl with wings touching the twigs or a fox quartering the cover in search of prey still less do they see a form skulking among the hollies black and boding as their shadows 
yet such there is the figure of a man but with face more like that of demon for it is he whose name has just been upon their lips he has overheard all they have said every word an added torture every phrase sending hell to his heart and now with jealousy in its last dire throw every remnant of hope extinguished cruelly crushed out he stands after all unresolved how to act trembling too for he is at bottom a coward he might rush at them and kill both cut them to pieces with the knife he is holding in his hand but if only one and that her what of himself he has an instinctive fear of jack wingate who has more than once taught him a subduing lesson that experience stands the young waterman instead now in all likelihood saving his life for at this moment the moon rising flings a faint light through the branches of the trees and like some ravenous nocturnal prowler that dreads the light of day richard dempsey pushes his knife-blade back into its sheath slips out from among the hollies and altogether away from the spot but not to go back to rugg's ferry nor to his own home well for mary morgan if he had by the same glimpse of silvery light warned as to the time she knows she must needs hasten away as her lover that he can no longer detain her the farewell kiss so sweet yet painful but makes their parting more difficult and not till after repeating it over and over do they tear themselves asunder he standing to look after she moving off along the woodland path as nymph or sylph-eyed with no suspicion that a satire has preceded her and is waiting not far off with foul fell intent no less than the taking of her life end of chapter twenty end of volume one volume two chapter one of gwen Wynn. this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org gwen Wynn, a romance of the why by main reed volume two chapter one a tardy messenger father rogier has arrived at abergann slipped off his galoshes left them with his hat in the entrance passage and stepped inside the parlour there is a bright coal fire chirping in the grate for although not absolutely cold the air is damp and raw from the rain which has fallen during the earlier hours of the day he has not come direct from his house at the ferry but up the meadows from below along paths that are muddy with wet grass overhanging hence his having on india rubber overshoes spare of flesh and thin-blooded he is sensitive to cold feeling it now he draws a chair to the fire and sits down with his feet rested on the fender for a time he has it all to himself the farmer is still outside looking after his cattle and setting things up for the night while mrs morgan after receiving him has made excuse to the kitchen to set the frying pan on the coals already the sausages can be heard frizzling while their savoury odour is borne everywhere throughout the house before sitting down the priest had helped himself to a glass of sherry and after taking a mouthful or two set it on the mantel shelf with inconvenient reach it would have been brandy were there any on the table but for the time satisfied with the wine he sits sipping it his eyes now and then directed towards the door this is shut mrs morgan having closed it after her as she went out there is a certain restlessness in his glances as though he were impatient for the door to be reopened and someone to enter and so is he though mrs morgan herself is not the someone but her daughter gregoire rogier has been a fast fellow in his youth before assuming the cassock a very mauvais sujet even now in the maturer age and despite his vows of celibacy he has partiality for the sex and a keen eye to female beauty the fresh youthful charms of the farmer's daughter have many a time made it water more than the now stale attractions of a limp nay renault she is not the only disciple of his flock he delights in drawing to the confessional but there is a vast difference between the mistress of glingog and the maiden of abergann unlike are they as lucretia borgia to that other lucretia victim of tarquin fee and the priest knows he must deal with them in a very different manner he cannot himself have mary morgan for a wife he does not wish to but it may serve his purpose equally well were she to become the wife of richard dempsey hence his giving support to the pretensions of the poacher not all unselfish 
eagerly watching the door he at length sees it pushed open and by a woman but not the one he is wishing for only mrs morgan re-entering to speak apologies for delay in serving supper it will be on the table in a trice without paying much attention to what she says or giving thought to her excuses he asks in a drawl of assumed indifference where is mademoiselle marie not on the sick list i hope oh no your reverence she was never in better health in her life i'm happy to say attending to culinary matters i presume bothering herself on my account too really madam i wish you wouldn't take so much trouble when i come to pay you these little visits calls of duty above all that mademoiselle should be scorching her fair cheeks before a kitchen fire she'd not nothing of the kind father rogier dressing maybe that isn't needed either to receive poor me no she's not dressing ah what then pardon me for appearing inquisitive i merely wish to have a word with her before monsieur your husband comes in relating to a matter of the sunday school she's at home isn't she not just this minute she soon will be what out at this hour yes she has gone up to the ferry on an errand i wonder you didn't meet her which way did you come father rogier the path or the lane neither nor from the ferry i've been down the river on visitation duty and came up through the meadows it's rather a dark night for your daughter to have gone upon an errand not alone i take it yes she went alone but why madam mrs morgan had not intended to say anything about the nature of the message but it must come out now well your reverence she answers laughing it's rather an amusing matter as you'll say yourself when i tell it to you tell it pray it's all through a cat our big tom ah tom what jeu d'esprit has he been perpetrating not much of a joke after all but more the other way the mischievous creature got into the pantry and somehow upset a bottle indeed i broke it to pieces cat maudit but what has that to do with your daughter's going to the ferry everything it was a bottle of best french brandy unfortunately the only one we had in the house and as they say misfortunes never do come single it so happened our boy was away after the cows and nobody else i could spare so i've sent mary to the welsh harp for another i know your reverence prefers brandy to wine madam your very kind thoughtfulness deserves my warmest thanks but i'm really sorry at your having taken all this trouble to entertain me above all i regret its having entailed such a disagreeable duty upon your mademoiselle marie henceforth i shall feel reluctance in setting foot over your threshold don't say that father rogier please don't mary didn't think it disagreeable i should have been angry with her if she had on the contrary it was herself proposed going as the boy was out of the way and our girl in the kitchen busy about supper but poor it is i'm sorry to tell you and will need the drop of cognac to make it at all palatable you underrate your menu madame if it be anything like what i've been accustomed to at your table still i cannot help feeling regret at mademoiselle's having been sent to the ferry the road's in such condition and so dark too she may have a difficulty in finding her way which did she go by the path or the lane your own interrogatory to myself almost verbatim so droll with but a vague comprehension of the interpolated french and latin phrases the farmer's wife makes rejoinder indeed i can't say which i never thought of asking her however mary's a sensible lass and surely wouldn't think of venturing over the footplank a night like this she knows it's loose ah she continues stepping to the window and looking out there be the moon up i'm glad of that she'll see her way now and get sooner home how long is it since she went off mrs morgan glances at the clock over the mantel soon she sees where the hands are exclaiming mercy me it's half past nine she's been gone a good hour her surprise is natural to rugs ferry is but a mile even by the lane and road twenty minutes to go and twenty more to return were enough how are the other twenty being spent buying a bottle of brandy across the counter and paying for it will not explain that should occupy scarce as many seconds besides the last words of the messenger at starting off were a promise of speedy return she has not kept it and what can be keeping her 
her mother asks this question but without being able to answer it she can neither tell nor guess but the priest more suspicious has his conjectures one giving him pain greatly exciting him though he does not show it instead with simulated calmness he says suppose i step out and see whether she be near at hand if your reverence would but please don't stay for her supper's quite ready and evan will be in by the time i get it dished i wonder what's detaining mary if she only knew what she would be less solicitous about the supper and more about the absent one no matter she continues cheering up the girl will surely be back before we sit down to the table if not she must go the priest had not stayed to hear the clause threatening to disentitle the tardy messenger he is too anxious to learn the cause of delay and in the hope of discovering it with a view to something besides he hastily claps on his hat without waiting to defend his feet with the galoshes then glides out and off across the garden mrs morgan remains in the doorway looking after him with an expression on her face not all contented perhaps she too has a foreboding of evil or it may be she but thinks of her daughter's future and that she is herself doing wrong by endeavouring to influence it in favour of a man about whom she has of late had her discreditable rumours or perchance some suspicion of the priest himself may be stirring within her for there are scandals abroad concerning him that have reached even her ears whatever the cause there is shadow on her brow as she watches him pass out through the gate scarce dispelled by the bright blazing fire in the kitchen as she returns thither to direct the serving of the supper if she but knew the tale he father rogier is so soon to bring back she might not have left the door so soon or upon her own feet more likely have dropped down on its threshold to be carried from it fainting if not dead end of volume two chapter one Volume two, chapter two of Gwen Wynne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gwen Wynne, A Romance of the Why by Main Reed. Volume two, chapter two, A Fatal Step. Having passed out through the gate, Rogier turns along the wall and proceeding at a brisk pace to where it ends in an angle there comes to a halt on the same spot where about an hour before stopped mary morgan for a different reason she paused to consider which of the two ways she would take he has no intention of taking either or going a step farther whatever he wishes to say to her can be said where he is now without danger of its being overheard at the house unless spoken in a tone louder than that of ordinary conversation but it is not on this account he has stopped simply that he is not sure which of the two routes she will return by and for him to proceed along either would be to risk the chance of not meeting her at all but that he has some idea of the way she will come with suspicion of why and what is delaying her his mutterings tell morbleu over an hour since she set out a tortoise could have crawled to the ferry and crept back within the time for a demoiselle with limbs light and supple as hers pah it can't be the brandy bottle that's the obstruction nothing of the kind corked capsuled wrapped ready for delivery in all two minutes or at most three she's so ready to run for it too herself proposed going odd that to say the least only understandable on the supposition of something prearranged an assignation with the river triton for sure yes he's the anchor that's been holding her holds her still likely they're somewhat under the shadow of that wood now standing sitting ah i wish i but knew the spot i'd bring their billing and cooing to an abrupt termination it will not do for me to go on guesses i might miss the straying damsel with whom this night i want a word in particular must have it monsieur caracal may need binding a little faster before he consents to the service required of him to ensure an interview with her it is necessary to stay on this spot however trying to patience for a second or two he stands motionless though all the while active in thought his eyes also restless these turning to the wall show him that it is overgrown with ivy a massive cluster on its crest projects out with hanging tendrils whose tops almost touch the ground behind them there is ample room for a man to stand upright 
and so be concealed from the eyes of any one passing, however near. Grasso, dear, he exclaims, observing this, the very place. I must take her by surprise. That's the best way when one wants to learn how the cat jumps. Ha! Sec cat, Tom. How very opportune his mischievous doings for Mademoiselle. Well, I must give Madame la Mere counsel better to guard against such accidents hereafter, and how to behave when they occur. He has by this ducked his head and stepped under the arcading evergreen. The position is all he could desire. It gives him a view of both ways by which on that side the farmhouse can be approached. The cart lane is directly before his face, as is also the footpath when he turns towards it, the latter leading, as already said, along a hedge to the orchard's bottom, there crosses the brook by a plank, this being about fifty yards distant from where he has stationed himself, and as there is now moonlight he can distinctly see the frail footbridge with a portion of the path beyond, where it runs through straggling trees before entering the thicker wood. Only at intervals has he sight of it, as the sky is mottled with masses of cloud that every now and then, drifting over the moon's disk, shut off her light with the suddenness of a lamp extinguished. When she shines he can himself be seen, standing in crouched attitude with the ivy tendrils festooned over his pale bloodless face. He looks like a gigantic spider behind its web on the wait for prey, ready to spring forward and seize it. For nigh ten minutes he thus remains watching, all the while impatiently chafing. He listens, too, though with little hope of hearing aught to indicate the approach of her expected. After the pleasant tater tate he is now sure she must have held with the waterman. She will be coming along silently, her thoughts in sweet placid contentment, or she may come on with timid stealthy steps, dreading rebuke by her mother for having overstayed her time. Just as the priest, in bitterest chagrin, is promising himself that rebuke she shall be, he sees what interrupts his resolve, suddenly and altogether withdrawing his thoughts from Mary Morgan. It is a form approaching the plank on the opposite side of the stream, not hers nor woman's, instead the figure of a man, neither erect nor walking in the ordinary way, but with head held down and shoulders projected forward, as if he were seeking concealment under the bushes that beset the path, for all drawing nigh to the brook with the rapidity of one pursued, and who thinks there is safety only on its other side. Saint Vierge! exclaims the priest, sotto voce. What can all that mean? And who? He stays his self asked interrogatory, seeing that the skulker has paused too at the farther end of the plank which he has now reached. Why? It may be from fear to set foot on it for indeed is there danger to one not intimately acquainted with it. The man may be a stranger, some fellow on teams who, trying the hospitality of the farmhouse, more likely it's Henry's, judging by his manner of approach. While thus conjecturing, Rogier sees the skulker stoop down immediately after hearing a sound, different from the sow of the stream, a harsh grating noise, as of a piece of heavy timber drawn over a rough surface of rock. Sharp fellow, thinks the priest, with all his haste wonderfully cautious. He's fixing the thing steady before venturing to tread upon it. Ha! I'm wrong. He doesn't design crossing it after all. This as the crouching figure erects itself and, instead of passing over the plank, turns abruptly away from it, not to go back along the path, but up the stream on that same side, and with bent body as before, still seeming desirous to shun observation. Now more than ever mystified, the priest watches him, with eyes keen as those of a cat set for nocturnal prowling. Not long till he learns who the man is. Just then the moon, escaping from a cloud, flashes her full light in his face, revealing features of diabolical expression, that of a murderer striding away from the spot where he has been spilling blood. Rogier recognises Coracle Dick, though still without the slightest idea of what the poacher is doing there. Cady Antra, he exclaims in surprise, what can that devil be after? Coming up to the plank and not crossing. Ha! Yonder's a very different sort of pedestrian approaching it. Mamselle Mary at last. This, as by the same intermittent gleam of moonlight, he descries a straw hat with streaming ribbons over the tops of the bushes behind the brook. The brighter image drives the darker one from his thoughts and forgetting all about the man, in his resolve to take the woman unawares, he steps out from under the ivy and makes forward to meet her. 
he is a frenchman and to help her over the footplank will give him a fine opportunity for displaying his cheap gallantry as he hastens down to the stream the moon remaining unclouded he sees the young girl close to it on the opposite side she approaches with proud carriage and confident step her cheeks even under the pale light showing red flushed with the kisses so lately received as it was still clinging to them her heart yet thrilling with love strong under its excitement little suspects she how soon it will cease to beat boldly she plants her foot upon the plank believing late boasting a knowledge of its tricks alas there is one with which she is not acquainted could not be a new and treacherous one taught it within the last two minutes the daughter of evan morgan is doomed one more step will be her last in life she makes it the priest alone being witness he sees her arms flung aloft simultaneously hearing a shriek then arms body and bridge sink out of sight suddenly as though the earth had swallowed them end of volume two chapter two volume two chapter three of gwen Wynn. this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. gwen Wynn, a romance of the why by main reed volume two chapter three a suspicious waif on returning homeward the young waterman bethinks him of a difficulty a little matter to be settled with his mother not having gone to the shop he has neither whipcord nor pitch to show if questioned about these commodities what answer is he to make he dislikes telling her another lie it came easy enough before the interview with his sweetheart but now it is not so much worth while on reflection he thinks it will be better to make a clean breast of it he has already half confessed and may as well admit his mother to full confidence about the secret he has been trying to keep from her unsuccessfully as he now knows while still undetermined a circumstance occurs to hinder him from longer withholding it whether he would or not in his abstraction he has forgotten all about the moon now up and at intervals shining brightly during one of these he has arrived at his own gate as he opens it seeing his mother on the doorstep her attitude shows she has already seen him and observed the direction whence he has come her words declare the same why jack she exclaims in feigned astonishment you be not a comin from the ferry that way the interrogatory or rather the tone in which it is put tells him the cat is out of the bag no use attempting to stuff the animal in again and seeing it is not he rejoins laughingly well mother to speak the truth i ain't been to the ferry at all and i must ask you to forgive me for practising a trifle of deception on ye that bout the mary wanting repairs i suspected it lad and that it was a t other mary as wanted something or you wanted something with her since you spoke repentful and confessed i ain't a goin to worry ye about it i'm glad the boat be all right as i ha got good news for you what he asks rejoiced at being so easily let off well you spoke truth when you said there was no knowin but that somebody might be wantin to hire you any minute there's been one already who not the captain no not him but a grand livery chap footman or coachman i ain't sure which only that he came fra a squire pals about a mile back oh i know squire pal him a new hall i suppose it be what did the sarvent say that if you wasn't engaged his young master wants you to take yourself and some friends that be staying with him for a row down the river how far did the man say if they be bound to chepstow or even but tintern i don't think i could go unless they start monday morning i'm gauged to the captain for thursday you know and if i went the long trip there'd be all the bother o getting the boat back and bare time monday why it's the morrow they want ye sunday that's queerish too squire pal's family be a sort of strict religious i've heerd that's just it the livery chap said it be a church they're going to some curious kind of old worshipping place that lie in a bend of the river where carriages had difficulty in getting to it i think i know the one and can take them there well enough what answer did you give to the man that you could take em and would 
I know you'd hadn't any other bespeak, and since it were to a church, wouldn't mind its being Sunday. Certainly not. Why should I? asked Jack, who is anything but a Sabbatarian. Where do they wish the boat to be took? Or am I to wait for him here? Yes, the man spoke of them coming here, and at a very early hour, six o'clock. He said the clergyman be a friend of the family, and there to have their breakfast with him before going to church. All right, I'll be ready for him. Comes as early as they may. In that case, my son, you better get to your bed at once. You've had a hard day of it and need rest. Should you like to take a drop of something for you lie down? Well, mother, I don't mind. Just a glass of your elderberry. She opens the cupboard, brings forth a black bottle, and fills him a tumbler of the dark red wine, homemade and by her own hands. Quaffing it, he observes, It be the best stuff I know of to put spirit into a man, and makes him feel cheery. I've heard the captain himself say it beats their Spanish port all to pieces. Though somewhat astray in his commercial geography, the young waterman, as his patron, is right about the quality of the beverage, for elderberry wine, made in the correct way, is superior to that of a porto. Curious scientific fact, I believe not generally known, that the soil where grows the Sambucus is that most favourable to the growth of the grape. Without going thus deeply into the philosophy of the subject, or at all troubling himself about it, the boatman soon gets to the bottom of his glass, and bidding his mother good night, retires to his sleeping room. Getting into bed, he lies for a while sweetly thinking of Mary Morgan, and that satisfactory interview under the elm, then goes to sleep as sweetly to dream of her. There is just a streak of daylight stealing in through the window as he awakes, enough to warn him that it is time to be up and stirring. Up he instantly is, and arrays himself, not in his everyday boating habiliments, but a suit worn only on Sundays and holidays. The mother, also astir betimes, has his breakfast on the table soon as he is rigged, and just as he finishes eating it, the rattle of wheels on the road in front with voices tells him his fare has arrived. Hastening out, he sees a grand carriage drawn up at the gate, double-horsed with coachman and footman on the box. Inside, young Mr. Powell, his pretty sister and two others, a lady and gentleman, also young. Soon they are all seated in the boat, the coachman having been ordered to take the carriage home and bring it back at a certain hour. The footman goes with them, the Mary having seats for six. Road downstream, the young people converse among themselves, gaily now and then giving way to laughter, as though it were any other day than Sunday. But their boatman is merry also, with memories of the preceding night, and though not called upon to take part in their conversation, he likes listening to it. Above all, he is pleased with the appearance of Miss Powell, a very beautiful girl, and takes note of the attention paid her by the gentleman who sits opposite. Jack is rather interested in observing these, as they remind him of his own first approaches to Mary Morgan. His eyes, though, are for a time removed from them, while the boat is passing Abigan. Out of the farmhouse chimneys, just visible over the tops of the trees, he sees smoke ascending. It is not yet seven o'clock, but the Morgans are early risers, and by this mother and daughter will be on their way to Martin's, and possibly confession at the Rugs Ferry Chapel. He dislikes to reflect on the last, and longs for the day when he has hopes to cure his sweetheart of such a repulsive devotional practice. Pulling on down, he ceases to think of it, and of her for the time, his attention being engrossed by the management of the boat. For just below Abigan, the stream runs sharply, and is given to caprices, but further on, it once more flows in gentle tide along the meadowlands of Langoran. Before turning the bend, where Gwen Wynne and Eleanor Lees were caught in the rapid current, at the estuary of a sluggish inflowing brook, whose waters are now beaten back by the flooded river, he sees what causes him to start and hang on the stroke of his oar. "'What is it, Wingate?' asked young Powell, observing his strange behaviour. "'Oh, a waif, that plank floating yonder. I suppose you'd like to pick it up. But remember, it's Sunday, and we must confine ourselves to works of necessity and mercy.' Little think the four who smile at this remark, five with the footman, what a weird, painful impression the sight of that drifting thing has made on the sixth who is rowing them. Nor does it leave him all that day, but clings to him in the church to which he goes, at the rectory where he is entertained, and while rowing back up the river hangs heavy on his heart as lead.
Returning, he looks out for the piece of timber, but cannot see it, for it is now after night, the young people having stayed dinner with their friend the clergyman. Kept later than they intended, on arrival at the boat's dock, they do not remain there an instant, but getting into the carriage which has been some time awaiting them, are whirled off to New Hall. Impatient are they to be home, far more, for a different reason, the waterman, who but stays to tie the boat's painter, and leaving the oars in her thwarts, hastens into his house. The plank is still uppermost in his thoughts, the presentiment heavy on his heart. Not lighter, as on entering at the door he sees his mother seated with her head bowed down to her knees. He does not wait for her to speak, but asks excitedly, "'What's the matter, mother?' The question is mechanical. He almost anticipates the answer or its nature. "'Oh, my son, my son, as I told ye, it was the Canwell Corf. End of Volume 2 Chapter 3volume two chapter four of gwen wynne this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org gwen wynne a romance of the why by main reed volume two chapter four the flower of love lies bleeding there is a crowd collected round the farmhouse of abigan not an excited or noisy one Instead, the people composing it are of staid demeanour with that formal solemnity observable on the faces of those at a funeral. And a funeral it is, or soon to be, for inside there is a chamber of death, a coffin with a corpse, that of her who, had she lived, would have been Jack Wingate's wife. Mary Morgan has indeed fallen victim to the mad spite of a monster. Down went she into that swollen stream, which, ruthless and cruel as he who committed her to it, carried her off on its engulfing tide, her form tossed to and fro, now sinking, now coming to the surface, and again going down, no one to save her, not an effort at rescue made by the cowardly Frenchman, who, rushing on to the chasm's edge, there stopped, only to gaze affrightedly at the flood surging below, foam-crested, only to listen to her agonised cry, further off and more freely put forth as she was borne onward to her doom. Once again he heard it, in that tone which tells of life's last struggle with death, proclaiming death the conqueror. Then all was over. As he stood horror-stricken, half-bewildered, a cloud suddenly curtained the moon, bringing black darkness upon the earth, as if a pall had been thrown over it, even the white froth on the water was for the while invisible. He could see nothing, nothing here, save the hoarse, harsh torrent rolling relentlessly on. Of no avail, then, his hurrying back to the house and raising the alarm. Too late it was to save Mary Morgan from drowning, and only by the accident of her body being thrown up against a bank was it that night recovered. It is the third day after, and the funeral about to take place. Though remote, the situation of the farmstead and sparsely inhabited the district immediately around, the assemblage is a large one, this partly from the unusual circumstances of the girl's death, but as much from the respect in which Evan Morgan is held by his neighbours far and near. They are there in their best attire, men and women alike, Protestants as Catholics, to show a sympathy which in truth many of them sincerely feel nor is there among the people assembled any conjecturing about the cause of the fatal occurrence no hint or suspicion that there has been foul play how could there so clearly an accident as pronounced by the coroner at his inquiry held the day after the drowning brief and purely pro forma mrs morgan herself told of her daughter sent on that errand from which she never returned while the priest eye-witness stated the reason why Taken together, this was enough, though further confirmed by the absent plank found and brought back on the following day. Even had Wingate rowed back up the river during daylight, he would not have seen it again. The farm labourers and others, accustomed to cross by it, gave testimony as to its having been loose. But of all whose evidence was called for, one alone could have put a different construction on the tale. Father Rogier could have done this, but did not having his reasons for withholding the truth. 
he is now in possession of a secret that will make richard dempsey his slave for life his instrument willing or unwilling for such purpose as he may need him no matter what its iniquity the hour of interment has been fixed for twelve o'clock it is now a little after eleven and everybody has arrived at the house the men stand outside in groups some in the little flower garden in front others straying into the farmyard to have a look at the fatting pigs or about the pastures to view the white-faced herefords and byland sheep of which last evan morgan is a noted breeder inside the house are the women some relatives of the deceased with the farmer's friends and more familiar acquaintances all admitted to the chamber of death to take a last look at the dead the corpse is in the coffin but with lid not yet screwed on there lies the corpse in its white drapery still untouched by decay's effacing fingers beautiful as living bride though now a bride for the altar of eternity the stream passes in and out but besides those only curious coming and going there are some who remain in the room mrs morgan herself sits beside the coffin at intervals giving way to wildest grief a cluster of women around vainly essaying to comfort her there is a young man seated in the corner who seems to need consoling almost as much as she every now and then his breast heaves in audible sobbing as though the heart within were about to break none wonder at this for it is jack wingate still there are those who think it strange his being there above all as if made welcome they know not the remarkable change that has taken place in the feelings of mrs morgan beside that bed of death all who were dear to her daughter were dear to her now and she is aware that the young waterman was so for he has told her with tearful eyes and sad earnest words whose truthfulness could not be doubted but where is the other the false one not there never has been since the fatal occurrence came not to the inquest came not to inquire or condole comes not now to show sympathy or take part in the rites of sepulchre there are some who make remark about his absence though none lament it not even mrs morgan herself the thought of the bereaved mother is that he would have ill befitted being her son only a fleeting reflection her whole soul being engrossed in grief for her lost daughter the hour of closing the coffin has come they but await the priest to say some solemn words he has not yet arrived though every instant looked for a personage so important has many duties to perform and may be detained by them elsewhere for all he does not fail while inside the death chamber they are conjecturing the cause of his delay a buzz outside with a shuffling of feet in the passage tells of way being made for him presently he enters the room and stepping up to the coffin stands beside it all eyes turned towards him his are upon the face of the corpse at first with the usual look of official gravity and feigned grief but continuing to gaze upon it a strange expression comes over his features as though he saw something that surprised or unusually interested him it affects him even to giving a start so light however that no one seems to observe it whatever the emotion he conceals it and in calm voice pronounces the prayer with all its formalities and gestures the lid is laid on covering the form of mary morgan forever veiling her face from the world then the pall is thrown over and all carried outside there is no hearse no plumes nor paid pallbearers affection supplies the place of this heartless luxury of the tomb on the shoulders of four men the coffin is borne away the crowd forming into procession as it passes and following on to the rugs ferry chapel into its cemetery late consecrated they're lowered into a grave already prepared to receive it and after the usual ceremonial of the roman catholic religion covered up and turfed over then the mourners scatter off for their homes singly or in groups leaving the remains of mary morgan in their last resting place only her near relatives with thought of ever again returning to stand over them there is one exception this is a male not related to her but who would have been had she lived wingate goes away with the intention ere long to return the chapel burying ground brinks upon the river and when the shades of night have descended over it he brings his boat alongside 
Then, fixing her to the bank, he steps out, and proceeds in the direction of the new-made grave. All this cautiously, and with circumspection, as if fearing to be seen. The darkness favouring him, he is not. Reaching the sacred spot, he kneels down, and with a knife taken from his pockets, scoops out a little cavity in the lately laid turf. Into this he inserts a plant, which he has brought along with him, one of a common kind, but emblematic of no ordinary feeling. It is that known to country people as the flower of love lies bleeding, Amaranthus caudatus. Closing the earth around its roots and restoring the sods, he bends lower till his lips are in contact with the grass upon the grave. One near enough might hear convulsive sobbing, accompanied by the words, Mary, darling, you're with the angels now, and I know you'll forgive me if I've done aught to bring about this dreadful thing. Oh, dear, dear Mary, I'd be only too glad to be lying in the grave along with you. As God's my witness, I would. For a time he is silent, giving way to his grief, so wild as to seem unbearable, and just for an instant he himself thinks it is so, as he kneels with the knife still open in his hand, his eyes fixed upon it, a plunge with that shining blade with point to his heart, and all his misery would be over. My mother, my poor mother, no! These few words with the filial thought conveyed save him from suicide. Soon as repeating them, he shuts his knife, rises to his feet, and returning to the boat, again rows himself home, but never with so heavy a heart. End of Volume 2 Chapter 4Volume 2, Chapter 5 of Gwen Wynn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gwen Wynn, A Romance of the Why by Maine Reed. Volume 2, Chapter 5 A French Femme de Chambre. Of all who assisted at the ceremony of Mary Morgan's funeral, no one seemed so impatient for its termination as the priest. In his official capacity he did all he could to hasten it, soon as it was over hurrying away from the grave out of the burying ground and into his own house nearby. Such haste would have appeared strange, even indecent, but for the belief of his having some sacerdotal duty that called him elsewhere, a belief strengthened by their shortly after seeing him start off in the direction of the ferry-boat. Arriving there, the Caron attendant rows him across the river, and soon as setting foot on the opposite side, he turns face downstream, taking a path that meanders through fields and meadows. Along this he goes rapidly, as his legs can carry him, in a walk. Clerical dignity hinders him from proceeding at a run, though judging by the expression of his countenance, he is inclined to it. The route he is on would conduct to Langoran Court, several miles distant, and thither is he bound, though the house itself is not his objective point. He does not visit, nor would it serve him to show his face there, least of all to Gwen Wynne. She might not be so rude as to use her riding whip on him, as she once felt inclined in the hunting field, but she would certainly be surprised to see him at her home. Yet it is one within her house he wishes to see, and is now on the way for it, pretty sure of being able to accomplish his object. True to her fashionable instincts and toilette necessities, Miss Linton keeps a French maid, and it is with this damsel Father Rogier designs having an interview. He is thoroughly en rapport with the femme de chambre, and through her, aided by the confession, kept advised of everything which transpires at the court or all he deems it worth while to be advised about. His confidence that he will not have long his walk for nothing rests on certain matters of prearrangement. With the foreign domestic he has succeeded in establishing a code of signals by which he can communicate, with almost a certainty of being able to see her, not inside the house but at a place near enough to be convenient. Rare the park in Herefordshire through which there is not a right-of-way path, and one runs across that of Langoran. 
not through the ornamental grounds nor at all close to the mansion as is frequently the case to the great chagrin of the owner but several hundred yards distant it passes from the river's bank to the country road all the way through the trees that screen it from view of the house there is a point however where it approaches the edge of the wood and there one traversing it might be seen from the upper windows but only for an instant unless the party so passing should choose to make stop in the place exposed it is a thoroughfare not much frequented though free to father rogier as any one else and now hastening along it he arrives at that spot where the break in the timber brings the house in view here he makes a halt still keeping under the trees to a branch of one of them on the side towards the court attaching a piece of white paper he has taken out of his pocket this done with due caution and care that he not be observed in the act he draws back to the path and sits down upon a stile close by to await the upshot of his telegraphy his haste hitherto explained by the fact only at certain times are his signals likely to be seen or could they be attended to one of the surest and safest is during the early afternoon hours just after luncheon when the ancient toast of cheltenham takes her accustomed siesta before dressing herself for the drive or reception of callers while the mistress sleeps the maid is free to dispose of herself as she pleases it was to hit this interlude of leisure father rogier has been hurrying and that he has succeeded is soon known to him by his seeing a form with floating drapery recognisable as that of the femme de chambre gliding through the shrubbery and evidently with an eye to escape observation she is only visible at intervals at length lost to his sight altogether as she enters among the thick shading trees but he knows she will turn up again and she does after a short time coming along the path towards the stile where he is seated ah ma bonne he exclaims dropping on his feet and moving forward to meet her you've been prompt i didn't expect you quite so soon madame la chatelaine oblivious i apprehend in the midst of her afternoon nap yes pere she was when i stole off but she has given me directions about dressing her to go out for a drive earlier than usual so i must get back immediately i'm not going to detain you very long i chanced to be passing and thought i might as well have a word with you seeing it's the hour when you're off duty by the way i hear you're about to have grand doings at the court a ball and what not oui monsieur oui when is it to be on thursday mademoiselle celebrates saint jour de naissance the twenty-first making her of age it is to be a grand fete as you say they've been all last week preparing for it among the invited le capitaine rycroft i presume oh yes i saw madame write the note inviting him indeed took it myself down to the hall table for the postboy he visits often at the court of late very often once a week sometimes twice and comes down the river by boat doesn't he in a boat yes comes and goes that way her statement is reliable as father rogier has reason to believe having an inkling of suspicion that the damsel has of late been casting sheep's eyes not at captain rycroft but his young boatman and is as much interested in the movements of the mary as either the boat's owner or charterer always comes by water and returns by it observes the priest as if speaking to himself you're quite sure of that muffy oh quite pair mademoiselle appears to be very partial to him i think you told me she often accompanies him down to the boat stair at his departure often always always toujours i never knew it otherwise either the boat stair or the pavilion ah the summer house they hold their tete tete there at times do they yes they do but not when he leaves at a late hour as for instance when he dines at the court which i know he has done several times oh yes even then only last week he was there for dinner and mademoiselle gwen went with him to his boat or the pavilion to bid adieus no matter what the time to her ma foi i'd risk my word she'll do the same after his grand ball that's to be and why shouldn't she pere rogier is there any harm in it 
the question is put with a view of justifying her own conduct that would be somewhat similar were jack wingate to encourage it which to say truth he never has oh no answers the priest with an assumed indifference no harm whatever and no business of ours mademoiselle wynne is mistress of her own actions and will be more after the coming birthday number vant on but he adds dropping the role of the interrogator now that he has got all the information wanted i fear i'm keeping you too long as i've said chancing to come by i signalled chiefly to tell you that next sunday we have high mass in the chapel with special prayers for a young girl who was drowned last saturday night and whom we've just this day interred i suppose you've heard no i haven't who pair the question may appear strange rugg's ferry being so near to langoran court and abergann still nearer but for reasons already stated as others the ignorance of the frenchwoman as to what has occurred at the farmhouse is not only intelligible but natural enough equally natural though in a sense very different is a look of satisfaction appearing in her eyes as the priest in answer gives the name of the drowned girl marie la fille de fermier morgan the expression that comes over her face is under the circumstances terribly repulsive being almost that of joy for not only has she seen mary morgan at the chapel but something besides heard her name coupled with that of the waterman wingate in the midst of her strong sinful emotions of which the priest is fully cognizant he finds it a good opportunity for taking leave going back to the tree where the bit of signal paper has been left he plucks it off and crumbles it into his pocket then returning to the path shakes hands with her says bonjour and departs she is not a beauty or he would have made his adieus in a very different way end of volume two chapter five volume two chapter six of gwen wynn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. gwen wynn a romance of the Y by main reed volume two chapter six the poacher at home coracle dick lives all alone if he have relatives they are not near nor does any one in the neighbourhood know aught about them only some vague report of a father away off in the colonies where he went against his will while the mother is believed dead not less solitary is coracle's place of abode situated in a dingle with sides thickly wooded it is not visible from anywhere nor is it near any regular road only approachable by a path which there ends the dell itself being a cul-de-sac its open end is toward the river running in at a point where the bank is precipitous so hindering thoroughfare along the stream's edge unless when its waters are at their lowest coracle's house is but a hovel no better than the cabin of a backwood squatter timber structure too in part with a filling up of rough mason work its half dozen perches of garden ground once reclaimed from the wood have grown wild again no spade having touched them for years the present occupant of the tenement has no taste for gardening nor agriculture of any kind he is a poacher per sang at least so far as is known and it seems to pay him better than would the cultivation of cabbages with pheasants at nine shillings a brace and salmon three shillings a pound he has the river if not the mere for his net and the land for his game making as free with both as ever did alan a dale but whatever the price of fish and game be it high or low coracle is never without good store of cash spending it freely at the welsh harp as elsewhere at times so lavishly that people of suspicious nature think it cannot all be the product of night netting and snaring some of it say scandalous tongues is derived from other industries also practised by night and less reputable than trespassing after game but as already said these are only rumours and confined to the few indeed only a very few have intimate acquaintance with the man he is of a reserved taciturn habit somewhat surly not talkative even in his cups and though ever ready to stand treat in the harp tap-room he rarely practises hospitality in his own house only now and then when some acquaintance of like kidney and calling pays him a visit then the solitary domicile has its silence disturbed by the talk of men thick as thieves 
often speech which if heard beyond its walls could not be well for its owner more than half time however the poacher's dwelling is deserted and oftener at night than by day its door shut and padlocked tells when the tenant is abroad then only a rough lurch dog a dangerous animal too is guardian of the place not that there are any chattels to tempt the cupidity of the kleptomaniac the most valuable movable inside were not worth carrying away and outside is but the coracle standing in a lean-to shed propped up by its paddle it is not always there and when absent it may be concluded that its owner is on some expedition up down or across the river nor is the dog always at home his absence proclaiming the poacher engaged in the terrestrial branch of his profession running down hares or rabbits it is the night of the same day that has seen the remains of mary morgan consigned to their resting place in the burying ground of the rugs ferry chapel a wild night it has turned out dark and stormy the autumnal equinox is on and its gales have commenced stripping the trees of their foliage around the dwelling of dick dempsey the fallen leaves lie thick covering the ground as with cloth of gold at intervals torn to shreds as the wind swirls them up and holds them suspended every now and then they are driven against the door which is shut but not locked the hasp is hanging loose the padlock with its bowed bolt open the coracle is seen standing upright in the shed the lurcher not anywhere outside for the animal is within lying upon the hearth in front of a cheerful fire and before the same sits its master regarding a pot which hangs over it on hooks at intervals lifting off the lid and stirring the contents with a long-handled spoon of white metal what these are might be told by the aroma a stew smelling strongly of onions with game savour conjoined ground game at that for coracle is in the act of jugging a hare handier to no man than him were the recipe of mrs glass for he comes up to all its requirements even the primary and essential one knows how to catch his hare as well as cook it the stew is done dished and set steaming upon the table where already has been placed a plate the time-honoured willow pattern with a knife and two-pronged fork there is besides a jug of water a bottle containing brandy and a tumbler drawing his chair up coracle commences eating the hare is a young one a leveret he has just taken from the stubble tender and juicy delicious even without the red currant jelly he has not got and for which he does not care withal he appears but little to enjoy the meal and only eats as a man called upon to satisfy the cravings of hunger every now and then as the fork is being carried to his head he holds it suspended with the morsel of flesh on its prongs while listening to sounds outside at such intervals the expression upon his countenance is that of the keenest apprehension and as a gust of wind unusually violent drives a leafy branch in loud clout against the door he starts in his chair fancying it the knock of a policeman with his muffled truncheon this night the poacher is suffering from no ordinary fear of being summoned for game trespass with that all he could eat his leveret as composedly as if it had been regularly purchased and paid for but there is more upon his mind the dread of a writ being presented to him with shackles at the same time of being taken handcuffed to the county jail thence before a court of assize and finally to the scaffold he has reason to apprehend all this notwithstanding his deep cunning and the dexterity with which he accomplished his great crime a man must have witnessed it above the roar of the torrent mingling with the cries of the drowning girl as she struggled against it were shouts in a man's voice which he fancied to be that of father rogier from what he has since heard he is now certain of it the coroner's inquest at which he was not present but whose report has reached him puts that beyond doubt his only uncertainty is whether rogier saw him by the footbridge and if so to recognize him true the priest has nothing said of him at the quest for all he coracle has his suspicions now torturing him almost as much as if sure that he was detected tampering with the plank no wonder he eats his supper with little relish or that after every few mouthfuls he takes a swallow of the brandy with a view to keeping up his spirits withal he has no remorse when he recalls the hastily exchanged speeches he overheard upon garran hill with that more prolonged dialogue under the trysting tree the expression upon his features is not one of repentance but devilish satisfaction at the fell deed he has done not that his vengeance is yet satisfied it will not be till he have the other life that of jack wingate he has dealt the young waterman a blow which at the same time afflicts himself 
only by dealing a deadlier one will his own sufferings be relieved he has been long plotting his rival's death but without seeing a safe way to accomplish it and now the thing seems no nearer than ever this night farther off in his present frame of mind with the dread of the gallows upon it he would be too glad to cry quits and let wingate live starting at every swish of the wind he proceeds with his supper hastily devouring it like a wild beast and when at length finished he sets the dish upon the floor for the dog then lighting his pipe and drawing the bottle nearer to his hand he sits for a while smoking not long before being interrupted by a noise at the door this time no stroke of wind-tossed waif but a touch of knuckles though slight and barely audible the dog knows it to be a knock as shown by his behaviour dropping the half-gnawed bone and springing to its feet the animal gives out an angry growling its master has himself started from his chair and stands trembling there is a slit of a door at back convenient for escape and for an instant his eye is on it as though he had half a mind to make exit that way he would blow out the light were it a candle but cannot as it is the fire whose faggots are still brightly ablaze while thus undecided he hears the knock repeated this time louder and with the accompaniment of a voice saying open your door monsieur dick not a policeman then only the priest end of volume two chapter six volume two chapter seven of gwen wynn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Gwen Wynn, A Romance of the Why by Maine Reed. Volume 2, Chapter 7, A Mysterious Contract. Only the priest, muttered Coracle to himself, but little better satisfied than if it were the policeman. Giving the lurcher a kick to quiet the animal, he pulls back the bolt and draws open the door, as he does so, asking, That you, Father Rogier? C'est moi, answers the priest, stepping in without invitation. Ah, mon braconnier, you are having something nice for supper, judging by the aroma, ragout of hare. Hope I haven't disturbed you. Is it hare? It was, your reverence, a bit of leveret. Was? You finished then? It is all gone? It is. The dog had the remains of it, as you see. He points to the dish on the floor. I'm sorry at that, having rather a relish for leveret. It can't be helped, however. I wish I'd known you were coming. Dang the dog! No, no, don't blame the poor dumb brute. No doubt it too has a taste for hair, seeing it's half-hound. I suppose leverets are plentiful just now, and easily caught, since they can no longer retreat to the standing corn. Yes, your reverence, there be a good win of them about. In that case, if you should stumble upon one and bring it to my house, I'll have it jugged for myself. By the way, what have you got in that blackjack? it's brandy well monsieur dick i'll thank you for a mouthful will you take it neat or mix with a drop of water neat raw the night's that and the two raws will neutralize one another i feel chilled to the bones and a little fatigued toiling against the storm it be a fearsome night i wonder at your reverence being out exposing yourself in such weather all weathers are alike to me when duty calls just now i'm abroad on a little matter of business that won't brook delay business with me with you mon braconnier what may it be your reverence sit down and i shall tell you it's too important to be discussed standing the introductory dialogue does not tranquillize the poacher instead further intensifies his fears obedient he takes his seat one side the table the priest planting himself on the other the glass of brandy was in reach of his hand after a sip he resumes speech with the remark if i mistake not you are a poor man monsieur dempsey you ain't no ways mistaken about that father rogier and you'd like to be a rich one thus encouraged the poacher's face lights up a little smilingly he makes reply i can't say as i'd have any particular objection instead i'd like it wonderful well you can be if so inclined i'm ever so inclined as i've said but how you reverence in this hard workaday world tain't so easy to get rich for you easy enough no labour and not much more difficulty than transporting your coracle five or six miles across the meadows something to do with the coracle habit no twill need a bigger boat one that will carry three or four people do you know where you can borrow such or hire it i think i do i've a friend the name of rob trotter who's got such 
a boat he's lend it to me sure charter it if he doesn't never mind about the price i'll pay when might you want it your reverence on thursday night at ten or a little later say half past and where am i to bring it to the ferry you'll have it against the bank by the back of the chapel burying ground and keep it there till i come to you don't leave it to go up to the half or anywhere else and don't let anyone see either the boat or yourself if you can possibly avoid it as the nights are now dark at that hour there need be no difficulty in your rowing up the river without being observed above all you're to make no one the wiser of what you're to do or anything i'm now saying to you the service i want you for is one of a secret kind and not to be prattled about may i have a hint of what it is not now you shall know in good time when you meet me with the boat there will be another along with me maybe two to assist in the affair what will be required of you is a little dexterity such as you displayed on saturday night no need the emphasis on the last words to impress their meaning upon the murderer too well he comprehends starting in his chair as if a hornet had stung him how where he gasps out in the confusion of terror the double interrogatory is but mechanical and of no consequence hopeless any attempt at concealment or subterfuge as he is aware on receiving the answer cool and provokingly deliberate you have asked two questions monsieur dick that call for separate replies to the first how i leave you to grope out the answer for yourself feeling pretty sure you'll find it with the second i'll be more particular if you wish me place where a certain foot-plank bridges a certain brook close to the farmhouse of abigan it the plank i mean last saturday night a little after nine took a fancy to go drifting down the wye need i tell you who sent it richard dempsey the man thus interrogated looks more than confused horrified well-nigh crazed excitedly stretching out his hand he clutches the bottle half fills the tumbler with brandy and drinks it down at a gulp he almost wishes it were poison and would instantly kill him only after dashing the glass down does he make reply sullenly and in a hoarse husky voice i don't want to know one way or the other damn the plank what do i care you shouldn't blaspheme monsieur dick that's not becoming above all in the presence of your spiritual adviser however you're excited as i see which is in some sense an excuse i beg your reverence's pardon i was a bit excited about something he has calmed down a little at thought that things may not be so bad for him after all the priest's last words with his manner seem to promise secrecy still further quieted as the latter continues never mind about what we can talk of it afterwards as i've made you aware more than once if i rightly remember there's no sin so great but that pardon may reach it if repented and atoned for on thursday night you shall have an opportunity to make some atonement so be there with the boat i will your reverence sure as my name's richard dempsey i'd love him to be thus earnest in promising he can be trusted to come as if led in a string for he knows there is a halter around his neck with one end of it in the hand of father rogier enough returns the priest if there be anything else i think of communicating to you before thursday i'll come again to-morrow night so be at home meanwhile see to securing the boat don't let there be any failure about that coot and let me again enjoin silence not a word to any one even your friend rob verbum sapientibus but as you're not much of a scholar monsieur coracle i suppose my latin's lost on you putting it in your own vernacular i mean keep a close mouth if you don't wish to wear a necktie of material somewhat coarser than either silk or cotton you comprehend to the priest's satanical humour the poacher answers with a sickly smile i do father rogier perfectly that's sufficient and now mon braconnier i must be gone before starting out however i'll trench a little further on your hospitality just another drop to defend me from these chill equinoticals saying which he leans towards the table pours out a stoop of the brandy best cognac from the harp it is then quaffing it off bids bonsoir and takes departure having accompanied him to the door the poacher stands upon its threshold looking after reflecting upon what has passed anything but pleasantly never took he leave of a guest less agreeable true things are not quite so bad as he might have expected and had reason to anticipate and yet they are bad enough 
he is in the toils the tough strong meshes of the criminal net which at any moment may be drawn tight and fast around him and between policeman and priest there is little to choose for his own purposes the latter may allow him to live but it will be as the life of one who has sold his soul to the devil while thus gloomily cogitating he hears a sound which but makes still more sombre the hue of his thoughts a voice comes pealing up the glen a wild wailing cry as of someone in the extreme of distress he can almost fancy it the shriek of a drowning woman but his ears are too much accustomed to nocturnal sounds and the voices of the woods to be deceived that heard was only a little unusual by reason of the rough night its tone altered by the whistling of the wind bah he exclaims recognizing the call of the screech owl it's only one of them cursed brutes what a fool fear makes a man and with this hackneyed reflection he turns back into the house rebolts the door and goes to his bed not to sleep but lie long awake kept so by that same fear end of volume two chapter seven Volume Two, Chapter Eight of Gwen Wynn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amanda Friday. Gwen Wynn, A Romance of the Why, by Maine Reed. Chapter Eight The Game of Peak. The sun has gone down upon Gwen Wynne's natal day, its twenty-first anniversary, and Langorn Court is in a blaze of light, for a grand entertainment is there being given, a ball. The night is a dark one, but its darkness does not interfere with the festivities, instead heightens their splendor by giving effect to the illuminations, for although autumn, the weather is still warm, and the grounds are illuminated. Party-colored lamps are placed at intervals along the walks, and suspended in festoonery from the trees, while the casement windows of the house stand open, people passing in and out of them as if they were doors. The drawing-room is this night devoted to dancing, its carpet taken up, the floor made as slippery as a skating rink with beeswax. Abominable custom! Though a large apartment, it does not afford space for half the company to dance in, and to remedy this, supplementary quadrilles are arranged on the smooth turf outside a string and wind band from the neighboring town making music loud enough for all besides all do not care for the delightful exercise a sumptuous spread in the dining-room with wines at discretion attracts a proportion of the guests while there are others who have a fancy to go strolling about the lawn even beyond the coruscation of the lamps some who do not think it too dark anywhere but the darker the better the elite of at least half the shire is present, and Miss Linton, who is still the hostess, reigns supreme in fine exuberance of spirits. Being the last entertainment at Langorn, over which she is officially to preside, one might imagine she would take things in a different way. But as she is to remain resident at the court, with privileges but slightly, if at all, curtailed, she has no gloomy forecast of the future. Instead, on this night present she lives as in the past, almost fancies herself back at Cheltenham in its days of splendor, and dancing with the first gentleman in Europe, Redivivus. If her star be going down, it is going in glory, as the song of the swan is sweetest in its dying hour. Strange that on such a festive occasion, with its circumstances attendant, the old spinster, hitherto mistress of the mansion, should be happier than the younger one, hereafter to be. But in truth, so is it. Notwithstanding her great beauty and grand wealth, the latter no longer in perspective, but in actual possession. Despite the gaiety and grandeur surrounding her, the friendly greetings and warm congratulations received on all sides, Gwen Wynne is herself anything but gay, instead sad, almost to wretchedness. And from the most trifling of causes, though not as by her estimated, little suspecting she has but herself to blame. It has arisen out of an episode, in love's history of common and very frequent occurrence, the game of peaks. She and Captain Rycroft are playing it, with all the power and skill they can command. Not much of the last, for jealousy is but a clumsy fencer. Though accounted keen, it is often blind as love itself, and were not both under its influence, they would not fail to see through the flimsy deceptions they are mutually practicing on one another. In love with each other almost to distraction, 
they are this night behaving as though they were the bitterest enemies or at all events as friends sorely estranged she began it blamelessly even with praiseworthy motive which known to him no trouble could have come up between them but when touched with compassion for george shenstone she consented to dance with him several times consecutively and in the intervals remained conversing too familiarly as captain ryecroft imagined all this with an engagement ring on her finger by himself placed upon it not strange in him thus fiance feeling a little jealous no more that he should endeavour to make her the same strategy old as hills or hearts themselves in his attempt he is unfortunately too successful finding the means near by an assistant willing and ready to his hand this in the person of miss powell she also went to church on the sunday before in jack wingate's boat a young lady so attractive as to make it a nice point whether she or gwen wynne be the attraction of the evening though only just introduced the hussar officer is not unknown to her by name with some repute of his heroism besides his appearance speaks for itself making such impression upon the lady to set her pencil at work inscribing his name on her card for several dances round and square in rapid succession and so between him and gwen wynne the jealous feeling at first but slightly entertained is nursed and fanned into a burning flame the green-eyed monster growing bigger as the night gets later on both sides it reaches its maximum when miss wynne after a waltz leaning on george shenstone's arm walks out into the grounds and stops to talk with him in a retired shadowy spot not far off is captain ryecroft observing them but too far to hear the words passing between were he near enough for this it would terminate the strife raging in his breast as the sham flirtation he is carrying on with miss powell put an end to her new-sprung aspirations if she has any it does as much for the hopes of george shenstone long in abeyance but this night rekindled and revived beguiled first by his partner's amiability and so oft dancing with then afterwards using him as a foil he little dreams that he is but being made a cat's paw instead drawing courage from the deception emboldened as never before he does what he never dared before make gwen win a proposal of marriage he makes it without circumlution at a single bound as he would take a hedge upon his hunter gwen you know how i love you would give my life for you will you be only now he hesitates as if his horse balked be what she asks with no intention to help him over but mechanically her thoughts being elsewhere my wife she starts at the words touched by his manly way yet pained by their appealing earnestness and the thought she must give denying response and how is she to give it with least pain to him perhaps the bluntest way will be the best so thinking she says george it can never be look at that she holds out her left hand sparkling with jewels at what he asks not comprehending that ring she indicates a cluster of brilliance on the fourth finger by itself adding the word engaged oh god he exclaims almost in a groan is that so it is for a time there is silence her answer less maddening than making him sad with a desperate effort to resign himself he at length replies dear gwen for i must still call you ever hold you so my life hereafter will be as one who walks in darkness waiting for death ah longing for it despair has its poetry as love oft exceeding the last in fervour of expression and that of george shenstone causes surprise to gwen wynne while still further paining her so much she knows not how to make rejoinder and is glad when a fanfare of the band instruments gives note of another quadrille the lancers about to begin still engaged partners for the dance but not to be for life they return to the drawing-room and join in it he going through its figures with a sad heart and many a sigh nor is she less sorrowful only more excited nigh unto madness as she sees captain ryecroft v a v with miss powell on his face an expression of content calm almost cynical hers radiant as with triumph in this moment of gwen wynne's supreme misery acme of jealous spite were george shenstone to renew his proposal she might pluck the betrothal ring from her finger and give answer i will it is not to be so however weighty the consequence 
in the horoscope of her life there is yet a heavier. End of chapter 8 Recording by Amanda Friday Volume 2, Chapter 9 of Gwen Wynne This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amanda Friday Gwen Wynne A Romance of the Why by Maine Reed Chapter 9 Jealous as a Tiger It is a little after 2 a.m., and the ball is breaking up. Not a very late hour, as many of the people live at a distance, and have a long drive homeward over hilly roads. By the fashion prevailing a galop brings the dancing to a close. The musicians, slipping their instruments into cases and baize bags, retire from the room, soon after deserted by all, save a spare servant or two, who make the rounds to look to extinguishing the lamps, with a sharp eye for waifs in the shape of dropped ribbons or bazootery. Gentlemen guests stay longer in the dining-room, over claret and champagne cup, or the more time-honored B and S, while in the hallway there is a crush, and on the stairs a stream of ladies, descending cloaked and hooded. Soon the crowd waxes thinner, relieved by carriages called up, quickly filling, and whirled off. That of Squire Powell is among them, and Captain Rycroft, not without comment from certain officious observers, accompanies the young lady he has been so often dancing with, to the door. Having seen her off with the usual ceremonies of leave-taking, he returns into the porch, and there for a while remains. It is a large portico, with Corinthian columns, by one of which he takes stand, in shadow. But there is a deeper shadow on his own brow, and a darkness in his heart, such as he has never in his life experienced. He feels how he has committed himself, but not with any remorse or repentance. Instead, the jealous anger is still within his breast, ripe and ruthless as ever nor is it so unnatural. Here is a woman, not Miss Powell, but Gwen Wynne, to whom he has given his heart, acknowledged the surrender, and in return had acknowledgment of hers, not only this, but offered his hand in marriage, placed the pledge upon her finger, she assenting and accepting. And now, in the face of all, openly, and before his face, engaged in flirtation, it is not the first occasion for him to have observed familiarities between her and the son of Sir George Shenstone, trifling, it is true, but which gave him uneasiness. But to-night things have been more serious, and the pain caused him all imbuing and bitter. He does not reflect how he has been himself behaving. For to none more than the jealous lover is the big beam unobservable, while the little moat is sharply descried. He only thinks of her ill behavior, ignoring his own. If she has been but dissembling, coquetting with him, even that were reprehensible. Heartless, he deems it, sinister, something more, an indiscretion. Flirting while engaged, what might she do when married? He does not wrong her by such direct self-interrogation. The suspicion were unworthy of himself, as of her, and as yet he has not given way to it. Still, her conduct seems inexcusable, as inexplicable and to get explanation of it he now tarries, while others are hastening away. Not resolutely. Besides the half-sad, half-indignant expression upon his countenance, there is also one of indecision. He is debating within himself what course to pursue, and whether he will go off without bidding her good-bye. He is almost mad enough to be ill-mannered, and possibly, were it only a question of politeness, he would not stand upon or be stayed by it, but there is more the very same spiteful rage hinders him from going. He thinks himself aggrieved, and therefore justifiable in demanding to know the reason, to use a slang but familiar phrase, having it out. Just as he has reached this determination, an opportunity is offered him. Having taken leave of Miss Linton, he has returned to the door, where he stands hat in hand, his overcoat already on. Miss Wynne is now also there, bidding good night to some guests, intimate friends, who have remained till the last. As they move off, he approaches her. She, as if unconsciously, and by the merest chance, lingering near the entrance. It is all pretense on her part that she has not seen him dallying about, for she has several times, while giving congé to others of the company. Equally feigned her surprise, as she returns his salute, saying, "'Why, Captain Rycroft, I supposed you were gone long ago.' "'I am sorry, Miss Wynne, you should think me capable of such rudeness.' 
Captain Rycroft and Miss Wynne instead of Vivian and Gwen. It is a bad beginning, ominous of a worse ending. The rejoinder, almost a rebuke, places her at a disadvantage, and she says rather confusedly, Oh, certainly not, sir. But where there are so many people, of course one does not look for the formalities of leave-taking. True. And, availing myself of that, I might have been gone long since, as you supposed, but for— For what? A word I wish to speak with you. Alone. Can I? Oh, certainly. Not here, he asks suggestingly. She glances around. There are servants hurrying about through the hall, crossing and recrossing, with the musicians coming forth from the dining-room, where they have been making a clearance of the cold fowl, ham, and heel-taps. With quick intelligence comprehending, but without further speech, she walks out into the portico, he preceding. Not to remain there, where eyes would still be on them, and ears within hearing. She has an Indian shawl upon her arm, throughout the night carried while promenading, and again throwing it over her shoulders, she steps down upon the graveled sweep and on into the grounds. Side by side they proceed in the direction of the summer-house, as many times before, though never in the same mood as now. And never, as now, so constrained and silent, for not a word passes between them till they reach the pavilion. There is light in it, but a few hundred yards from the house it came in for part of the illumination, and its lamps are not yet extinguished, only burning feebly. She is the first to enter, he to resume speech, saying, There was a day, Miss Wynne, when standing on this spot, I thought myself the happiest man in Herefordshire. Now I know it was but a fancy, a sorry hallucination. I do not understand you, Captain Rycroft. Oh, yes, you do. Pardon my contradicting you. You've given me reason. Indeed, in what way? I beg, nay, demand explanation. You shall have it, though superfluous, I should think, after what has been passing, this night especially. Oh, this night especially. I supposed you so much engaged with Miss Powell as not to have noticed anything or anybody else. What was it, pray? You understand, I take it, without need of my entering into particulars. Indeed I don't, unless you refer to my dancing with George Shenstone. More than dancing with him, keeping his company all through. Not strange, that, seeing I was left so free to keep it. Besides, as I suppose you know, his father was my father's oldest and most intimate friend. She makes this avowal condescendingly, observing he is really vexed, and thinking the game of contraries has gone far enough. He has given her a sight of his cards, and with the quick subtle instinct of woman, she sees that among them Miss Powell is no longer chief trump. Were his perception keen as hers, their jealous conflict would now come to a close, and between them confidence and friendship, stronger than ever, be restored. Unfortunately it is not to be. Still miscomprehending, yet unyielding, he rejoins, sneeringly. And I suppose your father's daughter is determined to continue that intimacy with his father's son, which might not be so very pleasant to him who should be your husband. Had I thought of that when I placed a ring upon your finger? Before he can finish, she has plucked it off, and drawing herself up to full height, says in bitter retort, You insult me, sir! Take it back! With the words, the gemmed circlet is flung upon the little rustic table from which it rolls off. He has not been prepared for such abrupt issue, though his rude speech tempted it. Somewhat sorry, but still too exasperated to confess or show it, he rejoins, defiantly, If you wish it to end so, let it. Yes, let it. They part without further speech. He, being nearest the door, goes out first taking no heed of the diamond cluster which lies sparkling upon the floor. Neither does she touch, or think of it. Were it the Kohinoor, she would not care for it now. A jewel more precious, the one love of her life is lost, cruelly crushed. And with heart all but breaking, she sinks down upon the bench, draws the shawl over her face, and weeps till its rich silken tissue is saturated with her tears. The wild spasm passed, she rises to her feet, and stands leaning upon the baluster rail looking out and listening. Still dark, she sees nothing, but hears the stroke of a boat's oars in measured and regular repetition, listens on till the sound becomes indistinct, blending with the sough of the river, the sighing of the breeze, and the natural voices of the night. She may never hear his voice, never look on his face again. At the thought she exclaims, in anguished accent, This the ending! It is too— What she designed saying is not said. 
her interrupted words are continued into a shriek one wild cry then her lips are sealed suddenly as if stricken dumb or dead not by the visitation of god before losing consciousness she felt the embrace of brawny arms knew herself the victim of man's violence end of chapter nine recording by amanda friday Volume Two, Chapter Ten of Gwen Wynn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Stevens. Gwen Wynn, A Romance of the Why by Maine Reed. Volume Two, Chapter Ten. Stunned and Silent. Down in the boat dock, upon the thwarts of his skiff, sits the young waterman awaiting his fare. He has been up to the house, and there hospitably entertained, feasted. But with the sorrow of his recent bereavement still fresh, the revelry of the servants' hall had no fascination for him, instead only saddening the more. Even the blandishments of the French femme de chambre could not detain him, and fleeing them, he has returned to his boat long before he expects being called upon to use the oars. Seated, pipe in mouth, for Jack, too, indulges in tobacco, he is endeavouring to put in the time as well he can, irksome at best with that bitter grief upon him. And it is present all the while, with scarce a moment of surcease, his thoughts ever dwelling on her who is sleeping her last sleep in the burying ground at Rugg's Ferry. While thus disconsolately reflecting, a sound falls upon his ears, which claims his attention and for an instant or two occupies it. If anything, it was the dip of an oar, but so light that only one with ears well trained to distinguish noises of the kind could tell it to be that. He, however, has no doubt of it, muttering to himself, "'Wonder whose boat can be on the river this time of night? Morning, I ought to say. Wouldn't be a tourist party starting off so early? No, can't be that. Like enough Dick Dempsey out of salmon stealing." The night so dark, just the sort for the rascal to be about on his unlawful business. Whilst thus conjecturing, a scowl, dark as the night itself, flits over his own face. Yes, a coracle, he continues, must have been the plash of a paddle. If to been a regular boat sore, I'd a hear the thumping against the thole-pins. For once the waterman is in error. It is no paddle whose stroke he has heard, nor a coracle impelled by it but a boat rowed by a pair of oars. And why there is no thumping against the thole-pins is because the oars are muffled. Were he out in the main channel, two hundred yards above the byway, he would see the craft itself with three men in it, but only at that instant, as in the next it is headed into a bed of withies, flooded by the freshet, and pushed on through them to the bank beyond. Soon it touches terra firma, the men spring out, two of them going off towards the grounds of Langoran Court. The third remains by the boat. Meanwhile Jack Wingate, in his skiff, continues listening, but hearing no repetition of the sound that had so slightly reached his ear, soon ceases to think of it, again giving way to his grief, as he returns to reflect on what lies in the chapel cemetery. If he but knew how near the two things were together, the burying ground and the boat, he would not be long in his own. Relieved he is when at length voices are heard up at the house, calls for carriages, proclaiming the ball about to break up, still more gratified as the banging of doors and the continuous rumble of wheels tell of the company fast clearing off. For nigh half an hour the rattling is incessant, then there is a lull, and he listens for a sound of a different sort a footfall on the stone stairs that lead down to the little dock, that of his fare, who may at any moment be expected. Instead of footstep, he hears voices on the cliff above, off in the direction of the summer-house. Nothing to surprise him in that. It is not the first time he has listened to the same, and under very similar circumstances, for soon as hearing he recognises them. But it is the first time for him to note their tone as it is now, to his astonishment, that of anger. "'They be quarrelling, I declare,' he says to himself. "'Wonder what for? Something crooked's come between them at the ball.' 
Bit of jealousy, maybe? I shouldn't be surprised if it's about young Mr. Shenstone. Sure as eggs is eggs, the captain have ugly ideas concerning him. He needn't, though, and wouldn't if he see through the eyes of a sensible man. Of course, being deep in love, he can't. I seed it long ago. She be mad about him as he a were, if not madder. Well, I dare say it be only a lover's quarrel, and will soon blow over. Woe's me! I wish— He would say— I wish twere only that twixt myself and Mary. But the words break upon his lips, while a scolding tear trickles down his cheek. Fortunately, his anguished sorrow is not allowed further indulgence for the time. The footstep, so long listened for, is at length upon the boat-stair, not firm in its wonted way, but as though he making it were intoxicated. But Wingate does not believe it is that. He knows the captain to be abstemious, or at all events not greatly given to drink. He has never seen him overcome by it, and surely he would not be on this night in particular, unless, indeed, it may have to do with the angry speech overheard, or the something thought of preceding it. The conjectures of the waterman are brought to an end by the arrival of his fare at the bottom of the boat-stair, where he stops only to ask, "'Are you there, Jack?' The pitchy darkness accounts for the question. Receiving answer in the affirmative, he gropes his way along the ledge of the rock, reeling like a drunken man, not from drink, but the effects of that sharp, defiant rejoinder still ringing in his ears. He seems to hear, in every gust of the wind swirling down from the cliff above, the words, Yes, let it! He knows where the skiff should be, where it was left, beyond the pleasure-boat. The dock is not wide enough for both abreast, and to reach his own he must go across the other, make a gangplank of the Gwendolyn. As he sets foot upon the thwarts of the pleasure-craft, has he a thought of what were his feelings when he first planted it there, after ducking the forest of Dean fellow? Or, stepping off, does he spurn the boat with angry heel, as in angry speech he has done her whose name it bears? Neither. He is too excited and confused to think of the past, or aught but the black, bitter present. Still staggering, he drops down upon the stern sheets of the skiff, commanding the waterman to shove off. A command promptly obeyed, and in silence. Jack can see the captain is out of sorts, and suspecting the reason, naturally supposes that speech at such time might not be welcome. He says nothing, therefore, but, bending to his oars, pulls on up the byway. Just outside its entrance a glimpse can be got of the little pavilion, by looking back and Captain Rycroft does this over his shoulder, for, seated at the tiller, his face is from it. The light is still there, burning dimly as ever. For all, he is enabled to trace the outlines of a figure in shadowy silhouette, a woman standing by the baluster rail, as if looking out over it. He knows who it is. It can only be Gwen Wynne. Well were it for both, could he but know what she is at that moment thinking. If he did— Back would go his boat, and the two again be together, perhaps never more to part in spite. Just then, as if ominous, and in spiteful protest against such consummation, the sombre sandstone cliff draws between, and Captain Rycroft is carried onward, with heart dark and heavy as the rock. End of Volume 2, Chapter 10《ボリューム2 Chapter 11 of Gwen Wynne》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Stevens.《Gwen Wynne》A Romance of the Why by Maine Reed. Volume 2 Chapter 11 A Startling Cry During all this while Wingate has not spoken a word though he also has observed the same figure in the pavilion. With face that way he could not avoid noticing it, and easily guesses who she is. Had he any doubt, the behaviour of the other would remove it. "'Miss Wynne, for sartain,' he thinks to himself, but says nothing. Again turning his eyes upon his patron, he notes the distraught air, with head drooping, and feels the effect in having to contend against the rudder ill-directed but he forbears making remark. At such a moment his interference might not be tolerated, perhaps resented, and so the silence continues. Not much longer. A thought strikes the waterman, and he ventures a word about the weather. 
It is done for a kindly feeling, for he sees how the other suffers, but in part because he has reason for it. The observation is, "'We're going to have the biggest kind of rainpour, Captain.' The captain makes no immediate response. Still in the morose mood, communing with his own thoughts, the words fall upon his ear unmeaningly, as if from a distant echo. After a time it occurs to him that he has been spoken to, and asks, "'What did you observe, Wingate?' "'That there be a rainstorm threatening of the grandest sort. There's flood enough now, but afore long it'll be all over the meadows.' "'Why do you think that? I see no sign. The sky is very much clouded, true, but it has been just the same for the last several days. Taint the sky as tells me, Captain. What, then? The he-quall. The he-quall? Yes. It's been a-cacklin' all through the afternoon and evening, a special loud just as the sun were settin'. I never knowed it do that, ye out plenty o' wet comin' soon after. Rycroft's interest is aroused, and for the moment forgetting his misery, he says, "'You're talking enigmas, Jack. At least they are so to me. What is this barometer you seem to place such confidence in? Beast, bird, or fish? It be a bird, Cap'n. I believe the gentry folks call it a woodpecker, but bout here it be more generally known by the name Hequal. The orthography is according to Jack's orthopy, for there are various spellings of the word. Anyhow, he proceeds, it gives warning in a rain same as a weather-glass. When it had been laughing in the mad way it wore most part of this day, you may look out for a downpour. Besides, the owls have been a-doing their best, too. While I were waiting for ye in that darksome hole, one went sailing up and down the backwash, every now and then swishing close to my ear and gin a screech, as if I hadn't enough of the disagreeable to think of. They allus come that way when one's feeling out of sorts, just as if they wanted to make things worse. Hark! Do ye hear that, Cap'n? I did. They speak of a sound that has reached their ears from below, down the river. Both show agitation, but most the waterman, for it resembled a shriek as of a woman in distress. Distant, just as one he heard across the wooded ridge on that fatal night after parting with Mary Morgan. He knows now that must have been her drowning cry, and has often thought since whether, if aware of it at the time, he could have done aught to rescue her. Not strange that with such a recollection he is now greatly excited by a sound so similar. "'That weren't no he quoll, nor screech owl, neither,' he says, speaking in a half-whisper. "'What do you think it was?' asks the captain, also sotto voce. "'The scream of a female. I'm most sure to her that.' "'It certainly did seem a woman's voice. In the direction of the court, too. Yes, it come that way. I've half a mind to put back.' and see if there be anything amiss. What say you, Wingate? Gee the word, sir, I'm ready. The boatman has his oars out of the water, and holds them so. Rycroft still undecided. Both listen with bated breath. But, whether woman's voice or whatever the sound, they hear nothing more of it, only the monotonous ripple of the river, the wind mournfully sighing through the trees upon its banks, and a distant brattle of thunder, bearing out the portent of the bird. Like as not, says Jack, t'were some of them servant girls screeching in play, for having had a drop too much to drink. There's a Frenchy thing among em as were gone nigh three sheets in the wind before I left. I think, Captain, we may as well keep on. The waterman has an eye to the threatening rain, and dreads getting a wet jacket. But his words are thrown away, for meanwhile the boat, left to itself, has drifted downward, nearly back to the entrance of the byway, and they are once more within sight of the kiosk on the cliff. There all is darkness, no figure distinguishable. The lamps have burnt out or been removed by some of the servants. She has gone away from it, is Rycroft's reflection to himself. I wonder if the ring be still on the floor, or has she taken it with her? I'd give something to know that. Beyond he sees a light in the upper window of the house, that of a bedroom, no doubt. She may be in it, unrobing herself before retiring to rest, perhaps standing in front of a mirror, which reflects that form of magnificent outline he was once permitted to hold in his arms, thrilled by the contact, and never to be thrilled so again. Her face in the glass, what the expression upon it, sadness or joy? If the former she is thinking of him, if the latter of George Shenstone. As this reflection flits across his brain, the jealous rage returns, and he cries out to the waterman, "'Row back, Wingate!' 
Pull hard and let us home. Once more the boat's head is turned upstream, and for a long spell no further conversation is exchanged. Only now and then a word relating to the management of the craft, as between rower and steerer. Both have relapsed into abstraction, each dwelling on his own bereavement. Perhaps boat never carried two men with sadder hearts or more bitter reflections. Nor is there so much difference in the degree of their bitterness. The sweetheart, almost bride, who has proved false, seems to her lover not less lost than to hers she who has been snatched away by death. As the Mary runs into the slip of backwater, her accustomed mooring place, and they step out of her, the dialogue is renewed by the owner, asking, Will you want me in the morrow, Captain? No, Jack. How soon do you think? Excuse me for questioning, but young Mr. Powell have been here the day, to know if I could take him and a friend down the river all the way to the channel. It's for sea-fishing or duck-shooting or something of that sort, and they want to engage the boat most part of a week. But if you say the word, they must look out for somebody else. That be the reason of my asking when you need me again. Perhaps never. Oh, Captain, don't say that. Tain't as I care about the boat's hire or the big pay you've been giving me. Believe me, it ain't. You can have me and the Mary without a sixpence of expense, long as you like. But to think I'm never to row you again, that have vexed me dreadful. Maybe more than you give me credit for, Captain. More than I give you credit for? It couldn't, Jack. We've been too long together for me to suppose you actuated by mercenary motives. Though I may never need your boat again, or see yourself, don't have any fear of my forgetting you. And now, as a souvenir, and some slight recompense of your services, take this. The waterman feels a piece of paper pressed into his hand, its crisp rustle proclaiming it a banknote. It is a tenor, but in the darkness he cannot tell, and believing it only a fiver, still thinks it too much, for it is all extra of his fare. With a show of returning it, and indeed the desire to do so, he says protestingly, I can't take it, Captain. You have paid me too handsomely already. Nonsense, man. I haven't done anything of the kind. Besides, that isn't for Botar, nor yourself. Only a little do, sir, by way of present to the good dame inside the cottage. Asleep, I take it. That case I accept. But won't my mother be grieved to hear of you going away? She thinks so much of you, Captain. Will you let me wake her up? I'm sure she'd like to speak a part in word and thank you for this big gift. No, no, don't disturb the dear old lady. In the morning you can give her my kind regards and parting compliments. Say to her, when I return to Herefordshire, if I ever do, she shall see me. For yourself, take my word, should I ever again go rowing on this river, it will be in a boat called the Mary, pulled by the best waterman on the Wye. Modest though Jack Wingate be, he makes no pretense of misunderstanding the recondite compliment, but accepts it in its fullest sense, rejoining, I call it flattery, Captain, if it had come from anybody but you. But I know ye never talk nonsense, and that's just why I'd be so sad to hear ye say you're going off for good. I feel so bad about losing poor Mary. It makes it worse now losing you. Good night. The hussar officer has a horse, which has been standing in a little lean-to shed under saddle. The lugubrious dialogue has been carried on simultaneously with the bridling, and the good night is said as Rycroft springs up on his stirrup. Then, as he rides away into the darkness, and Jack Wingate stands listening to the departing hoof-stroke, at each repetition more indistinct, he feels indeed forsaken, forlorn. Only one thing in the world now worth living for, but one to keep him anchored to life, his aged mother. End of Volume 2, Chapter 11volume 2 chapter 12 of gwen win this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by paul stevens gwen win a romance of the why by main reed volume 2 chapter 12 making ready for the road having reached his hotel captain rycroft seeks neither rest nor sleep but stays awake for the remainder of the night. The first portion of his time he spends in gathering up his impedimenta, and packing. Not a heavy task. His luggage is light according to the simplicity of a soldier's wants, and as an old campaigner he is not longing making ready for the route. His fishing-tackle gun-case and portmanteau, 
with an odd bundle or two of miscellaneous effects, are soon strapped and corded, after which he takes a seat by a table to write out the labels. But now a difficulty occurs to him. The address. His name, of course. But what the destination? Up to this moment he has not thought of where he is going, only that he must go somewhere, away from the Y. There is no leith in that stream for memories like his. To his regiment he cannot return, for he has none now. Months since he ceased to be a soldier, having resigned his commission at the expiration of his leave of absence, partly in displeasure at being refused extension of it, but more because the attractions of the court and the grove had made those of the camp uncongenial. Thus his visit to Herefordshire has not only spoilt him as a salmon-fisher, but put an end to his military career. Fortunately he was not dependent on it, for Captain Rycroft is a rich man, and yet he has no home he can call his own, the ten latest years of his life having been passed in Hindostan. Dublin is his native place, but what would or could he now do there? His nearest relatives are dead, his friends few, his schoolfellows long since scattered, many of them as himself, waifs upon the world. Besides, since his return from India, he has paid a visit to the capital of the Emerald Isle, where, finding all so changed, he cares not to go back, at least for the present. Whither, then? One place looms upon the imagination, almost naturally as home itself, the metropolis of the world. He will proceed thither, though not there to stay, only to use it as a point of departure for another metropolis, the French one. In that focus and centre of gaiety and fashion, milestrom of dissipation, he may find some relief from his misery, if not happiness. Little hope has he, but it may be worth the trial, and he will make it. So determining, he takes up the pen, and is about to put London on the labels. But as an experienced strategist, who makes no move with undue haste and without due deliberation, he sits a while longer considering. Strange as it may seem, and a question for psychologist, a man thinks best upon his back. Better still with a cigar between his teeth, powerful help to reflection. Aware of this, Captain Rycroft lights a weed, and looks around him. He is in his sleeping apartment, where, besides the bed, there is a sofa, horsehair cushion and squab hard as stones, the orthodox hotel article. Along this he lays himself, and smokes away furiously spitefully, too, for he is not now thinking of either London or Paris. He cannot yet. The happy past, the wretched present, are too soul-absorbing to leave room for speculations of the future. The fond rage of love is still active within him. Is it to blight his life's bloom, leaving him an age all winters? Or is there yet a chance of reconciliation? Can the chasm which angry words have created be bridged over? No. Not without confession of error, abject humiliation on his part, which in his present frame of mind he is not prepared to make. Will not, could not. Never, he exclaims, plucking the cigar from between his lips, but soon returning it, to continue the train of his reflections. Whether from the soothing influence of the nicotine, or other cause, his thoughts after a time became more tranquillized, their hue sensibly changed, as betokened by some muttered words which escape him. After all, I may be wronging her. If so, may God forgive, as I hope he will pity me. For if so, I am less deserving forgiveness, and more to be pitied than she. As in ocean's storm, between the rough surging billows foam-crested, are spots of smooth water, so in thought's tempest are intervals of calm. It is during one of these he speaks as above, and continuing to reflect in the same strain, things, if not quite couleur de rose, assume a less repulsive aspect. Gwen Wynne may have been but dissembling, playing with him, and he would now be contented, ready, even rejoiced, to accept it in that sense, I to the abject humiliation that but the moment before he had so defiantly rejected. So reversed his sentiments now, modified from mad anger to gentle forgiveness, he is almost in the act of springing to his feet, tearing the straps from his packed paraphernalia, and letting all loose again. 
But just at this crisis he hears the town clock tolling six, and voices in conversation under his window. It is a hit of gossip between two stablemen, attaches of the hotel, an ostler and fly-driver. "'Ye had a big time last night at Langoran?' says the former, inquiringly. "'Aye, that ye may say,' returns the Jarvey, with a strongly accentuated hiccup, telling of heel-taps. "'Never knowed a bigger as help me. Wine running in rivers, as if t'was only table-beer, and the best kind o't, too. I'm so full of French champagne I feel most like bustin. She be a grand gal, that Miss Wynne, ain't she? Of course is, one of the grandest. But she ain't going to be a girl long. By what I heard them say in the servants' hall, she's soon to be broke into pair-horse harness. Will you? The son of Sir George Shenstone. A good match they'll make, I should say. Tighter chap than he never stepped inside this yard. Many's the time he's tipped me. There is more of the same sort, but Captain Rycroft does not hear it the men having moved off beyond earshot. In all likelihood he would not have listened had they stayed, for again he seems to hear those other words, that last spiteful rejoinder, Yes, let it. His own spleen returning, in all its keen hostility, he springs upon his feet, hastily steps back to the table, and writes on the slip of parchment, Mr. Vivian Rycroft, passenger to London, G.W.R., he cannot attach them till the ink gets dry, and while waiting for it to do so, his thoughts undergo still another revulsion, again leading him to reflect whether he may not be in the wrong and acting inconsiderately, rashly. In fine, he resolves on a course which had not hitherto occurred to him. He will write to her, not in repentance, nor any confession of guilt on his part. He is too proud, and still too doubting for that only a test letter to draw her out, and, if possible, discover how she too feels under the circumstances. Upon the answer, if he receive one, will depend whether it is to be the last. With pen still in hand, he draws a sheet of notepaper towards him. It bears the hotel stamp and name, so that he has no need to write an address, only the date. This done, he remains for a time considering, thinking what he should say. The larger portion of his manhood's life spent in camp under canvas, not the place for cultivating literary tastes or epistolatory style, he is at best an indifferent correspondent, and knows it. But the occasion supplies thoughts, and as a soldier accustomed to prompt brevity, he puts them down, quickly and briefly, as a campaigning dispatch. With this he does not wait for the ink to dry, but uses the blotter. He dreads another change of resolution. Folding up the sheet, he slips it into an envelope, on which he simply superscribes, Miss Wynne, Langoran Court. Then rings a bell, the hotel servants are now astir, and directs the letter to be dropped into the post-box. He knows it will reach her that same day, at an early hour, and its answer him, should one be vouchsafed, on the following morning. It might, that same night at the hotel, where he is now staying, but not the one to which he is going, as his letter tells, the Langham, London. And while it is being slowly carried by a pedestrian postman along hilly roads towards Langoran, he, seated in a first-class carriage of the GWR, is swiftly whisked towards the metropolis. End of Volume 2, Chapter 12《Volume Two, Chapter Thirteen of Gwen Wynn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Stevens. Gwen Wynn, A Romance of the Wye, by Maine Reed. Volume Two, Chapter Thirteen, A Slumbering Household. As calm succeeds a storm. So at Langoran Court on the morning after the ball there was quietude, up to a certain hour more than common. The domestics justifying themselves by the extra services of the preceding night lie late. Outside is stirring only the gardener with an assistant, at his usual work, and in the yard a stable help or two, looking after the needs of the horses. The more important functionaries of this department, coachman and head groom, still slumber 
dreaming of champagne bottles brought back to the servants' hall three parts full, with but half-demolished pheasants and other fragmentary delicacies. Inside the house things are on a parallel. There only a scullery and kitchen maid astir. The higher-class servitors, availing themselves of the license allowed, are still abed, and it is ten as butler, cook, and footman make their appearance, entering on their respective roles yawningly and with reluctance. There are two ladies' maids in the establishment, the little French demoiselle attached to Miss Linton, and an English damsel of more robust build, whose special duties are to wait upon Miss Wynne. The former lies late on all days, her mistress not requiring early manipulation, but the maid, native and to the manner born, is wont to be up betimes. This morning is an exception. After such a night of revelry slumber holds her enthralled, as in a trance, and she is abed late as any of the others, sleeping like a dormouse. As her dormitory window looks out upon the back yard, the stable clock, a loud striker, at length awakes her. Not in time to count the strokes, but a glance at the dial gives her the hour. While dressing herself she is in a flutter, fearing rebuke, not for having slept so late, but because of having gone to sleep so early. The dereliction of duty, about which she is so apprehensive, has reference to a spell of slumber antecedent, taken upon a sofa in her young mistress's dressing-room. There, awaiting Miss Wynne to assist in disrobing her after the ball, the maid dropped over and forgot everything, only remembering who she was and what her duties when too late to attend to them. Starting up from the sofa, and glancing at the mantel timepiece, she saw with astonishment its hands pointing to half-past four a.m. Reflection following Miss Gwynne must be in her bed by this. Wonder why she didn't wake me up. Rang no bell. Surely I'd have heard it. If she did and I hadn't answered, well, the dear young lady's just the sort not to make any ado about it. I suppose she thought I'd gone to my room, and didn't wish to disturb me. But how could she think that? Besides, she must have passed through here and seen me on the sofa. The dressing-room is an antechamber of Miss Wynne's sleeping apartment. She mightn't, though the contradiction suggested by the lamp burning low and dim. Still it is strange her not calling me, nor requiring my attendance. Gathering herself up, the girl stands for a while in cogitation. The result is a move across the carpeted floor in soft, stealthy step, and an ear laid close to the keyhole of the bedchamber door. Sound asleep. I can't go in now. Mustn't. I daren't awake her. Saying which, the negligent attendant slips off to her own sleeping-room, a flight higher, and in ten minutes after is herself once more in the arms of Morpheus, this time retained in them till released, as already said, by the tolling of the stable clock. Conscious of unpardonable remissness, she dresses in careless haste, any way to be in time for attendance on her mistress at morning toilet. Her first move is to hurry down to the kitchen, get the can of hot water, and take it up to Miss Wynne's sleeping-room, not to enter, but tap at the door and leave it. She does the tapping, and, receiving no response nor summons from inside, concludes that the young lady is still asleep and not to be disturbed. It is a standing order of the house, and pleased to be precise in its observance, never more than on this morning. She sets down the painted can, and hurries back to the kitchen, soon after taking her seat by a breakfast-table, unusually well spread, for the time to forget about her involuntary neglect of duty. The first of the family proper, appearing downstairs, is Eleanor Lees, she too much behind her accustomed time. Notwithstanding, she has to find occupation for nearly an hour before any of the others join her, and she endeavours to do this by perusing a newspaper which has come by the morning post. With indifferent success. It is a metropolitan daily, having but little in it to interest her, or indeed any one else, almost barren of news, as if its columns were blank. Three or four long-winded leaders, the impertinent outpourings of irresponsible anonymity, reports of parliamentary speeches, for fifth of them not worth reporting, chatter of sham statesmen with their drivelings at public dinners, police intelligence, 
in which there is half a column devoted to Daniel Driscoll of the Seven Dials, how he blackened the eye of Bridget Sullivan and bit off Pat Kavanagh's ears, a crim con or two in all their prurience of detail. Court intelligence, with its odious plush and petty paltriness, this is the pabulum of a London daily, even the leading one supplies to its easily satisfied clientele of readers. Scarce a word of the world's news, scarce a word to tell of its real life and action, how beats the pulse or thrills the heart of humanity. If there be anything in England half a century behind the age, it is its metropolitan press, immeasurably inferior to the provincial. No wonder the companion, educated lady, with only such a sheet for her companion, cannot kill time for even so much as an hour. Ten minutes were enough to dispose of all its contents worth glancing at. And after glancing at them, Miss Lees drops the bald broadsheet, letting it fall to the floor to be scratched by the claws of a playful kitten, about all it is worth. Having thus settled scores with the newspaper, she hardly knows what next to do. She has already inspected the superscription of the letters to see if there be any for herself. A poor, fortuneless girl, of course her correspondence is limited, and there is none. Two or three for Miss Linton, with quite half a dozen for Gwen. Of these last is one in a handwriting she recognises, knows it to be from Captain Rycroft, even without the hotel stamp to aid identification. There was a coolness between them last night, remarks Miss Lees to herself, if not an actual quarrel, to which very likely this letter has reference. If I were given to making wages, I'd bet that it tells of his repentance. So soon, though, it must have been written after he got back to his hotel, and posted to catch the early delivery. What? she exclaims, taking up another letter and scanning the superscription. One from George Shenstone, too. It, I dare say, is in a different strain, if that I saw. Ha! she ejaculates, instinctively turning to the window, and letting go Mr. Shenstone's epistle. William, is it possible so early? Not only possible, but an accomplished fact. The reverend gentleman is inside the gates of the park, sauntering on towards the house. She does not wait for him to ring the bell or knock, but meets him at the door, herself opening it. Nothing outré in the act, on a day succeeding a night, with everything upside down, and the domestic, whose special duty it is to attend to door opening, out of the way. Into the morning-room Mr. Musgrave is conducted, where the table is set for breakfast. He oft comes for luncheon, and Miss Lees knows he will be made equally welcome to the earlier meal, all the more to-day, with its heavier budget of news and grander details of gossip, which Miss Linton will be expecting and delighted to revel in. Of course the curate has been at the ball, but, like Slippery Sam, erst Bishop of Oxford, not much in the dancing-room for all he, too, has noticed certain peculiarities in the behaviour of Miss Wynne to Captain Rycroft, with others having reference to the son of Sir George Shenstone. In short, a triangular play he but ill understood. Still he could tell by the straws as they blew about that they were blowing adversely, though what the upshot he is yet ignorant, having, as became his cloth, forsaken the scene of revelry at a respectably early hour. Nor does he now care to inquire into it, any more than Miss Lees to respond to such interrogation. Their own affair is sufficient for the time, and engaging in an amorous duel of the milder type, so different from the stormy passionate combat between Gwendolyn Wynne and Vivian Rycroft, they forget all about these, even their existence, as little remembering that of George Shenstone. For a time are but two individuals in the world of whom either has a thought. One Eleanor Lease, the other William Musgrave. End of Volume 2, Chapter 13。Volume 2, Chapter 14 of Gwen Wynne。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Stevens. Gwen Wynne, A Romance of the Why, by Maine Reed. Volume 2, Chapter 14. Where's Gwen? 
Not for long are the companion and curate permitted to carry on the confidential dialogue in which they had become interested. Too disagreeably soon it is interrupted by a third personage appearing upon the scene. Miss Linton has at length succeeded in dragging herself out of the embrace of somnolent divinity, and enters the breakfast-room supported by her French femme de chambre. Graciously saluting Mr. Musgrave, she moves towards the table's head, where an antique silver urn sends up its curling steam, flanked by tea and coffee-pot, with contents already prepared for pouring into their respectively shaped cups. Taking her seat, she asks, "'Where's Gwen?' "'Not down yet,' meekly responds Miss Lees. "'At least I haven't seen anything of her.' "'Ah, she beats us all to-day,' remarks the ancient toast of Cheltenham. "'In being late,' she adds, with a laugh at her little jeu d'esprit. "'Usually such an early riser, too. "'I don't remember having ever been up before her.' "'Well, I suppose she's fatigued, poor thing, quite done up. "'No wonder, after dancing so much, and with everybody.' "'Not everybody, aunt,' says her companion, "'with a significant emphasis on the everybody. "'There was one gentleman she never danced with all the night. "'Wasn't it a little strange?' "'This in a whisper and aside. "'Ah, true. You mean Captain Rycroft?' "'Yes. It was a little strange.' I observed it myself. She seemed distant with him, and he with her. Have you any idea of the reason, Nelly? Not in the least. Only I fancy something must have come between them. The usual thing. Lover's tiff, I suppose. Ah, I've seen a great many of them in my time. How silly men and women are, when they're in love. Are they not, Mr. Musgrave? The curate answers in the affirmative but somewhat confusedly, and blushing, as he imagines it may be a thrust at himself. "'Of the two, proceeds the garrulous spinster, "'men are the most foolish under such circumstances.' "'No,' she exclaims, contradicting herself. "'When I think of it, no. "'I have seen ladies, high-born and with titles, "'half beside themselves, about Beau Brummel, "'distractedly quarrelling as to which should dance with him.' Beau Brummel, who ended his days in a low lodging-house. Ha, ha, ha! There is a soupçon of spleen in the tone of Miss Linton's laughter, as though she had herself once felt the fascinations of the redoubtable dandy. What could be more ridiculous? she goes on. When one looks back upon it, the very extreme of absurdity. Well, taking hold of the cafetiere and filling her cup, it's time for that young lady to be downstairs. If she hasn't been lying awake ever since the people went off, she should be well rested by this. Bless me! glancing at the ormolu dial over the mantel. It's after eleven. Clarisse, to the femme de chambre, still in attendance, tell Miss Wynne's maid to say to her mistress we're waiting breakfast. Vite! Très vite! she concludes, with a pronunciation and accent anything but Parisian. Off trips the French demoiselle, and upstairs, almost instantly returning down them, Miss Wynne's maid along, with a report which startles the trio at the breakfast-table. It is the English damsel who delivers it in the vernacular. "'Miss Gwen isn't in her room, nor hasn't been all the night long.' Miss Linton is in the act of removing the top from a guinea-fowl's egg, as the maid makes the announcement. Were it a bomb bursting between her fingers, the surprise could not be more sudden or complete. Dropping egg and cup in stark astonishment, she demands, "'What do you mean, Gibbons?' Gibbons is the girl's name. "'Oh, ma'am, just what I've said. Say it again. I can't believe my ears. That Miss Gwen hasn't slept in her room. And where has she slept? The goodness only knows. But you ought to know.' You're her maid. You undressed her. I did not. I am sorry to say, stammered out the girl, confused and self-accused. Very sorry I didn't. And why didn't you, Gibbons? Explain that. Thus brought to book, the peccant Gibbons confesses to what has occurred in all its details. No use concealing aught. It must come out anyhow. 
"'And you're quite sure she has not slept in her room?' interrogates Miss Linton, as yet unable to realise a circumstance so strange and unexpected. "'Oh, yes, ma'am. The bed hasn't been lied upon by anybody, neither sheets or coverlet disturbed, and there's her nightdress over the chair, just as I laid it out for her.' "'Very strange!' exclaims Miss Linton. "'Positively alarming!' For all, the old lady is not alarmed yet, at least not to any great degree. Langoran Court is a house of many mansions, and can boast of a half-score spare bedrooms, and she, now its mistress, is a creature of many caprices. Just possible she has indulged in one after the dancing, entered the first sleeping apartment that chanced in her way, flung herself on a bed or sofa in her ball-dress, fallen asleep, and is there still slumbering. "'Search them all!' commands Miss Linton, addressing a variety of domestics, whom the ringing of bells has brought around her. They scatter off in different directions, Miss Lees along with them. "'It's very extraordinary, don't you think so?' This to the curate, the only one remaining in the room with her. "'I do, decidedly. Surely no harm has happened her. I trust not. How could there?' "'True, how?' Still, I'm a little apprehensive, and won't feel satisfied till I see her. How my heart does palpitate, to be sure!" She lays her spread palm over the cardiac region, with an expression less of pain than the affectation of it. "'Well, Elna,' she calls out to the companion, re-entering the room with Gibbons behind, "'what news?' "'Not any, aunt. And you really think she hasn't slept in her room?' "'Almost sure she hasn't. The bed, as Gibbons told you, has never been touched, nor the sofa. Besides, the dress she wore last night isn't there. Nor anywhere else, ma'am, puts in the maid, about such matters specially intelligent. As you know, twas the sky-blue silk, with blonde lace overskirt and flower de luce on it. I've looked everywhere and can't find a thing she had on, not so much as a ribbon. The other searchers are now returning in rapid succession, all with a similar tale. No word of the missing one neither sign nor trace of her. At length the alarm is serious and real, reaching fever height. Bells ring and servants are sent in every direction. They go rushing about, no longer confining their search to the sleeping apartments, but extending it to rooms where only lumber has place, to cellars almost unexplored, garrets long unvisited everywhere. Closet and cupboard doors are drawn open, Screens dashed aside, and panels parted, with keen glances sent through the chinks. Just as in the baronial castle, and on that same night when young Lovell lost his own fair bride. And while searching for their young mistress, the domestics of Langoran Court have the romantic tale in their minds. Not one of them but knows the fine old song of the mistletoe bough, male and female, all have heard it sung in that same house at every Christmas tide, under the kissing bush, where the pale green branch and its waxen berries were conspicuous. It needs not the mystic memory to stimulate them to zealous exertion. Respect for their young mistress, with many of them almost adoration, is enough, and they search as if for sister, wife, or child, according to their feelings and attachments. In vain all in vain, though certain that no old oak chest inside the walls of Langoran Court encloses a form destined to become a skeleton, they cannot find Gwen Wynne. Dead or living, she is not in the house. End of Volume 2, Chapter 14《Volume 2, Chapter 15 of Gwen Wynne this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Stevens. Gwen Wynne, A Romance of the Why, by Maine Reed. Volume 2, Chapter 15. Again the Engagement Ring. The first hurried search, with its noisy excitement, proving fruitless, there follows an interregnum, calmer with suspended activity. Indeed, Miss Linton directs it so. Now convinced that her niece has really disappeared from the place, she thinks it prudent to deliberate before proceeding further. 
She has no thought that the young lady has acted otherwise than of her own will. To suppose her carried off is too absurd, a theory not to be entertained for an instant. And having gone so, the questions are why and whither. After all, it may be that at the ball's departing, in the last moment when the guests were departing, moved by a mad prank, she leaped into the carriage of some lady friends and was whirled home with them, just in the dress she had been dancing in. With such an impulsive creature as Gwen Wynne, the freak was not improbable. Nor is there anyone to say nay. In the bustle and confusion of departure, the other domestics were busy with their own affairs, and Gibbons sound asleep. And if true, a hue and cry raised and reaching the outside world would at least beget ridicule, if it did not cause absolute scandal. To avoid this, the servants are forbidden to go beyond the confines of the court, or carry any tale outward, for the time. Beguiled by this hopeful belief, Miss Linton, with the companion assisting, scribbles off a number of notes, addressed to the heads of three or four families, in whose houses her niece must have so abruptly elected to take refuge for the night. Merely to ask if such was the case, the question couched in phrase guarded and as possible suggestive. These are dispatched by trusted messengers cautioned to silence, Mr. Musgrave himself volunteering a round of calls at other houses to make personal inquiry. This matter settled, the old lady waits the result, though without any very sanguine expectations of success. For another theory has presented itself to her mind, that Gwen has run away with Captain Rycroft. Improbable as the thing might appear, Miss Linton nevertheless for a while has faith in it. It was as she might have done some forty years before, had she but met the right man, such as he and measuring her niece by the same romantic standard, with Gwen's capriciousness thrown into the account, she ignores everything else, even the absurdity of such a step from its sheer causelessness. That to her is of little weight, no more the fact of the young lady taking flight in a thin dress, with only a shawl upon her shoulders. For Gibbons, called upon to give account of her wardrobe, has taken stock, and found everything in its place every article of her mistress's drapery, save the blue silk dress and Indian shawl. Hats and bonnets hung up or in their boxes, but all there, proving her to have gone off bareheaded. Not the less natural reasons Miss Linton, instead only a component part in the chapter of contrarieties. So, too, the coolness observed between the betrothed sweethearts throughout the preceding night, their refraining from partnership in the dances, all dissembling on their part, possibly to make the surprise of the after-event more piquant and complete. So runs the imagination of the novel-reading spinster, fresh and fervid as in her days of girlhood, passing beyond the trammels of reason, leaving the bounds of probability. But her new theory is short-lived. It receives a death-blow from a letter which Miss Lees brings under her notice. It is that superscribed in the handwriting of Captain Rycroft, which the companion had for the time forgotten, she having no thought that it would have anything to do with the young lady's disappearance. And the letter proves that he can have nothing to do with it. The hotel stamp, the postmark, the time of deposit and delivery are all understood, all contributing to show it must have been posted, if not written, that same morning. Were she with him, it would not be there. Down goes the castle of romance Miss Linton had been constructing, wrecked, scattered as a house of cards. It is quite possible that letter contains something that would throw light upon the mystery, perhaps clear it all up, and the old lady would like to open it. But she may not, dare not. Gwen Wynne is not one to allow tampering with her correspondence, and as yet her aunt cannot realise the fact, nor even entertain the supposition, that she is gone for good and for ever. As time passes, however, and the different messengers return, with no news of the missing lady, Mr. Musgrave is also back without tidings, the alarm is renewed, and search again set up. It extends beyond the precincts of the house, and the grounds already explored, off into woods and fields, along the banks of river and bywash, everywhere that offers a likelihood, the slightest, of success but neither in wood, spinney, or coppice can they find traces of Gwen Wynne, 
all draw blank, as George Shenstone would say, of a cover where no fox is found. And just as this result is reached, that gentleman himself steps upon the ground, to receive a shock such as he has rarely experienced. The news communicated is a surprise to him, for he has arrived at the court, knowing naught of the strange incident which has occurred. He has come thither on an afternoon call, not altogether dictated by ceremony. Despite all that has passed, what Gwen Wynne told him, what she showed holding up her hand, he does not even yet despair. Who so circumstanced ever does? What man in love, profoundly, passionately, as he, could believe his last chance eliminated, or have his ultimate hope extinguished? He had not. Instead, when bidding adieu to her, after the ball, he felt some revival of it, several causes having contributed to its rekindling. Among others, her gracious behaviour to himself, so gratifying, but more her distant manner towards his rival, which he could not help observing, and saw with secret satisfaction. And still thus reflecting on it, he enters the gates at Langoran, to be stunned by the strange intelligence there awaiting him. Miss Wynne missing, gone away, run away, perhaps carried off, lost and cannot be found. For in these varied forms, and like variety of voices, is it conveyed to him. Needless to say, he joins in the search with ardour, but distractedly, suffering all the sadness of a torn and harrowed heart, but to no purpose, no result to soothe or console him. His skill at drawing a cover is of no service here. It is not for a fox stole away, leaving hot scent behind. But a woman goes without print of foot or trace to indicate the direction, without word left to tell the cause of departure. Withal, George Shenstone continues to seek for her long after the others have desisted, for his views differ from those entertained by Miss Linton, and his apprehensions are of a keener nature. He remains at the court throughout the evening, making excursions into the adjacent woods, searching and again exploring everywhere. None of the servants think it strange. All know of his intimate relations with the family. Mr. Musgrave remains also. Both of them ask to stay dinner. A meal this day eaten sans façon, in haste, and under agitation. When, after it, the ladies retire to the drawing-room, the curate along with them, George Shenstone goes out again, and over the grounds. It is now night, and the darkness lures him on, for it was in such she disappeared. And although he has no expectation of seeing her there, some vague thought has drifted into his mind, that in darkness he may better reflect, and something be suggested to avail him. He strays on to the boat-stair, looks down into the dock, and there sees the Gwendolen at her moorings. But he thinks only of the other boat, which, as he now knows, on the night before lay alongside her. Has it indeed carried away Gwen Wynne? He fancies it has. He can hardly have a doubt of it. How else is her disappearance to be accounted for? But has she been borne off by force, or went she willingly? These are the questions which perplex him, the conjectured answer to either causing him keenest anxiety. After remaining a short while on the top of the stair, he turns away with a sigh, and saunters on towards the pavilion. Though under the shadow of its roof the obscurity is complete, he nevertheless enters and sits down. He is fatigued with the exertions of the afternoon, and the strain upon his nerves through the excitement. Taking a cigar from his case and nipping off the end, he rasps a fusée to light it. But before the blue fizzing blaze dims down, he drops the cigar, to clutch at an object on the floor, whose sparkle has caught his eye. He succeeds in getting hold of it, though not till the fusée has ceased flaming. But he needs no light to tell him what he has in his hand. He knows it is that which so pained him to see on one of Gwen Wynne's fingers, the engagement ring. End of Volume 2, Chapter 15— Volume 2, Chapter 16 of Gwen Wynne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gwen Wynne, A Romance of the Wye, by Maine Reed. 
Chapter Sixteen A Mysterious Embarkation Not in vain had the green woodpecker given out its warning note. As Jack Wingate predicted from it, soon after came a downpour of rain. It was raining as Captain Rycroft returned to his hotel, as at intervals throughout that day, and now on the succeeding night, it is again sluicing down as from a shower bath. The river is in full flood, its hundreds of affluents from Plinlimmon downward, having each contributed its quota, till Varga, usually so pure, limpid and tranquil, rolls on in vast turbulent volume, muddy and maddened. There is a strong wind as well, whose gusts now and then striking the water's surface lash it into furrows with white frothy crests on the why this night there would be danger for any boat badly manned or unskilfully steered and yet a boat is about to embark upon it one which throughout the afternoon has been lying moored in a little branch stream that runs in opposite the lands of langoran a tributary supplied by the dingle in which stands the dwelling of richard dempsey it is the same near whose mouth the poacher and the priest were seen by Gwen Wynne and Eleanor Lees on the day of their remarkable adventure with the forest roughs, and almost in the same spot is the craft now spoken of, no coracle, however, but a regular pair-oared boat of a kind in common use among Y watermen. It is lying with bow to the bank, its painter attached to a tree, whose branches extend over it. During the day no one has been near it, and it is not likely that any one has observed it. Some little distance up the brook, and drawn well in under the spreading boughs, that almost touching the water, darkly shadow the surface, it is not visible from the river's channel, while along the edge of the rivulet there is no thoroughfare, nor path of any kind, no more a landing place where both is accustomed to put in or remain at moorings. That now there has evidently been brought thither for some temporary purpose not till after the going down of the sun is this declared then just as the purple of twilight is changing to the inky blackness of night and another dash of rain clatters on the already saturated foliage three men are seen moving among the trees that grow thick along the streamlet's edge they seem not to mind it although pouring down in torrents for they have come through the dell as from dempsey's house and are going in the direction of the boat where there is no shelter but if they regard not getting wet something they do regard else why should they observe such caution in their movements and talk in subdued voices all the more strange this in a place where there is so little likelihood of their being overheard or encountering any one to take note of their proceedings it is only between two of them that conversation is carried on the third walking far in advance beyond ear shot of speech in the ordinary tone besides the noise of the tempest would hinder his hearing them therefore it cannot be on his account they converse guardedly more likely their constraint is due to the solemnity of the subject for solemn it is as their words show they'll be sure to find the body in a day or two possibly to-morrow or if not very soon a good deal will depend on the state of the river if this flood continue and the water remain discoloured as now it may be several days before they light on it no matter when your course is clear monsieur murdoch but what do you advise my doing pair i'd like you to lend me your counsel give me minute directions about everything in the first place then you must show yourself on the other side of the water and take an active part in the search such a near relative as you are twould appear strange if you didn't all the world may not be aware of the little tiff rather prolonged though that's between you and if it were your keeping away on such an occasion would give cause for greater scandal spite so rancorous that of itself should excite curious thoughts suspicions naturally enough a man whose own cousin is mysteriously missing not caring to know what has become of her and when knowing when found drowned as she will be not to show either sympathy or sorrow ma foi they might mob you if you didn't that's true enough grunts murdoch thinking of the respect in which his cousin is held and her great popularity throughout the neighbourhood you advise my going over to Langoran? Decidedly, I do. Present yourself there to-morrow without fail. You may make the hour reasonably late, saying that the sinister intelligence has only just reached you at Glingog, out of the way as it is. You'll find plenty of people at the court on your arrival. From what I've learnt this afternoon, through my informant resident there, they'll be hot upon the search to-morrow. It would have been more earnest to-day, but for that quaint old creature with her romantic notions. The latest of them, as Clarice tells me, that Mademoiselle had run away with the hussar. 
but it appears a letter has reached the court in his handwriting which put a different construction on the affair proving to them it could be no elopement at least with him under these circumstances then to-morrow morning soon as the sun is up there'll be a hue and cry all over the country so loud you couldn't fail to hear and will be expected to have a voice in it to do that effectually you must show yourself at langoran and in good time there's sense in what you say you're a very solemn father rogier i'll be there trust me is there anything else you think of the jesuit is for a time silent apparently in deep thought it is a ticklish game the two are playing and needs careful consideration with cautious action yes he at length answers there are a good many other things i think of but they depend upon circumstances not yet developed by which you will have to be guided and you must guide yourself monsieur as you best can it will be quite four days if not more ere i can get back they may even find the body to-morrow if they should think of employing drags or other searching apparatus still i fancy twill be some time before they come to a final belief in her being drowned don't you on any account suggest it and should there be such search endeavour in a quiet way to have it conducted in any direction but the right one the longer before fishing the thing up the better it will be for our purposes you comprehend i do when found as it must be in time you will know how to show becoming grief and if opportunity offer you may throw out a hint having reference to le capitaine rycroft his having gone away from his hotel this morning no one knows why or whither decamping in such haste too that will be sure to fix suspicion upon him possibly have him pursued and arrested as the murderer of miss wynne odd succession of events is it not it is indeed seems as if the very fates were in a conspiracy to favour our design if we fail now twill be our own fault and that reminds me there should be no waste of time must not one hour of this darkness may be worth an age or at all events ten thousand pounds per annum allons feet feet he steps briskly onward drawing his caped cloak closer to protect him from the rain now running in rivers down the drooping branches of the trees murdoch follows and the two delayed by a dialogue of such grave character draw close to the third who had gone ahead they do not overtake him however till after he has reached the boat and therein deposited a bundle he has been bearing of weight sufficient to make him stagger where the ground was rough and uneven it is a package of irregular oblong shape and such size that laid along the boat's bottom timbers it occupies most part of the space forward of the mid thwart seeing that he who has thus disposed of it is coracle dick one might believe it poached salmon or land game now in season in the act of being transported to some receiver of such commodities but the words spoken by the priest as he comes up for disbelief they are an interrogatory well mon braconniere have you stowed my luggage it's in the boat father rogier and all ready for starting the minute your reverence steps in so well and now monsieur he adds turning to murdoch and again speaking in undertone if you play your part skilfully on return i may find you in a fair way of getting installed as the lord of langoran till then adieu saying which he steps over the boat's side and takes seat in its stern shoved off by sinewy arms it goes brushing out from under the branches and is rapidly drifted down towards the river lou and murdoch is left standing on the brook's edge free to go what way he wishes soon he starts off not on return to the empty domicile of the poacher nor yet direct to his own home but first to the welsh harp there to gather the gossip of the day and learn whether the startling tale soon to be told has yet reached rugg's ferry end of chapter sixteen volume two chapter seventeen of gwen wynne this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org gwen wynne a romance of the why by main reed chapter seventeen an anxious wife inside glingog house is mrs murdoch alone or with only the two female domestics but these are back in the kitchen while the ex cocotte is moving about in front at intervals opening the door and gazing out into the night a dark stormy one for it is the same in which has occurred the mysterious embarkation of father rogier only an hour later to her no mystery she knows whither the priest is bound and on what errand 
it is not him therefore she is expecting but her husband to bring home word that her countryman has made a safe start so anxiously does she await this intelligence that after a time she stays altogether on the doorstep regardless of the raw night and a fire in the drawing-room which blazes brightly there is another in the dining-room and a table profusely spread set out for supper with dishes of many kinds cold ham and tongue fowl and game flanked by decanters of different wines sparkling attractively whence all this plenty was in walls where of late and for so long has been such scarcity as no one visits at glingog save father rogier there is no one but he to ask the question and he would not were he there knowing the answer better than any one else he ought the cheer upon lewin murdoch's table with a cheerfulness observable on mrs murdoch's face are due to the same cause by himself brought about or to which he has largely contributed as moses lends money on post obits at sixty per cent with other expectations a stream of that leaven has found its way into the ancient manor house of glingog conducted thither by gregoire rogier who has drawn it from a source of supply provided for such eventualities and seemingly inexhaustible the treasury of the vatican yet only a tiny rivulet of silver but soon if all goes well to become a flood of gold grand and yellow as that in the wye itself having something to do with the waters of this same stream no wonder there is now brightness upon the face of olymp renault so long shadowed the sun of prosperity is again to shine upon the path of her life splendour gaiety volupte be hers once more and more than ever as she stands in the door of glingog looking down the river at langoran and through the darkness sees the court with only one or two windows alight they but in dim glimmer she reflects less on how they blazed the night before with lamps over the lawn like constellations of stars than how they will flame hereafter and ere long when she herself be the ruling spirit and mistress of that mansion but as the time passes and no husband home a cloud steals over her features from being only impatient she becomes nervously anxious still standing in the doorway she listens for footsteps she has oft heard making approach unsteadily little caring not so to-night she dreads to see him return intoxicated though not with any solicitude of the ordinary woman's kind but for reasons purely prudential these are manifested in her muttered soliloquy gregoire must have got off long ere this at least two hours ago he said they'd set out soon as it came night half an hour was enough for my husband to return up the meadows home if he has gone to the ferry first and sets to drinking in the harp say au beige maudit there's no knowing what he may do or say saying would be worse than doing a word in his cups a hint of what has happened might undo everything draw danger upon us all and such danger the prix de corps mon dieu her cheek blanches at thought of the ugly spectres thus conjured up surely he will not be so stupid so insane sober he can keep secrets well enough guard them closely like most of his countrymen but the cognac hark footsteps his i hope she listens without stirring from the spot the tread is heavy with now and then a loud stroke against stones were her husband a frenchman it would be different but lewin murdoch like all english country gentlemen affects substantial footgear and the step is undoubtedly his not as usual however to-night firm and regular telling him to be sober he isn't such a fool after all her reflection followed by the inquiry called out c'est vous mon man of course it is who else could it be you don't expect the father our only visitor to-night you'll not see him for several days to come he's gone then two hours ago by this he should be miles away unless he and coracle have had a capsize and been spilled out of their boat not unlikely occurrence with the river running so madly she still shows unsatisfied though not from any apprehension of the boats being upset she is thinking of what may have happened at the welsh harp for the long interval since the priest's departure her husband could only have been there she is less anxious however seeing the state in which he presents himself so unusual coming from the auberge maudite two hours ago they got off you say about that just as it was dark enough to set out with safety and no chance of being observed they did so oh yes le bagage bien arrangé parfaitement or as we say in english neat as a trivet if you prefer another form nice as ninepence 
she is pleased at his facetiousness quite a new mode for lewin murdoch coupled with his sobriety it gives her confidence that things have gone on smoothly and will to the end indeed for some days murdoch has been a new man acting as one with some grave affair on his hands feat to accomplish or negotiation to effect resolved on carrying it to completeness now less from anxiety as to what he has been saying at the welsh harp than to know what he has been there heard said by others she further interrogates him where have you been meanwhile monsieur part of the time at the ferry the rest of it i've spent on paths and roads coming and going i went up to the harp to hear what i could hear and what did you hear nothing much to interest us as you know rugs is an out-of-the-way corner none more so on the wye and the langoran news hasn't reached it the talk of the ferry folk is all about the occurrence at abergann which still continues to exercise them the other don't appear to have got much abroad if at all anywhere for reasons told father rogier by your countrywoman clarice with whom he held an interview some time during the afternoon and has there been no search yet search yes but nothing found and not much noise made for the reasons i allude to what are they you haven't told me oh various some of them laughable enough whimsies of that quixotic old lady who has been so long doing the honours at langoran ah madame linton how has she been taking it i'll tell you after i've had something to eat and drink you forget a limp where i've been all the day long under the roof of a poacher who of late otherwise employed hadn't so much as a head of game in his house true i've since made call at an hotel but you don't give me credit for my abstemiousness what have you got to reward me for it entree she exclaims leading him into the dining-room their dialogue so far having been carried on in the porch voila he is gratified though no way surprised at the set out he does not need to inquire whence it comes he too knows it is a sacrifice to the rising sun but he knows also what a sacrifice he will have to make in return for it one-third the estate of langoran well ma chérie he says as his reflection occurs to him we'll have to pay pretty dear for all this but i suppose there's no help for it none she answers with a comprehension of the circumstances clearer and fuller than his we've made the contract and must abide by it if broken by us it wouldn't be a question of property but life neither yours nor mine would be safe for a single hour ah monsieur you little comprehend the power of those gentry the jesuits how sharp their claws and far-reaching confound them he exclaims angrily dropping down upon a chair by the table's side he eats ravenously and drinks like a fish his day's work is over and he can afford the indulgence and while they are at supper he imparts all details of what he has done and heard among them miss linton's reasons for having put restraint upon the search the old simpleton he says concluding his narration she actually believed my cousin to have run away with that captain of hussars if she don't believe it still ha 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 she'll think differently when she sees that body brought out of the water it will settle the business a limp renault retiring to rest is long kept awake by the pleasant thought not that for many more nights will she have to sleep in a mean bed at glingog but on a grand couch in langoran court End of chapter 17volume two chapter eighteen of gwen wynne this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org gwen wynne a romance of the why by main reed chapter eighteen impatient for the post never man looked with more impatience for a post than captain ryecroft for the night mail from the west its morning delivery in london it may bring him a letter on the contents of which will turn the hinges of his life's fate assuring his happiness or dooming him to misery and if no letter come its failure will make misery for him all the same it is scarce necessary to say the epistle thus expected and fraught with such grave consequence is an answer to his own that written in herefordshire and posted before leaving the wyside hotel Twenty-four hours have since elapsed, and now, on the morning after, he is at the Langham, London, where the response, if any, should reach him. 
he has made himself acquainted with the statistics of postal time telling him when the night mail is due and when the first distribution of letters in the metropolitan district at earliest in the langham which has post and telegraph office within its own walls this palatial hostelry unrivalled for convenience being in direct communication with all parts of the world it is on the stroke of eight a m and the ex hussar officer pacing the tessellated tiles outside the deputy manager's moderately sized room with its front glass protected watches for the incoming of the post carrier it seems an inexorable certainty though a very vexatious one that person or thing awaited with unusual impatience must needs be behind time as if to punish the moral delinquency of the impatient one even postmen are not always punctual as vivian ryecroft has reason to know that amiable and active individual in coatie of coarse cloth with red rag facings flitting from door to door brisk as a blue bottle on this particular morning does not step across the threshold of the langham till nearly half past eight there is a thick fog and the street flags are greasy that would be the excuse for his tardy appearance were he called upon to give one dumping down his sack and spilling its contents upon the lead-covered sill of the booking-office window he is off again on a fresh and further flight with no abatement of impatience captain ryecroft stands looking at the letters being sorted a miscellaneous lot bearing the postmarks of many towns and many countries with the stamps of nearly every civilized nation on the globe enough of them to make the eyes of an ardent stamp collector shed tears of concupiscence scarcely allowing the sorter time to deposit them in their respective pigeonholes ryecroft approaches and asks if there be any for him at the same time giving his name no not any answers the clerk after drawing out all under letter r and dealing them off as a pack of cards are you quite sure sir pardon me i intend starting off within the hour and expecting a letter of some importance may i ask you to glance over them again in all the world there are no officials more affable than those of the langham they are in fact types of the highest hotel civilization instead of showing nettled he thus appealed to make a scenting rejoinder accompanying his words with a re-examination of the letters under r soon as completed saying no sir none for the name of ryecroft he bearing this name turns away with an air of more than disappointment the negative denoting that no letter had been written in reply vexes almost irritates him it is like a blow repeated a second slap in his face held up in humiliation after having forgiven the first he will not so humble himself never forgive again this his resolve as he ascends the great stairway to his room once more to make ready for travel the steam packet service between folkestone and boulogne is tidal consulting bradshaw he finds the boat on that day leaves the former place at four p m the connecting train from the charing cross station one therefore have several hours to be put in meanwhile how are they to be occupied he is not in the mood for amusement nothing in london could give him that now neither afford him a moment's gratification perhaps in paris and he will try there men have buried their griefs women as well too oft laying in the same grave their innocence honour and reputation in the days of napoleon the little a grand cemetery of such hosts entering it pure and stainless to become tainted as the imperial regime itself and he too may succumb to its influence sinister as hell itself in his present frame of mind it is possible nor would his be the first noble spirit broken down wrecked on the reef of a disappointed passion love thwarted the loved one never again to be spoken to in all likelihood never more met while waiting for the folkestone train he is a prey to the most harrowing reflections and in hope of escaping them descends to the billiard room in the langham a well-appointed affair with tables the very best the marker accommodates him to a hundred up which he loses it is not for that he drops the cue disheartened and retires had he won with cook bennett or roberts as his adversary could have been all the same once more mounting to his room he makes an appeal to the ever-friendly nicotonian a cigar backed by a glass of brandy may do something to soothe his chafed spirit and lighting the one he rings for the other this brought him he takes seat by the windows throws up the sash and looks down upon the street there to see what gives him a fresh spasm of pain though to two others affording the highest happiness on earth 
for it is a wedding ceremony being celebrated at all souls opposite a church before whose altar many fashionable couples join hands to be linked together for life such a couple is in the act of entering the sacred edifice carriages drawing up and off in quick succession coachmen with white rosettes and whips ribbon bedecked footmen wearing similar favours an unusually stylish affair as in shining and with smiling faces the bridal train ascends the steps two by two disappearing within the portals of the church the spectators on the nave and around the enclosure rails also looking joyous as though each even the raggedest had a personal interest in the event from the window opposite captain ryecroft observes it with very different feelings for the thought is before his mind how near he has been himself to making one in such a procession at its head followed by the bitter reflection he now never shall a sigh succeeded by a half angry ejaculation then the bell rung with a violence which betrays how the sight has agitated him on the way to entering he cries out call me a cab handsome sir no four-wheeler and this luggage get downstairs soon as possible his impediments are all in travelling trim but a few necessary articles having been unpacked and a shilling tossed upon the strapped portmanteau ensures it with the lot speedy descent down the lift a single pipe of mr trafford's silver whistle brings a cab to the langham entrance in twenty seconds time and in twenty more a traveller's luggage however heavy is slung to the top with the lighter articles stowed inside his departure so accelerated captain ryecroft who had already settled his bill is soon seated in the cab and carried off but despatch ends on leaving the langham the cab being a four-wheeler crawls along like a tortoise fortunately for the fair he is in no haste now instead will be too early for the folkestone train he only wanted to get away from the scene of that ceremony so disagreeably suggestive shut up imprisoned in the plush-lined vehicle shabby and not over clean he endeavours to beguile time by gazing out at the shop windows the hour is too early for regent street promenaders some distraction if not amusement he derives from his cabby's arms these working to and fro as if the man were rowing a boat in burlesque it reminds him of the y and his waterman wingate but just then something else recalls the western river not ludicrously but with another twinge of pain the cab is passing through leicester square one of the lungs of london long deceased and in process of being doctored it is beset with hoardings plastered against which are huge posters of the advertising kind several of them catch the eye of captain ryecroft but only one holds it causing him the sensation described it is the announcement of a grand concert to be given at the st james hall for some charitable purpose of welsh speciality program with list of performers at their head in largest lettering the queen of the estedford edith wynne to him in the cab now a name of galling reminiscence notwithstanding the difference of orthography it seems like a nemesis pursuing him he grasps the leathern strap and letting down the ill-fitting sash with a clatter cries out to the cabman drive on jarvey or i'll be late for my train a shilling extra for time if cabby's arms sparred slowly before they now work as though he were engaged in catching flies and with their quickened action aided by several cuts of a thick thonged whip the rosinate goes rattling through the narrow defile of herrings row down king william street and across the strand into the charing cross station End of chapter eighteen Volume two, chapter nineteen of Gwenwing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Gonzalez. Gwenwing, a romance of the Y, by Main Reed. Chapter nineteen. Journey interrupted. Captain Ryecroft takes for a ticket for Paris, without thought of breaking journey, and in due time reaches Boulogne, glad to get out of the detestable packet, little better than a ferry boat, which plies between Folkestone and the French seaport. He loses not a moment in scaling the equally detestable gang ladder, by which alone he can't escape, having set foot upon French soil, 
represented by a rough cobblestone pavement, he bethinks of passport and luggage, how he will get to the former vice and the latter look after with the least trouble to himself. It is not his first visit to France, nor is he unacquainted with the country's customs, therefore knows that a tip to surgeon de V or douanier will clear away the obstructions in the shortest time possible, quicker if it be a handsome one. Peeling in his pockets for a florin or a half-crown, he is accosted by a voice familiar and a friendly tone. Captain Rycroft, it exclaims in a rich rolling brogue, as if Galway. Is it yourself? By the powers of old Kelly, and it is. Major Mayhorn, that same old boy, give us a grip of your fist. As on that night when you pulled me out of the ditch at Delhi, just in time to clear the bayonets and the pandies. An ape thing, and a close shave, wasn't it? But so what brought you to Boulogne? The question takes a traveller aback. He is not prepared to explain the nature of his journey, and with a view to evasion, he simply points to the steamer, out of which the passenger are still swarming. Come, old comrade, protests the major, good-naturedly. That won't do. It isn't satisfactory for bosom friends. As we've been, and still are, I trust. But maybe, I make too free, asking a business in Boulogne. Not at all, Mahon. I've no business in Boulogne. I'm on the way to Paris. Oh, a pleasure trip, I suppose. Nothing of the kind. There's no pleasure for me in Paris or anywhere else. Aha! Educated the major. Struck by the words in a despondent tone. What's this, old fellow? Something wrong? Oh, not much. Never mind. The reply is unsatisfactory, but seeing the further allusion to private matters might not be agreeable. The major continues, apologetically. Pardon me, Rycroft. I've no wish of inquisitive, but you have given me reason to think you're out of sorts somehow. It isn't your fashion to be low-spirited. And you shan't be, so long as you're in my company, if I can help it. It's very kind of you, Mahon. And for the short time I'm to be with you, I'll do the best I can to be cheerful. It shouldn't be a great effort. I suppose the train will be starting in a few minutes. What train? For Paris. You're not going to Paris now. Not this night. I am. Straight on. Neither straight nor crook, ma bohil. I must. Why must you? If you don't expect pleasure there, for what should you be in such a haste to reach it? Father Rycroft. You'll break a journey here, and stay a few days with me. I can promise you some little amusement, but it's in such a dull place just now. The smash of Agra and Masterman's with Overend and Gurney following his suit has sent hither a host of old Indians, but soldiers and civilians. No doubt you'll find many friends among them. There are lots of pretty girls, too. I don't mean natives, but a countrywoman, to whom I'll have much pleasure in presenting you. Not for the world, Mahon. Not one. I have no desire to extend my acquaintance in that way. I would, Major. What? Turn hater, woman, too? Well, leaving the Fasex on one side, there's half a dozen of the other hair. Good fellows as ever stretched legs on mahogany. The strangers to you, I think. But we'll be delighted to know you, and do their best to make Boulogne agreeable. Come, old boy, you'll stay. Say the word. I would, Major, and with pleasure. We're at any other time, but I confess just now I'm not in the mood of making acquaintance. Least of all, among my countrymen. To tell the truth, I'm going to Paris chiefly with a view of avoiding them. Nonsense! You're not the man to turn solitaire like Simon Starlight, and spend the rest of your days in a tough stone pillar. Besides, Paris is not a place for that sort of thing. If you're really to mean you're keeping out of the company for a while, I won't ask why. Remain with me, and we'll take strolls along the sea beach, pick up pebbles, gather shells, and make love to mermaids, or to Bolognese fish fags, if you prefer it. Come, Rycroft, don't deny me. It's so long since we have a day together. I'm dying to talk over old times. Recall our camaraderie in India. For the first time in forty-eight hours, Captain Rycroft's countenance shows an indication of cheerfulness. Almost to a smile, as he listens to the rattle of his jovial friend all the pleasanter from its patois recalling childhood happy days, and as some prospect of destruction from his sad thoughts, if not a restoration of happiness, is held out by the kindly invitation, he is half inclined to accept it. 
what difference whether he find the grave of his griefs in Paris or Boulogne, if find it he can. I'm booked to Paris, he says mechanically, as if speaking to himself. Have you a through ticket? asked the Major, in an odd way. Of course I have. Let me have a squint at it. Further questions the other, holding out his hand. Certainly. Why do you wish that? To see if it will allow you to shunt yourself here. I don't think it will. In fact, I know it don't. They told me so at Charing Cross. Then they told you what wasn't true. But thus, see here. What the Major calls upon to him to look at the some bits of pasteboard, like butterflies, fluttering in the air, and settling then over the cobstones of the dock. They had the fragments of the torn ticket. Now, old boy, your book for Boulogne. The melancholy smile, after that time in the Wycroft's face, rode into a laugh at the stratagem employed to detain him. With cheerfulness for the time restored, he says. Well, Major, by that you've caused me at least one pound sterling. But I'll make you recoup in it boarding and lodging before. Possibly a week? A month, a year, if you should like your lodging, and we'll stay in them. I've got a snug little compound in Rue Tintilleris, with room to swing hammocks for both of us, besides a cabin or two of wine, and, what's better, a keg of the raw crater. Let us go along and have a tumbler of it at once. You'll need it to wash a child spray out of your throat. Don't wait for your luggage. This custom house gentry all know me, and will send it directly after. Is it labelled? It is. My name's in everything. Let me have one of your cards. The card is handed to him. There, Monsieur, he says. Turning to a douanier, he respectfully salutes. Take this and see that all the baggage bearing the name on it be kept safely till called for. My servant will come for it. Garçon, this to the driver of Watteau, who, for some time viewing them with expectant eye, makes response by a cut of his whip, and a brisk approach to the spot where they are standing. Pushing Captain Rycroft into the back, and following himself, the Major gives the French Jehu his address, and they are driven off over the rough, rib-cracking cobbles of Boulogne. End of chapter 19 Recording by April Gonzalez in Cavita, Philippines Volume 2, Chapter 20 of Gwen Wynn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gwen Wynn, A Romance of the Why by Maine Reed. Chapter 20 Hue and Cry. The ponies and pet stag on the lawn at Langoran wonder what it is all about. So different from the garden parties and archery meetings, of which they have witnessed many a one. Unlike the latter in their quiet stateliness is the excited crowd at the court this day, still more from its being chiefly composed of men. There are a few women also, but not the slender-waisted creatures in silks and gossamer muslins who make up an outdoor assemblage of the aristocracy. The sturdy dames and robust damsels now rambling over its grounds and grappled walks are the dwellers in roadside cottages, who at the words, murdered or missing, drop brooms upon half-swept floors, leave babies uncared for in their cradles, and are off to the indicated spot. And such words have gone abroad from Langoran Court, coupled with the name of its young mistress. Gwen Wynne is missing, if she be not also murdered. It is the second day after her disappearance, as known to the household, and now it is known throughout the neighbourhood, near and far. The slight scandal dreaded by Miss Linton no longer has influence with her. The continued absence of her niece, with the certainty at length reached that she is not in the house of any neighbouring friend, would make concealment of the matter a grave scandal in itself. Besides, since the half-hearted search of yesterday, new facts have come to light. For one, the finding of that ring on the floor of the pavilion. It has been identified not only by the finder, but by Eleanor Lees and Miss Linton herself. A rare cluster of brilliants, besides of value, it has more than once received the inspection of these ladies, both knowing the giver as the nature of the gift. How comes it to have been there in the summer-house? Dropped, of course, but under what circumstances? Questions perplexing, while the thing itself seriously heightens the alarm. No one, however rich or regardless, would fling such precious stones away. 
above all gems so bestowed and as miss lees has reason to know prized and fondly treasured the discovery of the engagement ring deepens the mystery instead of doing aught towards its elucidation but it also strengthens the suspicion fast becoming belief that miss wynne went not away of her own accord instead has been taken robbed too before being earned off there were other rings upon her fingers diamonds emeralds and the like possibly in the scramble on the robbers first seizing hold and hastily stripping her this particular one had slipped through their fingers fallen to the floor and so escaped observation at night and in the darkness all likely enough so for a time run the surmises despite the horrible suggestion attaching to them almost as a consequence for if gwen wynne had been robbed she may also be murdered the costly jewels she wore in rings bracelets and chains worth many hundreds of pounds may have been the temptation to plunder her but the plunderers identified and fearing punishment would also make away with her person it may be abduction but it has now more the look of murder by midday the alarm has reached its height the hue and cry is at its loudest no longer confined to the family and domestics no more the relatives and intimate friends people of all classes and kinds take part in it the pleasure grounds of langoran erst private and sacred as the garden of the hesperides are now trampled by heavy hobnailed shoes while men in smocks slops and sheepskin gaiters stride excitedly to and fro or stand in groups all wearing the same expression on their features that of a sincere honest anxiety with a fear some sinister mischance has overtaken miss wynne many a young farmer is there who has ridden beside her in the hunting field often behind her no ways nettled by her giving him the lead instead admiring her courage and style of taking fences over which on his cart nag he dares not follow enthusiastically proclaiming her pluck at markets race meetings and other gatherings wherever came up talk of tally ho besides those on the ground drawn thither by sympathetic friendship and others the idly curious still others are there in the exercise of official duty several magistrates have arrived at langoran among them sir george shenstone chairman of the district bench the police superintendent also with several of his blue-coated subordinates there is a man present about whom remark is made and who attracts more attention than either justice of the peace or policeman it is a circumstance unprecedented a strange sight indeed lewin murdoch at the court he is there nevertheless taking an active part in the proceedings it seems natural enough to those who but know him to be the cousin of the missing lady ignorant of the long family estrangement only to intimate friends is there aught singular in his behaving as he now does but to these on reflection his behaviour is quite comprehensible they construe it differently from the others the outside spectators more than one of them observing the anxious expression upon his face believe it but a semblance a mask to hide the satisfaction within his heart to become joy if gwen wynne be found dead it is not a thing to be spoken of openly and no one so speaks of it the construction put upon lewin murdoch's motives is confined to the few for only a few know how much he is interested in the upshot of that search again it is set on foot but not as on the day preceding now no mad rushing to and fro of mere physical demonstration this day there is due deliberation a council held composed of the magistrates and other gentlemen of the neighbourhood aided by a lawyer or two and the talents of an experienced detective as on the day before the premises are inspected the grounds gone over the fields traversed the woods as well while parties proceed up and down the river and along both sides of the backwash the eyot also is quartered and carefully explored from end to end as yet the drag has not been called into requisition the deep flood with a swift strong current preventing it partly that but as much because the searchers do not as yet believe cannot realize the fact that gwendolen wynne is dead and her body at the bottom of the y robbed and drowned surely it cannot be equally incredible that she has drowned herself suicide is not thought of incredible under the circumstances a third supposition that she has been the victim of revenge of a jealous lover's spite seems alike untenable she the heiress owner of the vast langoran estates to be so dealt with pitched into the river like some poor cottage girl who has quarrelled with a brutal sweetheart 
the thing is preposterous and yet this very thing begins to receive credence in the minds of many of more as new facts are developed by the magisterial inquiry carried on inside the house there a strange chapter of evidence comes out or rather is elicited miss linton's maid clarice is the author of it this sportive creature confesses to having been out on the grounds as the ball was breaking up and lingering there till after the latest guest had taken departure heard high voices speaking as in anger they came from the direction of the summer-house and she recognized them as those of mademoiselle and le capitaine by the latter meaning captain ryecroft startling testimony this when taken in connection with the strayed ring collateral to the ugly suspicion the latter had already conjured up nor is the femme de chambre telling any untruth she was in the grounds at that same hour and heard the voices as affirmed she had gone down to the boat dock in the hope of having a word with the handsome waterman and returned from it reluctantly finding he had betaken himself to his boat she does not thus state her reason for so being abroad but gives a different one she was merely out to have a look at the illumination the lamps and transparencies still unextinguished all natural enough and questioned as to why she said nothing of it on the day before her answer is equally evasive partly that she did not suppose a thing worth speaking of and partly because she did not like to let people know that mademoiselle had been behaving in that way quarrelling with the gentleman in the flood of light just let in no one any longer thinks that miss wynne has been robbed though it may be that she has suffered something worse what for could have been the angry words and the quarrel how did it end and now the name ryecroft is on every tongue no longer in cautious whisperings but loudly pronounced why is he not here his absence is strange unaccountable under the circumstances to none seeming more so than to those holding counsel inside who have been made acquainted with the character of that waif the gift ring told he was the giver he cannot be ignorant of what is passing at Langoran. true the hotel where he sojourns is in a town five miles off but the affair has long since found its way thither and the streets are full of it i think we had better send for him observes sir george shenstone to his brother justices what say you gentlemen certainly of course is the unanimous rejoinder and the waterman too queries another it appears that captain ryecroft came to the ball in a boat does any one know who was his boatman a fellow named wingate is the answer given by young shenstone he lives by the roadside up the river near bugs ferry possibly he may be here outside says sir george go see this to one of the policemen at the door who hurries off almost immediately to return told by the people that jack wingate is not among them that's strange too remarks one of the magistrates both should be brought hither at once if they don't choose to come willingly oh exclaims sir george they'll come willingly no doubt let a policeman be dispatched to wingate as for captain ryecroft don't you think gentlemen it would be only politeness to summon him in a different way suppose i write a note requesting his presence with explanations that will be better say several assenting this note is written and a groom gallops off with it while a policeman on foot makes his way to the cottage of the widow wingate nothing new transpires in their absence but on their return both arriving about the same time the agitation is intense for both come back unaccompanied the groom bringing the report that captain ryecroft is no longer at the hotel had left it on the day before by the first train for london the policeman's tale is that jack wingate went off on the same day and about the same early hour not by rail to london but in his boat down the river to the bristol channel within less than an hour after a police officer is dispatched to chepstow and further if need be while the detective with one of the gentlemen accompanying takes an ex-train for the metropolis end of chapter twenty